Are we able to get? Oh, we do. We have our service thing. Megan said that she was going to do that this morning. Yep. So we didn't get that done very well. I know. I know. She said she just got this one done pretty last minute as well. So she told us yesterday evening at like six that she was going to do those this morning. So we'll go check again. I mean, lineups are probably more relevant for Lindsay because she probably knows more. Oh, it makes a big difference. I thought we saved blue vaults for Christmas. We do. So we put this board here <laughs> and turn it up and down and we'll balance it. Put a little mark on it. So that way we know what it
big number. This will come up. You will be able to hear yourselves and when the video adds play. So anything else, basically anything we'll be going able to hear out, ourselves. You, you're hearing it as well. But you can't really... But it, Most likely, it's going to stay right here, just straight like up. vertically. Yeah. Um, we try to down. Let's get super excited. Good morning, Adrian. And don't worry, I'll, ta I'll take off my jacket. That's what I'm talking about, yeah. I'll like take off my jacket. I mean, I'll take off my oh, I can hear you. Yeah, I can hear you. Wow. I feel like we should be doing an SNL. I feel like we should. <laughs> they, oh, I Hello. I hear actually Good there morning. are people out there this morning. <laughs> yeah, we're, I, I, I can hear it out there, can't I? Okay, now you won't go the entire I was going to say they can hear us, yeah. Can you yeah. go grab the stroke I, coach from I think Aaron? I can still hear him. You know Aaron Kadowski? <coughs> Yes, he has a stroke. If he has a stroke coach for me, he should just be right around Which is the totally fine. I'm happy to tell jokes this morning to okay. everyone who's here already. Good morning, good morning. Is it not live on the clip? It's not going to go out over that way. Oh. That's what I, yeah, I know. I'm like, if I can speak, am I, are we live? No. Do you want to do but it live? But like, it sounds like it is, unless it's just me. We can balance it here, because we've already balanced it from the board out. Okay, so cool. this is, we're just going to mark the levels that y'all need to talk at. So just talk as how you would okay. normally be talking. Okay. <coughs> I feel like this is really, really loud for me. So, so this is my this is my control. And this is me. So I can't hear you. And I was going to say the echoing that I'm hearing then is you. this, not what's on the course. So you do hear okay. an echo? No. Yeah. Okay. I'll A little bit. I mean, I like the way an echo sounds, but I, it's tripping me up thinking that it's talking to people that are here so i wonder if we're, we're going to be hearing ourselves pl oh yeah i can hear that echo yeah yeah if we can hear ourselves on the speakers and then ourselves in the which will in basically the sound like this yeah right? we're just practicing for that um, but if we want i can turn it all the way down adrian is the best <laughs> now the best. Lindsay, this the makes best. me so happy to be sitting in this chair next we to you right make now <laughs> we, make, we can make it so um audio here, you only hear this. You wouldn't hear any ads if you wanted to do that. Uh, and that would eliminate the echo entirely. So in terms of the ads, how are we going to know that those are being played? So Whitney? We, for ads, how do we want to do that? Oh. You want to signal and then you'll see yeah. it pop up here? Okay, so there, I'm going to have to stand close to you because okay. yeah. I'm going to have to so it sort of takes a little bit of teamwork. Like if if you guys feel like there is a lull or need a break or whatever it is, you can also kind of communicate with me and just say like now might be a good time for us to throw something in. And we can do that. We can play one of the videos. They're not very long. Um, Stanford's here too, right? Collegiate teams that are here, Stanford. Seb, if you kind okay. of see something. I was like, who was down my way? Stanford, Texas, UW, Cal, USC. So those five, and Notre Dame, but unranked. 
Oh, I'm watching the stream. Yeah. <coughs> Thank you. They also have alumni crews here. Same thing. So that's, uh, just turn it back up before we talk. Yeah, put it back here at zero, and both of you are Oh, the zero is in there. <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I'll take off my scarf. Thank you. 
I've been known to make it to the restroom and back in like four minutes, tops. <laughs> all good. <laughs> She's going to be crying over here momentarily. <laughs> it's, it's okay. It is what it is. <laughs> I figured I at this point in my life, at this point in my life, I, this is how I look, no matter what the angle is. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have them in gray linen, actually. Oh. Are you starting it up? Are we Are we calling something? Is that what's happening? Oh, okay. Welcome to the... <coughs> oh, right on. Yeah. Do you want to do it or you want to do it? You're good. Audio's on. On your end. Five. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, athletes, coaches, and spectators. Welcome to day two of the San Diego Crew Classic. Will you please rise for the national anthem before we kick off racing? <laughs> Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. We await the start of our first race this morning. Uh, beautiful weather conditions, could not ask for anything more. Welcome to the shores of Crown Point, where we celebrate the 50th running of the San Diego Crew Classic. We are so glad to be back with over 400 entries, 103 clubs this year, just a huge showing for the Crew Classic. This is considered the inaugural race of the spring for many teams around the country. And this year we have teams from around the world. Teams from all over the world. And not only that, this event has grown over the years from you know 50 years ago with just 12 or fewer teams over the course of three hours. And now we're onto a three day event here. So this is technically day two of the San Diego Crew Classic. A few hours of racing kicked it off yesterday. And this is going to be the first race of the morning set to begin at 7.15 a.m. Uh, right from the start. So you will see that take off here shortly. You can see the sun just shining down beautifully on a pretty calm water that we have here as the crews await the start of the first race, day two of the San Diego Crew Classic. And I'll go ahead and give you the lineup here for that first race. This is the women's under 16-8. In lane one, Marin. Lane two, Capital Crew. Lane three, NorCal. And lane four, San Diego Rowing Club. So these crews will all go on to the final. So for this heat, they're essentially jockeying for position, lane positions. And it's likely not uncommon that these crews having be coming all out of uh, the area have probably seen each other, will see each other, have seen each other historically. So definitely going to be a battle as we come down as they race four lanes before the final. That's right. So this first race, all California crews that are out there 
Juniors start racing in January, so some of these kids already have a couple of months of racing under their belt as they come into the Crew Classic, definitely the biggest regatta so far this season that uh, any of these juniors have seen. All right, and we've got a start. Looks like a clean start here. First 100 meters or so will be a time for the referees to take a look at the crews and their course, make sure that they're all aligned and off to a good start. Everyone rowing cleanly. Once they get past those first red buoys, then we have an official race. You can see the rate will be quite a bit higher as they get these boats up to speed off the line here. And for those of you watching here on the screen, the near shore is going to be lane one. So what you see from left to right here is going to be lane one, followed by two, three, and four here in this four boat race. And right there in that overhead shot, you could see that it looked like Marin was maybe out over the field quite a bit off of the start, uh, setting the, the pace here, the tone here in the early stages of this first race of Saturday morning. That's right. So Marin well out in front already with about a length over Capital. Behind Capital, we've got NorCal. But right next to them, San Diego Rowing Club. They practice here every day, so they know these ties. They know the conditions. They know this course like the back of their hand. So NorCal and San Diego, those two clues, crews very close to each other. And right there on the screen, you've got NorCal and San Diego right now in lanes three and lanes four. Meanwhile, you have Marin and Capital in lanes one and lanes two to the left. So Lindsay and I had been talking a little bit earlier about these age categories that we see with juniors with under 16. We've got under 15s, under 17s, and then just the youth category. So hard to tell exactly what the uh, what um, category a lot of these athletes are in. Some could be novices. Some could be very seasoned varsity athletes. Looking at the blade work here, I'm going to say that it's probably a mix. A mix, absolutely. You know, with looking at U16, the level of experience. So some people might have started growing in middle school. Some people might be in their first few months. I know my first straight 2K race was here on this course within the first few months of racing. Fantastic venue. The ability to get side by side in lanes like this with more than one other boat or two other boats is experience that will pay off in the long run for sure as all of these athletes progress through their individual and team careers in the sport. That's right. And, you know, one thing that's really important to note is the level of pressure that they feel at a regatta this big is so important this early in the season. So it's really a time for those coaches to kind of recalibrate at the end of each race, at the end of each day, and figure out, okay, how can we get better tomorrow for the finals? And you can see in lane one, it's been Marin since the very beginning, having gotten off of the line a little bit more quickly than the rest of the crews. They seem to be continuing to extend their lead here as they get through the middle portions of this race. On this race course, they'll have two bridges that open up a little bit down the course. And so the conditions could change down the course as they go, which is just a nice test for experience. You get practice in all sorts of different conditions here, uh, but right now, water just looks lovely. It looks amazing. We're in well out in front, looking like a very seasoned crew, so likely a crew that does have some more experienced kids, maybe with a few more years under their belt. Capital behind them uh, by open water. And then in that third place spot, it will be San Diego Rowing Club with a slight lead over NorCal. Mm -hmm. 
couple of ads in here. Uh -huh. yeah. So this is just running, right? Yeah. And so when it's red, it's live. Like when the li words light up around the time. So th so they're running this right now. Yeah. <coughs> Any of the other keys right now? Interesting. Ah, uh, okay, okay. Yeah. And then there's, yeah, and NorCal there. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Well, maybe I'll extend a bit. And then you can see it. You have different levels of it. Oh, look at you guys. <laughs> Getting creative. Somebody's pink bag here is going to get. You want to come back in here? Yeah. Okay. Date. All right, and just a quick update from the course. Crews coming into the spectator area, so let's hear it for them from the shoreline for this first race of the morning. It will be Marin with a very solid lead as they come into the final 500. Behind them, by about a length and a half, maybe two of open water, it's going to be Capital Crew. San Diego on the outside, lane four in the third place position, but looking to challenge Capital, seeing what they can do as they come into the final strokes here, and then in the fourth place spot, it will be NorCal. Beautiful overhead shot there of Marin still out clear of the rest of the field as they come through, getting into the final, the closing strokes of this first heat of the day in the women's under 16, eight. Wow, and if, if this pretends anything for Marin, this crew is just really sharp looking. Great blade work, lots of rhythm. Not much urgency here because they are clearly with a solid lead as they come into the final strokes. So this has got to feel good to start the morning off with this much confidence and looking back at the rest of the field knowing that wow that final is going to be really fun tomorrow behind them capital continuing in that second place position As Marin high fives there, they've crossed the finish line. They're going to go cool down a little bit and maybe see if there are some different ways that they could, you know, make a few adjustments before the final and find even more speed. In second place, as we see approaching the finish line, here is going to be Capital Crew. They've been in second the entire time there in lane two as they cross. And on the outside lane for this race in lane four is San Diego Rowing Club. Out there on the outside, you can see the effort poured in on every stroke as they come into the final few of this race as well. And then finally to finish, it's NorCal, about 100 meters left for them as they wind it up. And again, a varying uh, amount of experience uh, across, I think, all of these crews. So we're seeing that here with a pretty widespread field. But that's what's great about junior rowing in the United States is that, you know, you have such a wide level of experience and expertise. All of these clubs, just really big clubs with a lot of depth. So really great to see this showing here from NorCal. So is this the next race then?
right, and looks like we do have a start for the men's under 16 eight. This is the Rose Cup. And again, a heat where all these crews will progress to the final. Right now we've got Marin in lane one, Newport Seabase in lane two, NorCal crew in lane three. So in the men's under 16 eight, if you're looking at the screen, we do have these three crews out on the water. They're well past the halfway point already. Uh, since we can't quite see placement yet, we'll wait just a little bit until those crews come into view. But again, Marin, very large program rowing just north of San Francisco. They have uh, eight entries at the Crew Classic this weekend, um, quite a few youth. Um, youth entries and then um, that's so that's just for their juniors and then of course they'll have uh, several masters entries but right now it does look like Marin well out in front they look to have about two to three lengths of open water over NorCal NorCal rowing out of lane three and then just behind them maybe with a bit of open water it will be Newport Sea Base Newport Sea Base rowing out of uh, Newport right there at the back bay And as these crews, we mentioned earlier that this could be their first race of the season. It could be for some of them the many races into the season. We don't know how much time they've had on the water yet. But nonetheless, being on a course here with six lanes across, being able to line up against some of these other crews, these young athletes probably see each other throughout the season. They might even have friends across the different clubs, which is yet another amazing experience in youth rowing is that you go to these bigger regattas and you meet people and you exchange, you know, information and you keep in touch and then you get to see each other as you race your way through the season. Again, Marin on that inside in those, every, you can, if you know Marin rowing, you know that they're going to be in red. You know that they're going to come out in full force. So here they are in lane one as we've switched angles here in lane one, well out in front of this current second place in the far lane in lane three NorCal crew with Newport Seabase just trailing as they come into the closing portion of this uh, men's under 16-8. What do you mean we can't keep up with one of these things? All right, and here they come towards the finish. This will be Marin with a very solid lead. They are followed by NorCal. They're competitors across the bay, rowing in the port of Redwood City. And then finally Newport Sea Base chasing down NorCal. All right, and we are running on very close centers here between races, just a seven, eight minutes in between. So we've likely already have a race on the course coming down to us. That will be the Women's Under 16 Ulster Challenge Cup. This is a coxed quad. So generally a quad will not have a coxswain, but because these athletes are uh, maybe a little bit less experienced, maybe a lot of novices, we wanna put a coxswain in the bow of that boat um, to make sure that they have a safe travel down the course. So lane one, Los Gatos. Lane two, NorCal Crew. Lane three, Casitas Rowing. 
Lane 4, Marina Aquatic Center. Lane 5, Long Beach Junior Crew. Lane 6, Pacific. And Lane 7, Maritime. All right, and as we get a hold of what's happening out on the race course, we've got seven boats on the course, and right now the leaders are going to come out of, it looks like lane seven, that would be Maritime Rowing Club. They are on the far outside, so as they come into view, you'll see them on the far outside across the race course. Challenging them, though, for that lead will be Marina Aquatic Center and NorCal. So, again, these boats with uh, quite a bit of different levels of experience. We've got a coxswain steering them, so there should not be any sort of steering issues at all. But right now, Maritime, the only crew here from outside of California. They're from Connecticut, so well-traveled as they come all the way across the country, certainly wanting to make a statement. And Maritime did have a fantastic showing last year at Youth Nationals, uh, coming out with a lot of crews that performed very well across multiple disciplines. So to see them performing well here is just, you know, a nice precursor to maybe what will happen later in the year. Good practice to get on the course with these seven boats across. That is a rarity in the country to have crews be able to line up like that, especially at, you know, this uh, at this level, at this age. And so to be out there this morning, being able to warm up properly, get out there and have a good showing this early in the day as well, uh, bodes well for the rest of the season for them. And that's right. They are a very seasoned sculling club I and mean, they do all different boat categories. But here at the Crew Classic, it looks like they have only sculling boats, all quads. So that's going to be really great to see the depth of that team as they progress through the weekend. So Maritime looking like they have the lead. Marina Aquatic Center very close to them as well as NorCal Crew. Those are your top three boats. As they come a little bit closer into view, we're going to look at some better placement. Looks to me as if Los Gatos is also in the mix there, most likely in that fourth place position. Casitas Rowing doing well. There is not a huge gap between a lot of these crews. So even though we do see some open water out there, these boats are still bunched up you know, fairly tightly as they come into view. And as you can see across the course as well, by virtue of having uh, a couple of the lead boats be spread out through the course, uh, that keeps the other crews in contact. No one has been, you know, as Adrian mentioned, dropped behind a little bit here. And so they're going to have somebody, even if they're one lane over or two lanes over, that's very close by. So there's a primary race occurring with a couple of the staggered crews being NorCal and Marina Aquatic, Maritime. Uh, but then you also have the crews of Los Gatos and Casitas, uh, Long Beach Juniors and Pacific out there on the course, pretty close as well 
all. So the primary, again, and secondary races there that are unfolding as they come down the course are going to remain tight all the way through the line. All right, and I think I have some pretty good idea of what the placement here is going to be. Um, it does look like Maritime still holding on to that first place position. They're followed by NorCal and then Marina Aquatic Center close by. Los Gatos looks to be in that fourth place position. And in fifth, Casitas Rowing. And then Long Beach, sixth, Pacific in seventh. Again, um, our, we're still kind of getting used to what that drone shot is going to be. The closest right now is going to be between NorCal and Maritime. So really tight racing here as they come into the spectator area. I'm going to kind of reverse that and give that lead right now. Looks like NorCal may be moving into that lead. Los Gatos, NorCal, yeah. Los Gatos, NorCal. Los Gatos, NorCal, and Mer Marina. So as we come into the final strokes, we really have kind of two races going on here. Two boats out front, NorCal and Maritime battling each other, and then we have Marina and Los Gatos close to each other. So the progression will be that all these boats will go on to the final. This is seven boats across, but now they're jockeying for position and for good lane placement later on. So as they come down to the line, let's hear it for these crews. As we come into the final strokes, Maritime, NorCal, Los Cados, Marina Aquatic Center, those are your top four crews. And fantastic push there happening, nice patient push happening by, by Los Gatos here on the inside lane as they work their way back up into the leaders. Kay. And again, in lane two, it is going to be NorCal very tight mm -hmm. with Maritime on that outside lane, but Mar uh, NorCal is o has overtaken them. And look at Los Gatos here on the inside, also eating into that lead that Maritime had in the beginning. So it looks as they cross the line to be NorCal in first, followed by Maritime. Then Los Gatos push themselves up there into third place, followed by Marina Aquatic Center. And in lane five, Long Beach. In lane, excuse me, in lane three, Lake Casitas. Followed by Pacific. All right, just a little bit of a delay in getting this next boat on the race course. Looks like they did have a false start, so they will pull the crews back in realign. This is eight boats across, so this is going to be a challenge for the aligners. It'll be a challenge for us as the announcers to make sure that we kind of keep straight. And again, you know, we are not on the water. We're, f we're looking at what you're looking at and, uh, you know, following the race course as best as we can. But let me go ahead and give you the lineups here for this men's under 16 coxed quad. In lane one, Los Gatos. Lane two, NorCal. Lane three, Long Beach Junior Crew. Lane four, Maritime. Lane five, Redwood Scholars. Lane six, Lake Las Vegas. Lane seven, Cathedral Catholic High School. And lane eight, Utah.
but the question is, is did the other boats, are they running them after, or are they on the course? Because I don't see anything happening here. This is what the audience is seeing. This is what we want to see. This is what There's a four boat. No, it's not a cock squad. It's a quad. That looks like a quad. Okay. I just, it's like out of the Because yeah. they might have, I don't want to say there's a race on the course when it's this, when they're. But there's a, what we see in the live feed is a quad, not an eight. Oh, wait, it should be a quad. You're right. But it's not yeah, a cock squad. It's not a cock squad, though. But it's a, but it's a straight quad, not a cox quad. And the next race should be a cox quad, and the one that we're seeing at the start. It's like a cock quad, though. Unless we just can't see. Yeah. I'm <laughs> sure there's no cox on the course. Yeah, I mean it looks different than the last boat. They would be here. They'd be bow loaded, and you can see the splash, splash guard. Do we have anything to eat here? Is the question. <laughs> we're troubleshooting. It's all good. It's all good. It's all good. What's the number one rule of racing, right? Is do the best you can with what you got. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you also for knowing that these are Catholic. These are Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> David's good about that too. He has a lot of humor experience. <laughs> Do you think? I did a talk to Weird Racing team of Lynch just on what we do about NCAA. <laughs> Hello. We need a refractory mirror around the corner. Yeah, that, that looks like a quad quad. But again, we don't want to step in a two by turning the wrong corner. That's a quad, I think. That's definitely bigger than a quad. Which side are we going? Yeah, it's too dark right now. Oh, that's better now. What's he got? Oh. The phone one. I don't, I, it distracts me. I'm like, I'm going to get it wrong anyway. So, um, that's fine. That's that's what I thought. Yeah, that's what I thought. So I wondered if they. I was gonna say race on the water in this, and I was like, nope. Okay, so we're on to the next part of that quad race. Okay. Okay. So let us know for sure. Are they gonna do both in the same quad? Are they gonna split? Well, we'll know because we'll see the we'll see the cocks. May I? Shall I? All right. So a little bit of a switch up here since we did have that false start. They pulled all those crews to the side, and we're moving forward. Just one, uh, one race. So we are on the course with the women's under 17 quad. No coxswain, these are very experienced women under 17. In lane one, we're looking at Redwood Scholars. Lane two, Long Beach Junior Crew. Lane three, Marina Aquatic Center. Lane four, Utah. Lane five, Slack. And lane six from Seattle, Holy Names. And this is the first of two heats in this women's under 17 quad. Again, coxless quad, no coxswain in there. Uh, and so these young women will take, a, take off from the start here shortly as they anticipate the start signal. Nice tight shot there across the start. You can see all the bows, everyone's off cleanly from the line. And just taking here on the inside lane, it does look like Redwood Scholars in that red hole just taking a little bit of an edge in the first few strokes of the race from this angle. You can now see the colors since the sun's a little bit higher in the sky. That red hole again, the, there's the, the first of two bridges here on the course on that inside lane one. So as the spectators are watching here on the beach, you will have lane one closest to you. And again, Redwood Scholars out in the lead early and it looks to be Marina Aquatic currently in second place two lanes over in lane three by just a hair but still of course this early in the race a very tight field all the way across all five of these crews. Right and a lot of these events are events that are run at Six youth crews. nationals so again one of the things that we want to see from a crew this early on in the season is making a statement. What is it that they want to define their season as? It starts right here in San Diego and Redwood Scholar is definitely out to make that statement they are perpetual competitors at the national level and showing here why that is the case. Next to them closest will be the Marina Aquatic Center, also very seasoned sculling program, very top tier athletes. 
And it, of course, in all of California, we've got a very, very strong emphasis on sculling. Now, the team from Holy Names here from Seattle, I would say probably more seasoned in the sweep boats, but doing a really nice job here as they hold on to a fifth place position. So Redwood Scullers in the lead, they are followed by Long Beach Juniors close by, it will be Marina Aquatic Center. So we've got Redwood Scholars out there in the lead. You have Marina Aquatic and Utah out there in lane four with a close second and third right now. And then just next to them, trailing a little bit, are the juniors out of Long Beach crew. They're uh, trailing our leaders, Redwood Scholars in that red hole on that inside lane. As these young athletes get through into the middle portions of this race, that's where those bridges disappear and they have the land. So if people watching here, they're able to tidy it up a little bit, really focus on that middle portion of the race where they can really come together as a crew. And when you get off the start like that, um, a little bit ahead and you can see where everyone else is, it allows you to dial it in and ha have a little bit more calm and some of those jitters that you felt right off the start start to work their way into a little more streamlined, a little smoother rowing. So we'll see what happens as we develop in the middle portion of this race, who gets a little cleaner and who can maybe take some ground um, as we continue down this 2,000 meter race course. It still is in the red hall. Redwood Scholars out in front, but two lanes over. Look at Marina Aquatic. They are staying right in there, looking to inch it up stroke by stroke as they come down this course. That's right, and those two crews see each other quite a bit. Redwood Scholars, Marina Aquatic, and Long Beach uh, Junior Crew, definitely uh, three of the top sculling programs in the nation and in California, but right now Redwood doing a nice job holding off Marina Aquatic Center. They have about a stern advantage over Marina, and back to Marina Aquatic Center by a bit of open water. It will be the crew from Utah. Great to see them with a nice showing. Long Beach Junior Crew continuing in the fourth place position. In fifth, it will be Holy Names, and then just behind Holy Names, it will be Zlack in sixth. All right, quite a bit of spread right now on the course in this women's under 17 quad. Again, no coxswain. A lot of these athletes, very seasoned scholars. We did see a little bit of steering issues coming out of one of the boats, but everyone looks to be back on course, rowing very cleanly. Continuing with the lead, it is the team from the port of Redwood City, Redwood Scholars, very seasoned crew as they hold on to that lead over the Marina Aquatic Center. Marina Aquatic Center rowing right next to UCLA. Um, and so not having to travel very far to come up here to the Crew Classic. But again, uh, very good competitors between Marina Aquatic Center and Red Redwood. They will see each other quite often this season. In third, it continues to be Utah. Great showing here from the, from the crew, only crew, I would say, from Utah. And uh, really great to see them challenging here in that third place position. 
In this race, it's important to note that the top four boats will advance to the final. The remainders will move on to a petite level or a B level final. So right now, we got to keep our eyes on the top four crews. Right now, it's Redwood, Marina Aquatic Center, Utah, and then Long Beach. And those are the four crews that have been in your top four places since the start of this race. There is a little more spread among those top four as we continue down the course. Redwood Scholars extending their lead as they come into the finishing stages of this race. There is a second heat of this uh, women's under 17 quad happening after this. So again, just the top few. So Redwood Scholars, even with that lead they have, I imagine that they'll be wanting to practice a sprint, practice the full race. They're not gonna hold anything back because you never know what's gonna happen in that next heat because whatever happens in heat one doesn't necessarily translate to the final. You've got to keep working to get faster and faster every stroke down the course. And keep an eye over on the far side of the course as well. Zlack and Holy Names out, are out there. And Holy Names is looking to get themselves into those top four as well as they seem to pick up a little bit of momentum as they come down the course. That's right. And some of these athletes are going to be doubling up. I don't know, maybe tripling up. There is a lot of fitness in these junior crews, and we can definitely see that as Redwood brings it to the line. Two boat lengths of open water for them as they wind it up. Not much of a sprint here. They're probably going to save it a little bit for that final. And then behind them, it will be Marina Aquatic Center looking very strong, very solid. Third place, Utah pushing themselves in to the final. Here they come, this is Utah, and then Long Beach Junior Crew. They will be your fourth place boat, and then just barely missing the final, Holy Names and Zlack doing a great job, just not quite able to match the speed of those top four boats, but again, with another chance to race in that B-level final. All right, and we are already underway in race 19. This is a, not a re-row, but a restart of the men's under 16 Cox quad. We have eight boats on the course. This is going to be absolutely crazy to keep track of these crews, but we'll do the best we can. I'll go ahead and give you the lane assignments in lane one, Los Gatos. Lane two, NorCal. Lane three, Long Beach Junior Crew. Lane four, Maritime. Lane five, Redwood Scholars. Lane six, Lake Las Vegas Rowing Club. Lane seven, Cathedral Catholic High School. And lane eight, Utah.
I think it's 143. Yes, and then three because North Hampshire got back. So they were, they're a little bit back. Uh, two, because there's one there. So yeah, so one, two, three. Am I missing one? I, I'm not sure. I, let's just go with Hatch. Because <laughs> it's the only, it's the only race here. So they're racing for the, to go into the final. Yeah, because it's here. I'll, I'll bring up him with just the top three. And as you can see from this aerial shot, the race, we had a false start earlier, so they brought the crews back in the men's under 16 coxed quad. This is the only heat in this event. So these, th these crews are vying for lanes for the upcoming final here. And from the beginning, it was close between Los Gatos and Maritime. But as they've worked their way into the center portions of this race, Maritime has continued to extend their lead to make it a little more of a command over second place Los Gatos and third place Long Beach Juniors. So Maritime, Los Gatos, and Long Beach Juniors are your top three crews in this men's under 16 coxed quad. All right, and coming into your spectator area, we can look out on the race course and see Maritime pulling themselves up to an even greater lead over your, over your second place crew, which will be Los Gatos right now. So Los Gatos coming up against the shoreline. Los Gatos with a really great sculling program, especially in the last couple of years, building up to a national caliber sculling program. But Maritime, solid lead here again, it is all about making a statement, and if they're going to come all the way out from Connecticut, that is exactly what they want to do here. As they come into the final strokes, Maritime looking very solid. They're followed by Los Gatos, and then looks to be a Long Beach in the third place spot. And those top three crews, you can see them coming down to the finish line. So if you're there on the shore, give them some noise because they can hear you. They are that close. Bringing it in, Maritime extending just a little bit more over Los Gatos, but it's been pretty tight between those two crews this whole time. It was that stroke by stroke in the center that gave them just little inches uh, down the race course. There wasn't a major move that occurred. And again, second place, that was Los Gatos, followed by third. You heard that third horn, Long Beach Juniors. All right, and with eight boats on the course, a uh, little bit difficult for us to see exactly what's going on, but it looks like Redwood Scholars pulling into the fourth place position, followed very closely by Lake Las Vegas. And then finally, it will be NorCal Crew and Cathedral Catholic High School.
All right, and we are already underway in our next race. We'll go ahead and let this race finish up before we give the lineups for the women's under 17 quad heat two. And as the final boat crosses the finish line in the men's under 16 coxed quad race, uh, the race that was delayed a little bit earlier, we are already underway in the second heat of the women's U17 quad. No coxswain for this one. So the top four will go on to the final from here and meet the top three from the previous race that was taken by Redwood Scholars and, uh, Redwood Scholars and Marina Aquanic in first and second, Utah in third, Long Beach Juniors in fourth. But here on the course, as you would read from the spectator side of the beach to the far side, in lane one, you will have Los Gatos on the field. You will have in lane Lane two, Holy Names. Lane three, Maritime. Lane four, Casitas Rowing. And in lane five, the far side will be Redwood Scholars. So as they come into the picture here and as they come into your view from the beach, bear in mind all the way from lanes one to lane five across the course, those are the five crews in this second heat of the women's U17 quad. And it looks like Maritime in lane three has pulled into that lead position, but being challenged by the outside lane, Redwood Scholars and Los Gatos. So those two lanes far away from each other, Redwood and Los Gatos, they've got to keep an eye on each other. And I'm looking at a little bit of a steering issue here coming out of lane one, Los Gatos, as they come into the final strokes. Um, so we will see if they can get back on course, but that definitely will deter their progression down the race course. So keeping it clean, Maritime, they've got a bit of open water over the rest of the field. We've also got Redwood Scholars in lane five and Los Gatos looking really strong here as they come into the spectator area. Back in the fourth place position, it's gonna, it looks like it will be Holy Names and then finally Casitas Rowing in fifth. And so your top three currently right now are in lanes one, three, and five. Across the field, down there in the middle, you have Maritime, followed by Los Gatos and Redwood Scholars. Los Gatos did have that little bit of a steering issue as we come into the closing portions of the field, but it seems that they've gotten back on track in their lane, and they are ready to charge hard. I can only imagine the adrenaline that that would give you once you have something like that happen. Recorrect it, fix it on the fly. That's an amazing correction by that young crew on the, on the course right now. That's right. And, you know, sometimes that's where this early season race really becomes handy because they can figure out what is it that we need to work on. OK, we got to dial in the adrenaline, take the excitement level down so that we can just execute. And that's exactly what Los Gatos did by coming right back into it. And again, Maritime well out in front, holding off both Los Gatos and Redwood Scholars. The fourth place position I am going to give to Casitas Rowing. Casitas um, always a very strong sculling program wearing really cleanly here in lane four and then finally holy names so boats coming into the final strokes And as we come across the line here, it is still Maritime out there in front, followed by Los Gatos. They did recorrect here to bring themselves to make it into the top four that will go on to that final. And in third place, it is going to be Redwood Scholars. Now that fourth spot is still up for grabs by between Holy Names and Casitas as they come down through the final portions of the race here. And it looks to be Holy Names that is in position to take that fourth spot that will advance to that first level final here in the under 17 women's quad.
And coming down the line here, rounding out this field of five in the women's under 17 quad is Casitas Rowing. So give them a hand as they come across the line here to wrap up this second heat, the second flight. You need flexibility. We get it. Active and Fit Now is a new fitness program that gives you options. For one low price per month, you get access to thousands of fitness centers and studios nationwide, so you can easily find your perfect fit. With no long-term contracts, you can switch your gym or cancel anytime. And stay active at home with thousands of workout videos included in your membership. It's super easy to enroll online. Just get active and fit now by going to activeandfitnow.com. Get it? It's in the name. And here we are with a start taking off in the next race. Now we're on to the men's under 17 quads. This is a single heat of eight boats across. In lane one, that's the closest lane, is going to be Newport Sea Base. Lane two, Artemis. Lane three, River City. Lane four, Maritime. Lane five, NorCal Crew. Lane six, Casitas Rowing, lane seven is Brophy, and in lane, say, lane eight on the far side is River City once again. We're off to a clean start in this eight boat race. As you can see, the crews are gonna be collecting themselves, coming off of their high strokes from the start, taking off in a quad. There is a lot going along, a, or a lot going on. A lot of technical dexterity is required right from the start because you know there's four people in the boat, but there are eight oars in there. There's a lot happening. And so those boats are able to get up to speed pretty quickly from that dead stop. And so the hands have to really move quickly. So you might see a few bobbles early on in the race, but but as they get into the second 500, that's after that first bridge, the crews will start to clean up. And as we've already seen, there are a couple of packs here trying to decide who is going to take those top spots. And right now, the quick placement from what we can see in the drones is River City in lane three holding on to the lead just by about three or four seats. And then we've got three boats very close to each other. It's Newport Sea Base, Artemis, and Maritime. So those four boats well out in front, behind them by open water. It's going to be uh, Brophy in lane seven in the fifth place position, followed closely by Casitas and then River City B and NorCal. So we'll get a little better placement as we come further down the race course. But right now, River City extending their lead to a bow to stern advantage over lane one, Newport Sea Base, and then lane four, Maritime. So top three boats in the fourth place spot. It will be Artemis. They're a pretty scrappy crew rowing out of the Oakland Estuary. Got a bunch of novices in that boat. So really great, really great positioning for them as they come into the final meters of this men's under 17 quad. So on the course here with eight lanes across, all eight of these boats will advance to the final. So they are vying for lanes here. And as it has been um, maritime in first from the very beginning on this inside lane, Newport Sea Base is making the charge as they come across the line. They have overtaken for the lead. So in lane one, having a great closing 500, it is Newport Sea Base followed by uh, River City. followed by Maritime in third, Artemis in fourth, they'll cross in fourth place here. With what appears to be Brophy out there in lane seven, coming out of Arizona to take the fourth place, fifth place spot. And the next, a close race here with NorCal and River City on the far lane here. Just about a length for NorCal over River City, who's in lane eight. followed by Casitas Rowing in lane six.
and moving into the next flight of quads. This is the youth quad. So likely the top four scholars in their programs, their respective pro programs. In these two upcoming heats, this is the women's concept two youth quad. The top three boats will move on to the final. The remainder will move on to the B-level final. And in this first heat, we have five boats on the course. In lane one, Redwood Scholars. Lane two, Los Gatos. Lane three, Maritime Rowing Club. Lane four, Utah. And lane six, River City. Lane five, River City. And it looks to be another clean start here in the Concept 2 Youth Quad Heat 1 for on the women's side. And the water this morning is just beautiful. We had rain a couple of days ago, and here we are, the sun shining down, raising up a little bit, giving us a little bit of a better view from where we sit here on shore by the finish line. And as the crews come off of their start and clean it up, they are certainly savoring the conditions this morning. with five boats here, 11 total in the event. The top three in this heat will go on to the first level final and the remaining crews, the other two crews out of this particular heat will go to the second level final. And all contact across, we have a little bit of a chevron pattern here happening from that overhead view that you can see, but all crews are still in contention here because as we've seen in previous races, some of the crews on the outside lanes have fantastic middle portions of the race that just allow them to creep back in and clench one of those top spots to advance in these races that, we're, that we'll see over the course of this weekend. And important to note that the biggest battle right now is between Redwood Scholars and Los Gatos. Those are the two of the top crews in the nation. So Redwood Scholars having taken the gold medal at Youth Nationals last year, still with some of those athletes crossing over into this year. So good amount of depth. But that's where we're seeing the biggest fight is between Los Gatos and Redwood Scholars lanes one and two. Very solid rowing, great blade work, good connection between the athletes. So very solid. One of the things I'm looking at, and Lindsay, you know, maybe you see something different, but with that Redwood crew, just so much connection between the athletes. Really calm, really, really confident. You can see a bit of a, an upright posture there at the front, not taking too much, staying nice and stable and compact in the body so that they're really able to dial into what the legs are doing. And when you set that up from the beginning, that just makes you nice and efficient down the course. It makes it easy to follow. It helps crews come together, dials in your rhythm so that you can just pick up speed one by one down the course. American Specialty Health congratulates the Crew Classic on its 50th anniversary, and we're proud to sponsor the Men's Varsity Collegiate Active and Fit Cal Cup. New this year, American Specialty Health is sponsoring the Active and Fit Recovery Lounge. The lounge will feature massage chairs, spin bikes, stretching mats, foam roller sets, and guided stretching videos. For race fans and rowers, American Specialty Health invites you to participate in the Pitch for Prizes game at the Active and Fit exhibit tent for a chance to win a prize. Through the Active and Fit programs, fitness enthusiasts can enjoy low-cost access to thousands of gyms nationwide. Learn more at activeandfitnow.com.
We currently still have our top three crews of Redwood, Los Gatos, and Maritime. Redwood is extending their lead over Los Gatos here with Maritime in third place currently. Remember, top three go to the first level final. And it is Utah there in the lane next to Maritime who wants to vie for one of those spots. Will they have enough time to make up the ground that they had given up early on in the race as they pass the beach coming into the closing portion of this race here? There is, without a question, that Redwood Scholars and Los Gatos here are the crews that are out in the lead over the next third, fourth, and fifth place. And again, top three go to the first level final from here. And this next heat that's coming up is also going to be just as competitive as this heat. So I just can't wait for the final. I mean, it really is um, just a testament to the depth of many of these programs to see the quality of rowing and competitiveness that we're looking at right now. But Redwood Scholar is very deep program. Uh, emphasizing almost exclusively sculling. Los Gatos with both sweep rowers and scullers, but over the last couple of years really coming up in the ranks with uh, the sculling program. And last year they actually had the winner in the single skulls um, from Los Gatos. So just kind of firing up that program and we can see that right here. So again, good depth. Redwood Scullers with that lead, Los Gatos in second, Maritime back by a bit of open water, but again in that top three. So they will uh, barring any incidences between now and the finish line, we'll move on to that A-level final, followed by Utah and then River City. Coming into their final strokes here, it is Redwood Scullers still sitting in first place on that inside lane, lane one, coming into the last few of this heat one of the Concept 2 Youth Women's Quad with Clearwater over current second place, Los Gatos. <laughs> and a decent bit of Clearwater over third place, currently third place, Maritime followed by Utah. And rounding out our, our field of five here is River City in lane five on the far side of the course. To wrap heat one of the Concept 2 Youth Women's Quad. The next race that'll be up on the course is going to be heat two, which will be a six boat race. So again, in these two heats, the top three crews will go to the first level final and then remaining crews will go to the second level final. So the top three coming out of Heat 1 were Redwood Scholars, Los Gatos, and Maritime. So they will move on to the first level final. And we will find out who will join them there as soon as Heat 2 is underway in the Concept 2 Youth Women's Quad. And we are underway in heat two of the Concept 2 Youth Women's Quad. In lane one, I'll set the field for you here, is going to be Y Quad Cities, a name certainly well known in youth women's collegiate uh, or, or youth women's sculling here. Uh, lane two, Long Beach Juniors. In lane three will be Marina Aquatic. Lane four, NorCal. And lane five, Zlack. And it looks to be 
early on here in lanes two and lane four, Long Beach and NorCal looking for that early lead as they get out of that first 500. You can see that black flag there. They're working their way into closely getting, about to get into the second 500 of the race as those crews come off of their start sequences, lengthening into their base rhythm that's going to give them that rhythm to be efficient all the way down the course. It is still quite close between lanes two and four, NorCal and Long Beach. This is going to be exciting all the way down. And then close behind them are in lanes one and lane three, Y Quad Cities and Marina Aquatic Center are going to be the top four currently right now with Zlack and Cathedral Catholic in places five and six currently. All right, and it does look like Long Beach has taken over that lead. Um, again, really hot start by all of these crews, but then a lot really happens in that first 500 coming into the second 500, the crews settling in to their base rhythm. So again, for those of you uh, watching online or even watching from the shoreline, you know, the crews start out with some very high strokes and then they settle down into what is sustainable for the body of the piece. And that's what we're seeing right here through this second 500. Coming into the halfway, point that's really I think where everything shakes out that's where we're going to see a lot of separation in crews that is the pain cave going into that third 500 that's the tough part that's where you see the fitness and the technique because once your technique falls apart it is really hard to sustain the rhythm of that boat so all of these crews, Y Quad City, Long Beach Juniors, Marina, NorCal, doing a really great job here as they continue to move through the race course and just past 1,000 meters. And you could just see that it looked like Y Quad City has decided to go, hey, you know what, we're going to clean it up a little bit, maybe pick up the rate just a hair, make a little move, see if they could overtake the lead from Long Beach Juniors. Expect Y Quad Cities to be strong in this event. Um, they are definitely, you know, they've been national contenders in the past. have had strong showings at the Youth National level in this particular event for a number of years now uh, and so as we come down the course expect them to be efficient expect them to continue to gain speed this is again heat two in this particular event so the top three from the previous heat will meet the top three from this heat in the first level final and the remaining crews will go to the second level final in that red hull if you're on shore you might still have a bit of a glare but in the red hull on that inside lane is going to be Y Quad Cities who has extended the lead they may made a they took a large margin there through the middle portion of the race they were patient off of the start did their thing didn't get shaken by the fact that they were not first off of the line and they have done the work through the middle and it's going to set them up for a nice finish here closing into the final portion of the race that's right and that base rhythm that we were talked about every crew has a little bit of the different race plan and some crews want to start out really, really hot, but sometimes that doesn't do them many favors, and it's the crew that's patient, consistent, and confident. And that's what we're seeing here with Y Quad Cities as they've overtaken the lead and just now continuing to just walk away from the competition. So in second place, we're looking at Long Beach Juniors. And in third, NorCal, Marina slipping back to fourth. And then in fifth, it will be Zlack. And then finally, Cathedral Catholic High School crews now coming into the finish. And there you have it, Y Quad Cities coming across in first in lane one. Having extended their lead right next to them is going to be the Long Beach Juniors coming across strong as well. with NorCal in lane four, rounding out the top three that will advance to the first level final, unofficially. With Marina Aquatic in lane three.
And on the far side of the course, it looks to be Zlac followed by Cathedral Catholic to round out our field of six, heat two of the Concept Two Youth Women's Quad. That's right. And Cathedral Catholic, just want to point out one of the few high school programs in really in the country. I, we see a lot of uh, high school crews more on the East Coast, but Cathedral Catholic sponsored program uh, with their rowing. Program, Master Masters Rowing is your partner well. for all things Masters Rowing. If you race, come get a training program. If you like podcasts, Faster Masters Rowing Radio is live every Thursday at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Find out more at FasterMastersRowing.com. Faster Masters proudly sponsors the new Intermediate Masters 8s at the 50th Anniversary San Diego Crew Classic. All right, and already on the course and underway is the men's youth quad. This is the Joan Ward Cup. We have two heats that are coming up, and the top four boats will move on to the final. The remainder will move on to the B-level final. In lane one, Los Gatos. Lane two, Oakland Strokes. Lane three, Maritime Rowing. Lane four, Community Rowing San Diego. Lane five, Brophy Pep Prep and lane six, Utah. And as we get into the beach here, you can see uh, out in front we have in lane, um, lane three is Maritime. Closely followed in lane one in second place is going to be Los Gatos, currently right now holding on to that second place position. In lane two, Oakland Strokes is currently in the top three as well. And rounding out your top four looks to be Community Rowing San Diego. The reason I say top four is because top four are going to go to that first level final here as we have 13 boats in this, um, in this Joan Ward cu uh, Cup for the youth men's quad. Nice to point out that Los Gatos and Maritime facing off against each other the last time they raced was at Youth Nationals where they came in 2-3. Los Gatos was second, Maritime was third, and uh, so I'm sure there's a little bit of um, extra competitiveness out there on the water as they come into these final strokes. And our current leaders out of Maritime do have open water lead over the rest. There is a large spacing between first, second, and third places here. Um, but again, top four are going to go through to that first level final. And so really what we're doing here is we're finding who's going to sit in what lanes. And when we round out the next heat, we will find out who's going to complete that first level final. But coming down to the line here is Maritime rowing in lane three. And then on the inside, tightly contested with Los Gatos. Oakland Strokes coming in with behind them. Yeah. 
And we do have community rowing San Diego rounding out the top four here. And it looks to be Brophy coming across the line in fifth. Since 1987, So Sporty has produced the highest quality, comfortable, and durable rowing apparel right up the road in Vista, California. So Sporty offers team uniforms, splash jackets, spirit wear, and much more. We are committed to ensuring quality products and orders that are delivered on time. And heat two of the men's youth Joan Ward Cup. This is the men's youth quad is already underway here. And I'm going to set the field as we, uh, as these crews pass through, getting into the second 500 of this race in lane one. That's the closest lane to the shore here is Redwood Scholars. Lane two is Long Beach. Lane three, Texas Center. Lane four, Casitas Rowing. Lane five is Y Quad Cities. Lane six is Ikaika out of Hawaii. And in lane seven, Maritime. And of course, we want to give a shout out to the crew from Hawaii, the only rowing program in Hawaii, even though if you take a look quick Google search, you'll find that rowing actually has a pretty rich past in Hawaii, but the only rowing program coming all the way over here to race at the San Diego Crew Classic, Akaika also raced at the head of the Charles earlier this fall, and they only have a four, probably a convertible to a quad, um, so really awesome to see them out here. Uh, what a great trip and an impression. They actually send quite a few of their athletes onto collegiate programs. Um, so here they are against some of the top crews in the nation. We'll see if we can get a placement for you as we progress down the race course. All right, top three crews at this point. Looks like Texas Rowing Center, very closely followed by a deadlock between Redwood Scholars and Long Beach Junior Crew. That's sure to change as we come down the course as I'm seeing Redwood Scholars very patient, just kind of clicking along and eating into that lead that Texas Rowing Center has. Right now in the fourth place position, we're gonna move out to lane five, that's Y Quad Cities, followed very closely by Maritime in lane seven. In the sixth place spot, we'll move back onto the inside. That would be Casitas. 
and then in seventh, Akaika. So let's keep an eye on these top three crews as they come into the final strokes here, final 100 meters. It does look like Texas Rowing Center is going to hold on to that lead. Now, keep your eye here on lanes one and two. Long Beach, Redwood Scholars, who's going to cross that line in that second place position? <coughs> Looks like Redwood Scholars is going to hold on to it. And then here comes Long Beach. Look to be Y Quad Cities followed by Maritime. Casitas coming across the line with Ikaika out of Hawaii coming across the line to round out the field of seven. Because this is the second of two heats in the Joan Ward Cup for the men's youth quad, the top four places will advance to the first level final to meet the other uh, four crews from the previous race in that first level final. Remaining crews will go to final two. We've set records in Wintech. We really felt the King was the most efficient, effective, and fastest shell out on the water for us. Wintech King is the perfect boat to rep. All hail the King! We are already underway in what is a new event for the Crew Classic. This is the Women's Youth Quad B. So this will be the second level boats for these programs with an open age category. In lane one, we're looking at Redwood Scholars. Lane two, Los Gatos. Lane three, NorCal. And lane four, Redwood Scholars B. So Redwood Scholars in this event with two boats on the course on opposite ends of the field. Redwood uh, A in lane one and Redwood B in lane four. And in the middle, Los Gatos and NorCal. We'll get a placement for you as they come down the race course. update from the course. Los Gatos does hold on to the lead just slightly over Redwood Scholars, but again, everyone's race plan is a little bit different, so we're not going to call it right here. There's still a lot of race course left, but right now what we're looking at is a slight lead by Los Gatos over Redwood Scholars, then followed by NorCal, and then Redwood Scholars B. through the 1,000 meter mark. Redwood Scholars B has moved into the third place position overtaking NorCal, NorCal slipping back to fourth. This is, again, a race for lanes. So all of these boats, these four boats, will progress directly to the final and just kind of getting into position to make sure that they have the best lane possible for the finals later on.
Los Gatos here is maintaining their lead as they come into the final portions of the race. Redwood Skull is just inside them in lane one, is looking to charge for sure. We've seen Redwood Skullers pick up momentum down the course, so never count anyone out until that horn fires and the officials make it official. So anything we say up here is what we see by our eye, but it's only unofficial until it's in the books and marked by those fantastic referees that are taking care of things for us this morning. And you know the strategy in a race like this where you know you're going to move on to the final, right? There is, there's no question about that. I think for these crews it's really all about executing a race plan, most likely not putting everything out on the table, but clearly Redwood Scholars A and Los Gatos having raced each other uh, previously, most likely this season um, down in Long Beach, and seeing each other many times throughout the course of a season you know, we don't want to peak here at the San Diego Crew Classic. This is all about analyzing and redefining the race plan and just dialing it in. And so that's what's really fun to see with these crews as they come through the heats, moving directly onto the finals. We'll see what that final looks like and, you know, what, that, what the crews do that's a little bit different than what we're seeing on the course right now. just coming into our view as we cross into these last 10 or less strokes for uh, Los Gatos who still has that first place bringing it in dial dialing it in about to cross the finish line going to take the pole position the lane that is going to be the most favorable for them going into that first level final still followed by Redwood Scholars who will trail them in second place last couple of strokes before you hear that second horn And Redwood Scholar's second entry here in this event, rounding out top three, followed by NorCal Crew, will be your fourth crew across the line. Again, this is the Women's Youth B Quad. This is the first heat. This is a race for lanes for a first level final that will happen later on this weekend. Campland is celebrating 46 years on Mission Bay. Campland has a full marina and a complete range of boat and water sport rentals for use on Mission Bay. As in rowing, the time-honored values of teamwork and good sportsmanship are instilled in the young campers who participate in the sports, games, and activities offered year-round at the park. Campland on the Bay is proud to sponsor the Women's Masters F Trophy at the 50th Anniversary San Diego Crew Classic. Race 27 is going to be the Men's Youth B Quad. This is your first heat. All boats will go to the first level final. So let's set the field before we get going here. It's going to be lane one is Los Gatos. Lane two, Maritime. Lane three, Redwood Scholars. Lane four, Texas Center. Lane five, Maritime. Lane six, Redwood Scholars. So both Maritime and Redwood Scholars having two entries in this particular event. All right, and the 
quick update from the course in terms of placement. We're looking at Los Gatos with a lead. They are right against the shoreline here in lane one. In the second place position, it will be Maritime. They have an open water advantage over lane four, Texas Rowing Center. So Texas Rowing Center in the third place spot. They are followed closely by Redwood Scholars out of lane three. And then finally, in the fifth and sixth place position, respectively, it will be Maritime, followed by Redwood Scholars. So again, we have two entries here for Maritime, two entries from Redwood Scholars. The A boats are in the more lead positions, and then the B boats behind them, which is as it should be. But Los Gatos looking very strong here, now with a bit of open water over Maritime A. Back to them by a bit more of sig significant amount of water, it will be Texas Rowing Center. Th those are your top three crews, but again, all crews move directly onto the final. So again, just uh, jockeying for position for good lane placement. Here they come to the line. It is Los Gatos. They are followed by Maritime. You can see a nice little pattern here. Texas Rowing Center in the third place spot, just holding off Redwood Scholars. Here comes Texas as they cross the line. And uh, Redwood Scholars. And then final two crews, Maritime B and then Redwood Scholars B. We are moving back into some different racing here. We're done with the juniors portion of the morning. And now we're gonna move our attention back up to the start for the men's masters eight H category. This is for gentlemen that are 70 years of age and older. We've got two boats on the course. This is Kent Mitchell in lane one and then USC alums in lane two. Kent Mitchell, a composite crew of athletes that are generally a group of uh, former rowers and professionals from the Bay Area and uh, named after Kent Mitchell Coxon, who was a gold medalist in the 60 and 64 Olympics. So uh, always seeing them at various regattas throughout the country. They stay in shape and they race whenever they can.
And this is a two-boat race between in lane one, Kent Minchel, and in lane two, the USC uh, alumni. This is the Men's Masters 8. All of these, all the folks racing in this particular race are, are, are an average of 70 plus years old. And that's one of the things that I love about coming to regattas like this is seeing the range of people that are drawn to this sport, why you enter it in the first place, staying in it for a lifetime. You know, we always talk about rowing as being a lifetime sport. And here we are with proof of that, whether it's to rejoin your alums and have, you know, a good time, a little reunion time to get out on the course. Some of these Folks might row together periodically throughout the year. They meet one another at some point in their lives and then go throughout the country and might not be able to see each other except at events like this. So to be able to hop into a hull, come together and have a clean row, you know, that is something special. There's just something magical for those of you who are out here, something magical about this sport. When you get in the boat with your buds on the water, especially when it's in sunny, beautiful San Diego with this flat water we have this morning. Absolutely. I mean, that is the motivation to stay in shape, right? To get it, to be able to come down here. And, and San Diego is a celebration of rowing. That's what this is. I, I've always looked at this in my post-collegiate years as, you know, it is, it's a party. This is where you come out and you, you know, enjoy the sport with your friends. You enjoy the sun, you get to head over to the beer garden have a couple of brews, uh, most likely spending more time in the beer garden than you do on the water, but that's <laughs> all a part of the fun. And as you can see coming into the picture here are two boats in this men's masters eight age level of average age 70 plus years old it is usc with an edge over lane one kent mitchell but it's still quite close as we come into the closing portions of this race usc in the darker shirts and kent mitchell in the lighter shirts on the nearer shore so give them a hand as they start to come into your picture here as you can start to see them urge them on as they come into the closing portions of this race just over six minutes down and they're coming into the closing portions.
and we're into the last 300 here. As you see those tents, that's about the last 500 meters of the race, the last quarter portion of the race itself. And it still is USC alums in lane two in the darker hull, extending their lead just, just over broken, or broken into open water of lane one over lane one Kent Mitchell. Just an ama amazing legacy for a lot of these athletes in the sport of rowing, probably having raced here in San Diego, some maybe in the Olympics, some at national championships and top tier programs out of that Kent Mitchell boat. And then of course the USC alum showing the depth of that program over the years. What an awesome race for a duel coming all the way down the race course. That was really quite close, fun to watch. In 1996, the Chapman brothers, Ron and Rick, opened a brew pub in their hometown of Coronado. Today, Coronado Brewing Company stays true to its San Diego roots, brewing abundantly hoppy West Coast-style ales. Coronado won a bronze medal at the 2019 Great American Beer Festival for its Weekend Vibes IPA, a silver medal for its Salty Crew Blonde in 2020, and a gold medal for its Palm Sway IPA in 2021. Coronado Brewing Company, stay coastal. The Mission Bay Yacht Club has a strong tradition of Corinthian sailboat racing. This is encouraged by club-sponsored regattas throughout the year. You'll find national champions and novices alike competing in our regattas. Mission Bay Yacht Club's ideal location makes it a favorite venue for national and world championship sailing regattas. The San Diego Crew Classic thanks the Mission Bay Yacht Club for their many years of support and volunteerism that helps the regatta thrive in our shared home on Mission Bay.
So we're here in the booth with Peter Mallory here to give us a little bit of background on this exhibition first final that is on the course right now. It is the 1974 boat with uh, Long Beach State, correct? Correct. And I'm here with Peter Mallory. Peter, welcome. Please, what can you tell us about this crew that is on the field right now? They're a lovely crew. They were 31-0 in 1974. They were Western champions. They were... Uh, just lovely people, but they've bonded, and they've bonded for a lifetime. And so we have all stayed in touch. We haven't done a lot of rowing in the last 49 years, but we have, uh, we have gotten together. And we're so grateful to the Crew Classic for inviting us back for their 50th reunion. And you say you haven't done, you haven't rowed here together in a number of years, but you just told me that you won the lightweight single here in 1974. I did. <laughs> Personally, it was a... Uh, but... Yeah, those were, those were the salad days. And, and when we were talking <laughs> a little bit earlier about this crew in particular, what was it that was special about your trip down here together? The first time that you came here, you told me that you overtook a crew that hadn't been beaten in two and a half years? UCLA, uh, lightweight rowing was catching fire on the West Coast, and UCLA had, had a crew for two or three years, and they'd never lost. And they came down here expecting, and we spanked them, and... Uh, they, uh, it, it was it was a big surprise. It was I, I expected it, but they didn't. Pleasant surprise. Pleasant <laughs> surprise. Surprise, and it was what I had told the guys uh, from the fall. You guys are going to be undefeated. You're going to be the best in the West, and we're going to start it here in the San Diego Crew Classic. And that was prior to the win that you had over UCLA. And then you said yeah. you went on to win how many straight? Uh, Thirty-one and zero total, uh, including the Newport Regatta, including a dual race with uh, with UCLA, including the Western Sprints up in Burnaby Lake. Uh, it was a lovely, lovely year. And you said, I mean, you said 31-0 and 0 and that you, you know, you set them up. What, what, what specifically do you think really helped motivate the group to go, to buy into that? Because obviously they did. You said that a lot of, some I of them went on to the world champions, the, the world yeah. championships, and coxswains at the Olympic level. And we did all sorts of. We just made it. We made it fun, yeah. and uh, they will tell you that I pushed them very hard. But but we uh, we made it fun, and here they are coming towards the finish line. I am so proud to be here, and we are all so grateful to. Uh, all the people that have made this possible for the Crew Classic. Longtime steward Peter Mallory, longtime steward of the uh, San Diego Crew Classic. Please give a hand to the crew, the 1974 Cal State Long Beach lightweight crew that's coming across the line here. They went 31-0 and 0, uh, those years ago back in 1974. If you see those yellow and brown long sleeve shirts that say Long Beach on the middle with 1974 at the top, you'll see them around this weekend. Go and talk to them. That's rowing history. That's why we're here you are a part of rowing history you're witnessing rowing history on the water fantastic peter thank you anything else that you want to add about the group that's out there right now i just we're all family and we will be family forever and it is it it, it is a privilege to come here i i can't I, i'm going to thank the crew classic again for inviting us well thank you I hear that family, right? You find family. a team, and I know that that thread kind of rings That's true for a lot of people. Lindsay, out there you right know this now. too. Yeah. Rowing is family. Yeah, yeah. You and I are family, yeah. and we just met. Yeah, it's that kind of thing. Yeah, it really is. God, I'm gonna give you a hug. <laughs> hug here in the booth. You can hear our microphones <laughs> hitting. <laughs> All right, you just watched the exhibition there with the Cal State Long Beach uh, crew from Your 1974. Family. They were the lightweights that <laughs> dealt UCLA their first loss in two and a half years, went on to 31-0, and and a lot of those members went on to national and international prowess from there on out.
Jack's design. Everyone I put into the boat uh, kind of raves about it, and I've just seen good jumps in speed. The FLX especially, it just feels great as it moves through the water. It's very responsive. It reacts to what you want it to do and runs out really nice in between the strokes. So as we have a few more minutes, we are prepping for the first collegiate race of the morning with the Women's Collegiate Varsity Jessup Whittier Cup Invitational. This will be a two-heat event with nine boats across the two, uh, two heats. We'll see some uh, national and international competition on the water. We still have a several minutes before that race gets underway, the first of those two here. But as you can tell, a little more life happening on the back beach here, a little more bustling occurring as some of the collegiate crews show up as we get more and more big boats uh, beginning to show up for their races that are going to happen from here on out throughout the day. So life starting to happen behind the tent, even though we're here looking at an empty finish line right now. Up next, the Women's Collegiate Varsity Jessup Whittier Cup Invitational.
start a little bit early here off of the blocks. This is heat one of the women's collegiate varsity Jessup Whittier Cup Invitational in lane one, Texas. Lane two, Washington. Lane three, Oxford Brooks. Lane four, Notre Dame. And lane five, Rowing Canada. That is an exhibition crew, so uh, although they will race with official results, it is more of a, an exhibition for them and not um, coming into the, the results as if they win. I don't think that there are, um, there's an official result for them. So here we go. We're just in the first few strokes here and boats are still very, very tightly packed, but out of the gates, the leader is gonna come out of the middle lane. That is Oxford Brooks. They have about a four seat advantage over lane one, Texas. Texas sitting two seats over Washington. Washington about one seat over Canada and then back to Canada by about five seats it will be Notre Dame. So again still very early on who is still in their high stroke ratings and then coming down into their base eights crossing over the first 500 meters. And these are the first five out of the nine crews in this event and it was Oxford Brooks that in that center that lane three that got off to the early quick start but Texas and Washington both uh, both patient behind them. It did appear to be Oxford Brooks, Washington, and then Texas just in those initial phases. But then Texas has very methodically, very metronomically worked their way back in, which is typical of their style. Get off the line, get into their rhythm, and then just motor down the course, stay as consistent as possible. And as they get into the last, we're crossing into the beach here in the last little bit, or sorry, into the middle of the race, getting to that first beach after that first uh, bridge has finished into the second 500. Texas seems to be looking to overtake the lead here from Oxford Brooks that is one of those international crews here in this heat one. An important to note that for these crews, we've got Texas coming out of the Big 12, Washington from the Pac-12, Oxford Brooks and Rowing Canada, just stocked with elite oarsmen, surely some Olympians or future Olympians in there. So this is the highest caliber of rowing that we're gonna see in San Diego uh, this whole weekend. So really great showing here as we look at Texas, Oxford Brooks and Rowing Canada, really quite close, just separated by a couple of feet. And Texas does seem to continue to take just inch by inch, and so is Rowing Canada out on the far side, coming up inch by inch as well, almost moving as if they are lassoed to Texas over there. Texas currently ranked number one in the very early, early season of the Collegiate Rowing Coaches Association Collegiate Bowls. That's the women NCAA standing. And the University of Washington currently sitting in a fifth place in that current in that ranking. Right now, they're among the top four of these five crews. Again. Texas and Washington collegiate crews, Oxford Brooks and Rowing Canada international crews. Notre Dame is that in lane four, the fifth crew in this uh, first heat coming out of the ACC. Yep, and Notre Dame having probably raced a little bit more than any other crew, um, any collegiate crew out here on the water. They just recently raced at the Cardinal Invite, racing crews such as Tennessee, Yale, Clemson, and doing quite well with their showing. So great to see them here at the San Diego Crew Classic. Texas just coming off of a couple of scrimmages with SMU and then uh, Washington making the uh, making their, their second race of the season. They just finished up the Husky Invite. So great to see them out here. This is really a, a preview of the rest of the season where some of these crews will race each other again. Uh, the Pac-12 teams that are here will race each other a few times but really great to see Texas and Washington right next to each other. Last time they saw each other was at NCAA. And really just fantastically better conditions right now. There's not a lick of wind, tide is calm. These are the conditions where we see some fast times coming down and Texas doing a nice job just staying patient. But look at Rowing Canada. Rowing Canada out there on that far lane, they seem to have taken over that lead spot. But from our angle, it's a little bit hard to see exactly what the uh, what the, the difference is between the crews. So Texas and Rowing Canada doing a such a nice job out in front. It looks to be Oxford Brooks in the third place position now, still within contact, Washington there in that fourth place spot. And then Notre Dame just a little bit off the back by open water. But coming into the spectator area, it will be Texas with the lead. Texas now solidly into that top spot. 
And what an opportunity to come out on this race course and, and race some international crews, even albeit one of them is an exhibition out in that far rain lane with Rowing Canada. That's a fantastic opportunity for collegiate crews to set up their season. People are going to know a lot of different teams are racing this weekend throughout the country. Then everybody's going to go and compare who did what, where. And it's not necessarily going to be the time that they're looking at, but they're going to look at who placed against who when they are side by side in the same race, because that's what matters the most. And Texas, as we see, is well into the last 500 here. That's what those tents signify. They have extended their lead, not in one massive gross, oh, this one move did it. They did it stro one stroke at a time down the course, which is exactly what you want to see. That shows consistency. That shows uh, technical acuity, staying together, and just being patient, not worrying about get taking a length in 10 strokes. It's about taking a length over 2,000 meters. And that is a signature of Texas, I would say, is their patience confidence and composure. I had them clocked at 37 strokes a minute for the body of this piece. Oxford Brooks maybe a little bit higher at about 38. And although those seem like pretty high stroke ratings, to be honest, that is about what is normal these days. So high level of fitness. Texas coming in to the final strokes here. Still really good contact. We've got Canada on the outside. And Washington moving. And then Washington also <coughs> moving on Oxford Brooks. Top three boats to move on. And Washington might just eke it out as they cross the line. That is something you want. You do not stop before the wow. buoy. You go all the way through it because it does, through our eye, appear to be. This is unofficial, but it does appear that Washington was able to sneak in there by just a surge of the bow ball over Oxford Brooks. So way to be patient, too. To row from behind with such a strong field is incredibly important. That's great maturity and learning through that crew as well. Well, we'll see as the official times come out, but um, right now we're looking at the times on the screen. It does look like Oxford Brooks might have eked into that third place position, but again, these are unofficial results. two of the Women's Collegiate Varsity Jessup Whittier Cup. Again, this is an invitational. Top three crews to move on to the grand final. The remainder will move on to the petite level or B level finals. Lane one, Stanford. Lane two, California. Lane three, USC. And lane four, Washington State. ideal racing conditions right now just again the glassiest water that we've seen and it should be absolutely no problem getting aligned at the start for those of you that are new to the sport of rowing what happens is that the crews come into the starting blocks they are put into perfect alignment by their bows and then pulled uh, they used to be able to say no I'm not ready but now they don't do that anymore you got to be ready when they say go as we await the start of this second heat of the Women's Collegiate Jessup Whittier Cup Invitational. Three to the four crews on the water this morning are in the top 20 for the Women's Collegiate, the CRCA, Collegiate Rowing Coaches Association, the NCAA ranking, uh, and that's Stanford coming out for the last couple of years, having placed second in the nation on the women's side. California Cal it, uh, currently ranked seventh in the country in that very early season poll with USC currently sitting in 16th in that early season poll. So nice that these crews have the opportunity to line up against one another with more than just a dual race, which is so common in collegiate rowing, until you reach your regional or conference championship or national championship. And this is an all Pac-12 race right here with Stanford, California, USC, Washington State. They will face each other again in different races as we progress through the season, but again, San Diego Crew Classic, a really important race to test your metal, to find out how do we execute perfectly. California there clocked at 38 strokes a minute. USC also at 38. We'll get a rating on Stanford coming up and then Washington State. 
You can see in the picture there is USC. They have a, a what, what appears to be a bucket rig between six and seven. That could be for guidance. It could be for leverage. Usually in the eight, that's what it is. And they are using it to their advantage as they maintain contact all four boats across. It is Stanford out there with an the early lead by about a half of a length over California with USC behind them and Washington State. But again, all four crews on the field still within contact of one another. That's right. And Stanford and California both clocked at 37 strokes a minute, just pacing each other and looking to see what they can bring in this third 500. So they are already well into the race here. And again, this is the gut check. This third 500, this is where the fitness, this is where the technique really come into play because you got to be able to hold the technique together when your body says stop. You know, we talk about that gut check. When do you prepare for the gut check? I always like to say to crews that I get to coach is uh, the training is the hard part. The racing is the fun part. So this is December. This is November. This is what did you do when you weren't with your team over the holidays? This is years of staying in touch and consistent with your fitness so that you have somewhere to go in the middle portion of the race so that you aren't totally smoked before you cross that thousand. You can push reset and go, all right, legs are burning, lungs are burning, eyes are wide open, brain is empty because you are just pushing so hard physically that psychologically you've got nothing there but flow at that point and then back to the race course we've got Stanford still a little bit of connection between Stanford and California California off the back uh, to Stanford by about uh, about a stern so Stanford with about a stern lead back to them with a bit of open water it's going to be USC USC rowing at a slightly lower stroke rating than California I had them clocked at 36 and then on the far lane it will be Washington State again a little bit of contact there for Washington State and USC so as we come down the race course coming into the final 500 they should be coming into the spectator area here we'll see if these boats are winding up for their sprint or whether it's just kind of pacing along as they know that this is pretty clear who the top three boats are that will move on to that grand final. Not a whole lot of sense of urgency in these heats as they just jockey for position and uh, get that perfect lane. You know, and one of the fun things to realize here is that, you know, as the NCAA has expanded, there are more and more international athletes involved in it. So there are some of the best athletes in the country and in the world uh, on the women's side racing in this event this morning. Some of them might have under 23 world championship experience. Some of them might have their eyes on potentially one day making it toward the senior team if they haven't done so already uh, in their various countries or even the Olympic level. So this is some of the top notch racing on the planet. Absolutely, and that's that's exactly what we'll see at the national championships at the end of the season with many of these crews making an appearance there. These are the top tier athletes, not only in the nation, but some in the world and gearing up to race for their respective countries. Um, really just an amazing place to put it out on the line here at the Crew Classic in this early season racing. One of the things I'd like to point out, though, is that it's not all about elite athletes. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of walk-ons out here, and you know we have to remember that these athletes are athletes. They mm -hmm. are the, some of the top athletes you know, that can come into this program without a lick of experience and vie for a spot in a top-tier elite program. They're also students. We're looking at you know Stanford, California, USC, mm -hmm. Washington State. These are academically focused colleges, and so for them to be able to balance the academics along with elite level athleticism, I it's just amazing. As we enter into just about the last 500 meters, it will be Stanford uh, entering the closing quarter of this race with open water lead over current second place California. Still that stagger straight from lanes one, two, three, and four across Stanford, Cal, USC, then Washington State as they come into the closing a bit here. Uh, staying composed, knowing that there's another race after this, but also dialing into your race plan, making sure that you're practicing that as well. It's incredibly important to make sure that you, you don't leave any guesswork to the next race. Use this as a stepping stone. Figure out some kinks, fix maybe one or two things uh, for the next race. No matter how well you perform here, there is always something to be learned. So if you're on shore or in the boat, keep an eye and learn something. All right, and here we go. Final strokes here for Stanford as they come through into the final 50 meters or so. 
Not that much of a wind up here. Doesn't look like that much of a sprint. They had dropped their rating down to about a 35. Same thing for California. So just cruising across the line. They want to put down a good time, though, because, of course, we're going to take a look and compare between the heats. There is always that. So Stanford with an open water lead. Here comes California. California in the second place spot. They are followed by USC. USC still holding off a really good charge here by Washington State to round out this Jessup Whittier Cup Invitational. And there you have it, four horns, four boats across the line as we close out heat two of the Women's Collegiate Varsity Jessup Whittier Cup. and we're back in the racing action here up at the start. This is the Women's Grace Rett Memorial Collegiate Varsity D2, D3, and Club Heat 1. Top 3 move on to the final. There will be two heats here on the course. In lane 1, Purdue. Lane 3, UC Davis. Excuse me, lane 2, UC Davis. Lane 3, Pacific Lutheran. Lane 4, Clark B., they have two entries here. The B boat is in this heat. The A boat is in the next heat. And then in lane five, Trinity B. All right, so we have a good mix here of club programs coming from Purdue and UC Davis. The three D3 programs, Pacific Lutheran, Clark B, and Trinity B, rounding out this heat. So. Boats just in their starting sequence. We'll let it shake out a little bit while we wait for some placement calls. And as we're just over a minute, getting into about a minute and a half uh, down in this race, it is on the far side. Trinity's B lineup in lane five, who's one of the early contenders with the two inside lanes, UC Davis in per and Purdue. So among those, those are going to be your top three currently in this first half of the race with Pacific Lutheran and Clark B trailing there behind. And just as the picture changed, it is Purdue that is now edging it out from the beginning, taking it back from Trinity, who, who, who had the early lead. So along with Purdue, Purdue is taking UC Davis in lane two with them. Those two crews are, are side by side, but Purdue is taking seat by seat as I'm speaking. And Trinity B over on the far side, again in lane five, is uh, looking to maintain contact. And potentially that coxswain, it seems like they're noticing that those two inside crews are trying to slip away. So they're doing enough. She's made a call and they are um, looking to eat a little bit back into to make sure that they stay in touch with UC Davis. Sometimes it is a little bit hard when you have crews between you and then you're the people that you're vying with, the other teams that you're really vying with are on the opposite side of the course. So good work on that coxswain's part to make sure that the crew is aware of what's going on without distracting them by what's happening outside of the boat. Because at the end of the day, it's what's happening in the boat that matters most. That is true. And for some of these programs, Clark, especially coming all the way across the country to race here at San Diego, this is likely the opening of their season, the first time that they might have been on the water 
here since uh, the fall, maybe getting some winter training in, but not sure how much you can get on the East Coast. So coming all the way out to San Diego to test themselves against some of the best club and D3, D2 programs in the nation. So doing a really fine job here with this B entry, holding tight to Trinity and uh, Pacific Lutheran. So out in front though, Purdue, very, very strong club program, obviously from Indiana. They make a statement every year at the ACRA or the club national championships. I got to see them last year and man, are they a tough crew from top to bottom, men and women. They really have quite a program and they're showing that right here as they come into the final 500 meters. So Purdue with a solid lead over UC Davis. UC Davis, a program that's gone back and forth between varsity status and club status. Right now they're in that club status and showing that they're a strong crew and can really hold their own uh, up against Purdue. Definitely one of the strongest club programs in the nation. Pacific Lutheran also doing a nice job. They are a perpetual competitor at the national championships. Trinity as well. So Really good uh, cross-section of women's rowing here on this course. And I've noted it is Trinity's B lineup. Their A lineup is in the next heat of this event coming after this. But fantastic gum, you know, maturity on the part of Trinity to be in that far side lane and to now be looking to push up toward that lead that Purdue in that red hole in lane one, that's the near shore, has had since the very beginning. So to be kind of out in no man's land, is it's a catch-22. You want to be able to stay internal, but you also don't want to feel like you're so far out of the race because no matter what's going on inside your head, you're in the middle of something that is incredibly grueling, and you need to make sure that that doubt doesn't creep in. So being by it yourself, sometimes doubt can creep in, but it's obvious based on what's happening on the far side of the course that Trinity is not letting that happen. They want to take some back and see if they can't get up into the top two, if not top one on this race. That's right. And remember, it's the top three that will move on to the finals. And how cool would it be in that next heat if the Trinity boat, all, the Trinity A boat also got in there? We also would love to see the depth of that program. So yeah, as they come into the spectator area, let's get down to the shoreline, cheer these guys on. It's Purdue with the lead, followed by very closely UC Davis and Trinity B. And I know it's early, I know it's before 10 a.m., but I can hear music starting to play a little bit. If you're on the shore, even if they're down there, the the sound will echo across the course. So give them a cheer, give them a yell. I heard maybe a little bell or something down there. Let's get the pipes warmed up and give them a hand because this is not an easy sport, folks. If you have been in the boat, you know that. If you've never been in the boat, it looks graceful from afar, but there is nothing but a grueling intensity happening. All of the burning of the legs and the lungs is happening on the course right now. So give them that support. Show them that you care. I'm looking at what's happening on the course in terms of conditions, and I want to be back out there. <laughs> it's beautiful this morning. This is absolutely the best that it gets. It's just, you know, sunny San Diego. This is why we come here. And to watch these crews put it all out there just in the heats, I mean, these aren't even the finals. So look at Trinity in that far lane. Closest competitor is going to be all the way across in lane one. That coxswain has to be super savvy in order to inform her crew of what exactly is happening. And just as Lindsay said, the amount of intensity is not really palpable when you're watching from the shoreline. Those of you who have been on the water know exactly what I'm talking about. It is intense. And Clark B, they might be looking to see if they can scooch up into UC Davis there in lane two. It is only Pacific Lutheran. We have kind of what's called like a reverse chevron happening here, that V shape on the course. So in the two outside lanes, lanes five and lanes one, are Purdue and Trinity B looking like they're the ones that want to take it. But it still appears that a Purdue is, is ahead. But uh, Clark and UC Davis are the next two crews after that. And Pacific Lutheran after them, bringing it across into the closing bit of this race. So yes, as you see them come into here. I see a lot of hands going up to block that sun that's shining down here on the course and I hear a few yells give them more because they can absolutely hear you in this heat one that's of right. the women's Here's grace Prep memorial collegiate varsity eight there we go here's Purdue for that win they are followed by Trinity B and then will UC Davis hold on to that third spot? They're looking at a really good charge here from Clark B but I think that UC Davis is going to hold on to it Purdue for the win. Ah. 
Trinity B. And now here's UC Davis. <laughs> And there's Clark University, and then finally Pacific Lutheran. What an opportunity to race across divisions and types of programs here between Division Two, II, Three, and Club here. That's a rarity. You certainly wouldn't see it at your, your conference level or anything like that. So to be able to mix is a fantastic fun race to be in. Absolutely. This is one of my favorite events. It's near and dear to my heart as a former coach for a Division Two program. Um, I, it's, you know, just watching the caliber of athleticism between D2, D3, and club, it, again, it's so high that, you know, you really never know what you're going to get. Could be a club program that takes the whole thing, could be a D2 program. Just so hard to tell. So to see this cross-section of women's racing uh, coming from all across the country, uh, what a, a unique opportunity. And we are already off on the start of heat two of this same race that we just saw come down. This is the Grace Rett Memor Memorial Collegiate Varsity. This is division two, three, and club eights. In this, uh, in this heat two, we have in lane one, Trinity A. Lane two is Clark A. Lane three, UC Santa Barbara. Lane four, Colorado. And lane five, UC Santa Barbara B. So racing teammates here in the same race. Uh, that's, that's a fun one, being able to know how you might do in practice. Now when we're on the course, when it is metered by referees and an official race, let's see if maybe A and B can have a little duel here and see what happens. But again, the five crews in this race are Trinity, Clark, UC Santa Barbara, Colorado, and UC Santa Barbara B. So we've got the two D3, excuse me, the, the one D3 program in Trinity, um, also a very deep program. They have uh, some national championships under their belt from years past. But again, coming up against some really, really tough club programs in UC Santa Barbara and Colorado. Right now, it looks like Clark A has a very, very slight lead over Trinity just by about a deck. So Trinity with uh, the second place position currently and early on sitting a few seats above UC Santa Barbara A. They are followed by Colorado and then finally UC Santa Barbara B. I had a, some conversations with the Clark uh, women the other day and they were saying that actually a lot of their program really is walk-ons. And so that is just a great testament to this sport. Athletic, come to it, love it, put your all into it, and then you can get to race it at events like this and see uh, what all your hard work has really put in. That's right, and Clark coming from Worcester, Massachusetts. They are rowing on uh, Lake Quince, is it uh, Worcester? Or <laughs> I'm going to stop talking before I embarrass myself. But they're from Worcester, and <laughs> I know how to pronounce that. Before we embarrass ourselves that. further. Yeah, <laughs> Worcester. I know how to pronounce Worcester. Worcester uh, sauce. <laughs> <laughs> and so here is Clark now. We're coming up to the halfway point, and they are extending their lead now by about a length over Trinity A. So Clark looking very strong here as they pull forward into the last half of this race. UC Santa Barbara staying hot there in that third place position. Then finally, Colorado and UC Santa Barbara and B. It, and it does appear to be uh, UC Santa Barbara B that has just slipped back of the pack. The other four are relatively close to one another, but those leaders, it still is Clark A right now in lane two, kind of with two other crews flanking them, Trinity and UC Santa Barbara's A boats there. Um, but And they are starting to V back a little bit, but we have seen lead changes from our camera angles uh, as we shift down the course here through that third 500. A lot seems to be happening there because what we call early on crossing the thousand does seem to shift Either a crew takes a much bigger lead or they start to drop back and someone comes out of nowhere. They've been patient through the middle and they're able to maintain and sneak into those top few. Just as a reminder, this is Heat 2. So the top three here go to that first level final with the remainder to the second level final later this weekend. And I have Trinity clocked at 36 strokes a minute. Clark clocked at 35 strokes a minute. So the differences in stroke rates could be a little bit more run in the boat. If you have a lower stroke rate, you're just really letting the boat do the work for you, maybe a little bit more patience. Higher stroke rate could benefit a crew that might be a little bit longer and leaner. Um, but right now, these two crews, Clark and Trinity, just deadlocked as we're coming towards the final strokes here. So keep your eye on the course. Clark has held on to that lead, but Trinity doing a really nice job in this third 500, maybe coming up to challenge. Bit of more separation between the remaining three crews with UC Santa Barbara and Colorado. 
uh, about a length separating them. And then off the back a bit, you see Santa Barbara B. And getting into the last 500, you saw those tents on the beach there. There's still a lot of course left to be rode, even though yes, it is the last quarter of the race for these teams. But when you start to see a little challenge, when the when it is a close race like that, when you still have contact, Clark took about a half a length in a, the early portion of the second 500 of this race. And it looks like they maintained just about a half a length. But Trinity does seem to be surging here. That's their A lineup. Trinity's B raced in the previous heat. Trinity does seem to be looking to eat seat by seat. And so the question is, does Clark have an answer or to what Trinity is doing. Stay internal and push. That's right. It's going to come all the way down to the tape here as these crews shake it out for those top two spots. Again, top three move on. But what a great battle here between Trinity and Clark as we come down to the line. It's getting a little bit tighter, so keep your eye on that finish. It's just shy of the orange buoys, so remember that is your finish line. But it is very, very close between these two crews as we wind it up. And that's important to note is that the finish line is before those buoys. There is a marker on the far shore and Trinity did make a surge, but was it just a little bit too late? And does Clark, it does appear that Clark is able to maintain just the stern deck over them over the course of the race, uh, followed by UC Santa Barbara will round out the top three that will advance to the A-level final unofficially. That's right, unofficially. There's a little bit less than a second between Clark and Trinity at that finish, so really going to be an exciting final. Can't wait to see that. UC Santa Barbara rounding it out with a third place finish, followed by Colorado and then UC Santa Barbara B. So Clark did enough early on, took enough of a lead just to maintain over Trinity. So that will definitely, as you said, Adrian, make for a fun final as they rematch. It's my favorite race plan. Get ahead and stay ahead. <laughs> Sponsored by the James S. Copley family, the Copley Cup is considered one of the marquee races of the Crew Classic. This coveted prize recognizes the longtime support of the Copley family since the first Crew Classic in 1973. Since 1975, the Copley Cup has been presented to the winner of the Invitational Race for Top Men's Collegiate Varsity Crews. The San Diego Crew Classic is grateful for 50 years of support from the James S. Copley Family Fund. Sharp Healthcare congratulates the San Diego Crew Classic on five decades of rowing excellence and is proud to sponsor the Men's Collegiate 2V Sharp Memorial Hospital Cup. The affiliated physicians, nurses, and staff of Sharp Healthcare have provided quality health care to the San Diego community for more than 65 years. This tradition of service excellence and caring is further demonstrated by Sharp's support of the San Diego Crew Classic since 1982. Okay, and we are back up with a start for the next event, event number 35. This is the Women's Collegiate Varsity UCSD Health Cal Cup. This is heat, uh, heat one of one. So all these boats will move on to the grand final, but again, um, uh, vying for a good lane. So they'll, they'll be placed in um, preferable lanes as they move through the heats. In lane one, Stanford. Lane two, San Diego. Lane three, MIT. Lane four, Loyola Marymount. Lane five, UC San Diego. And lane six, MIT B. 
Uh, important to note, the San Diego crew, that's the University of San Diego. We also have UC San Diego, so we'll try to be clear in terms of differentiating these uh, cross-town rivals. Right, and early on, we have four boats that are very tightly packed between San Diego, Stanford, MIT, and UC San Diego with Loyola Marymount there in the mix and MIT. So still a lot of, of contact between these boats, but early on, the leader was out of lane five, UC San Diego. Uh, as we progress down the race course, Stanford in the far lane, lane one, looking to be their biggest competitor. But again, so much contact between these top five boats. MITB in lane six, just a little bit off the back, but again, still within contact. So UC San Diego and Stanford, those are the top two boats early on. But now as I'm saying that, UC uh, San Diego, University of San Diego, the Toreros moving in to the second or third place position, almost deadlocked between the two San Diego crews, UC, UC San Diego and University of San Diego. So we'll, again, we'll try to differentiate so that we know what's going on here. And for those of you keeping an eye on the, those bird's eye view shots from home, just bear in mind that when you look at the, the overhead shot, it's not necessarily straight across. Try and find a buoy line and draw that line across it so that you can track it. Sometimes it runs diagonally across the screen, which is the case quite often here. So kind of you know hone your eyesight, find that buoy line, and then uh, uh, see if you can identify who's out in the front. And right now, we did have Stanford that went up there, but now it seems to be San Diego that has uh, taken the lead here. So we've had a few lead changes, and it does seem that they have a decent amount, potentially a half a length here or more, uh, as San Diego moves into the closing quarters as they get into this be uh, get into the beach area here, or the middle portion of this race, I should say, uh, taking um, a decent amount of, of space over the rest of the field as they lengthened off of their start sequence into their base to create an efficient rhythm. So really, really hot start for UC San Diego, but they have slipped back to the fourth place position. San Diego, the Toreros with the lead just slightly over Stanford. So we'll watch as the crews push each other through this third 500, how much more separation there will be between these boats. So. San Diego holding on to the top spot by maybe about a length over Stanford. Back to them by open water. It's going to be MIT. So MIT coming all the way out from Boston. They've got two entries here, followed by UC San Diego in the fourth place position. And then Loyola Marymount in fifth, followed by MIT B. So now there's a good shakeout here as we get into what we, what do we call it before the gut check portion of this race, that third 500. You can see those tents in the background for that previous overhead shot. And so we're coming into the closing quarters here as they, as they round it up. You know, and in that middle portion, San Diego really did take the lead away from Stanford. Uh, and they are just still just sitting on that similar amount of space that they had. Will Stanford be able to ramp it up a little bit and take back some of that, the, the lead that San Diego took over them, took it away from them that they, as Stanford had it very early on in the race, will they be able to take it back here in this closing bit um, as they wind into the last few strokes of the race? In third place currently, MIT and two lanes over from them, UC San Diego, not San Diego. San Diego is currently in the lead. UC San Diego is currently in fourth place. That's right. The Toreros coming away with the win by about five seats over Stanford. They have pushed each other so hard that there's now a good amount of open water between themselves and MIT and UC San Diego. Really tight racing here, probably the tightest of the morning, actually. In, fourth, in fifth place, it will be Loyola Marymount. And then finally, MIT B. So all five of these boats, that was heat one. It is the only heat in this particular event, the Women's Collegiate Varsity UCSD Health Cal Cup. So all of those crews will see one another once again in the first level final, uh, in which case they will change lanes, potentially shuffle around a little bit, see if that matters really at the end of the day, get in the lane, see who gets from point A to point B the fastest, do the best you can with what you have on any given day, and then open your eyes at the other side and figure out what everyone else did.
and we have on the field a clean start here so far from what it looks to be a three boat race for the men's collegiate varsity copley cup here between in lane one setting the field that's from this shot the closest to the bridge there the closest to the inside shore is oxford brooks that's an international crew out of the uk lane two is cal california those are the men they are currently ranked number one this is the first time that they've been here since 2019 though and in lane three is rowing canada another obviously international uh, crew racing exhibition though and it is cal California, the cowmen here in the middle, taking an early lead off of the start, very quick, not quite half a boat length, maybe a quarter boat length, something like that, but the rates are still quite a bit higher, you know, at this point, uh, potentially having lengthened out to their base. You'll notice that over the years, some, some crews have started rowing with higher and higher stroke rates, sitting a little stronger, a little more stable in the body, not being so loopy out of the front end, allows you to be quicker to the water and stronger, which helps your rate come up. You know, where, where does rate come from? The legs. It comes from the legs, not the recovery. <laughs> there in the picture is still Cal looking pretty clean with the other two crews flanking. Now we have Oxford Brooks in the picture with those striped blades and red colored unisuits also staying quite clean as to be expected. Adrian, what can you tell me about Oxford Brooks? So Oxford Brooks, really just uh, an incredible program. They have a whole program at the university that's just for Olympic development, but these are their undergraduate students. As far as we know, this program, uh, they've beaten Oxford this year. Um, that Olympic pathway program breeds Olympians within the GB system. So, you know, what an honor to be able to fly all the way across the pond and come out and race against the one of the top crews in the nation is California, probably one of the best crews that California has ever had, last year's IRA champion. Um, and then to be able to come and race against uh, Rowing Canada, again, you know, Canada gearing up for World Cup uh, the, the first World Cup in May, so being able to come to San Diego, get a training trip in, race two of the top crews, um, not only in, you know, in northern uh, North America, but I, I'm going to say in the world. I mean, that California crew is stocked with international oarsmen, um, and just you can't say enough about, um, about the integrity of that program and where it's going. So this is the second race for California this year. They did uh, go out to the Las Vegas Invitational uh, with their top three varsity boats. Um, and then the remainder of the program went to race the California Challenge Cup down in Newport, coming away with almost clean sweeps at both of those events. And California did take that early lead, and it seems that they've extended maybe just a little bit more, kind of a similar margin uh, that they've had. If anything, they've taken just one maybe extra seat. It maintained it. They maintained a tight, tight race with Oxford Brooks all the way down the course. And so Oxford Brooks still has enough contact, and they do seem to be striking the water at a much higher rate. They are already sprinting at this point, certainly have the fitness to do so. And can they take more of that lead? California seems to have done the same thing, and it looks as though they have extended their lead even as Oxford Brooks is upping the rate to get into their sprint and ramp it up, see if they can overtake them. But California is not giving an inch. That's right. The base rate for California is clocked at 38 strokes a minute. Oxford Brooks right there with them at about the same rate. But here we go, as the ratings come up, who's gonna hold on to the technique and row cleanest as we come across the line? What This is might be the most challenge that California has seen in quite some time coming out of Oxford Brooks. And here's Canada just back by a bit of open water in that third place position. We'll see these crews race again in the next draw.
And we're underway in our next race of the morning. This is event number 30, or this is race number 37. The event is the Men's Collegiate Varsity Active and Fit and Now Cal Cup. This is heat one, the first of two heats here. And in lane one, uh, we have UC San Diego. In lane two, Purdue. Lane three, San Diego. Lane four, Loyola Marymount. Lane five, Southern California. And so as we are here in the first of two heats, the top four will go to your first level final and the remainder will go to the second level final. And what we see here is two club programs in Southern California and Purdue. Purdue, they were the ACRA national team champion last year. So as we saw with their women, super, super strong program, lots of depth and coming out to challenge some of the best crews varsity programs in the country. UC San Diego rowing along the shoreline there. They are followed by University of San Diego, the Toreros, and then Loyola Marymount. So we'll get a placement for you, let these crews kind of shake it out. But we see them almost in lane order in terms of placement right now. You see San Diego holding on to the lead just slightly over Purdue, followed by San Diego, and then moving out to lane five, Southern California in fourth, just slightly over Loyola Marymount. So we'll let it shake out a little bit and then we'll come back with the call. And a little bit of an update from the course. You see San Diego continuing to hold on to the lead, but the tightest right now, tightest uh, competition is going to come out of lane two and three, Purdue and University of San Diego. Those two boats right now look to be deadlocked, but UC San Diego, they've just taken off. I mean, they are leaving nothing on the table here in this heat, so they want to make sure that they exert their dominance now, maybe put down a really good time, see where they're at. Again, recalibrate at the end of this race, but right now this is all about execution for UC San Diego. Back to them by about two plus lengths of open water. There's that really tight race going on between San Diego and Purdue. So that is University of San Diego, the Toreros, looking to have about a three seat advantage over Purdue. Those two boots, uh, two boats pushing each other so hard that they have left behind uh, Loyola Marymount and Southern California. And getting into the last quarter here of the race, it is for San Diego that in that yellow hull uh, that has overtaken Purdue. They were neck and neck, and now as they, you know, the last 250 meters or so have unraveled, they've taken quite a sizable bit of, of lead away or uh, distance away from Purdue. Meanwhile, you see San Diego on lane one. I can see that they're there coming down to the closing quarters here. Is they've, they've put themselves well, well clear of the rest of the field with open water. It gives them a little bit of comfort there, but hopefully we'll continue to see energy just popping out of that as they come across the line. That's right, I've got UC San Diego clocked at 36 strokes a minute. San Diego, the Toreros, a little bit lower at 35. Of course, they're winding it up here, so the rate's gonna be a little bit more elevated, but great racing here between San Diego and Purdue as we come to the line. In the fourth place position, it will be uh, USC and then Loyola Marymount for the fifth place spot. But UC San Diego with that walk away win, University of San Diego now, and here's Purdue.
And there, that fourth that fourth horn that we heard was uh, Southern California there in lane five. So top four are advancing to your first level final. So those top four places there, you see San Diego, Purdue, San Diego, and Southern California will be the four crews unofficially that will advance to the final heat two upcoming here shortly with the next six crews and of the next uh, in the next heat four of those six crews will be the other four to round out the final one that will go along with again UC San Diego, Purdue, San Diego and Southern California unofficially. Interesting to, interesting to note here um, in these heats is that the top four move on to the final, which means that we're looking at an eight boat final. Yowza. and we are sitting up at the start for the uh, Heat 2, the Men's Collegiate Varsity Active and Fit Now Cal Cup. This is a six-boat race coming up in lane one, Gonzaga. Lane two, UCLA. Lane three, UC Santa Barbara. Lane four, UC Davis. Lane five, Colorado. And lane six, San Diego State. As Adrian just finished polling these crews, one of my favorite things about coming to these races and watching the crews develop, the fields develop over the years, is to see teams expand beyond the traditional areas of the country. That rowing is expanding throughout different portions of the country. So seeing Colorado here in numerous events is amazing. Seeing a crew from Hawaii here uh, is amazing. You know, finding crews that aren't just out of the Pacific Northwest or California or the or New England area, seeing them come from all over the place to come and compete here on this beautiful course here in Mission Bay. That's right. And Colorado, even though they're a club program, they do compete consistently at the Pac-12s. They are a Pac-12 program. So they are used to being pressure. They're used to being pushed. They have uh, quite a few years of experience under their belt with that program. But again, a club program, but within a very, very tough conference with the Pac-12. We're looking at UC Davis, um, also a club program, San Diego State as well, and UC Santa Barbara. The, t the, the varsity program here would be Gonzaga. They compete in the uh, WCC, so always a very, very strong program. And then UCLA, also a club program. All right, and the early call here is UCLA out in front. They have about a half a boat length lead over Gonzaga. Those two boats well out in front by open water. In the third place position, we are going to make the call between UC Davis and UC Santa Barbara. Really, really tight there between those two crews, but I'm going to give a slight advantage to Davis. And then in the fifth place spot, it will be Colorado followed by San Diego State.
So as we come in the picture past that tree there, the edge of the tree there, they block lanes one and lane two. So you want to keep an eye on those two inside crews. UCLA did seem to have an early lead, but it does appear to be Gonzaga here coming in with a sizable margin over second place currently UCLA, who in those two middle lanes next to them are UC Santa Barbara and UC Davis, who were relatively close, but it does appear to be Davis with just about a length potentially over them. But there is open water between first, second, and third place. Gonzaga going to come through this last quarter of the race with a comfortable margin. So as long as they stay clean and together, they uh, should be able to maintain a decent margin over the rest of the field. And those outside lanes, lanes five and six on the far side of the course, are going to be Colorado and San Diego State. And that's, you know, this this race plan that we just see, just saw unfold is something that's very typical. You'll see a team or a couple teams that come out, just jet out of the, the racing blocks at the start and hold a sizable lead until that halfway point usually is where that happens. So I think what happened is Gonzaga kind of very patient, just lurking right off of the stern deck of the UCLA boat. And then at that halfway point, that's when their race started. That's when they took off. So here they come into the final strokes here. Lane one, Gonzaga with the win. They are followed by UCLA. UCLA with a lot of water on either side of themselves. They've got UC Davis off of their stern deck by about a bit of open water. UC Davis with also open water over UC Santa Barbara. And then finally, Colorado and San Diego State. But here is Gonzaga. And again, as these crews cross the line, that is top four. There are two heats here. So top four, go to your first level final, such that we will have an eight-boat final in the Men's Collegiate Varsity Active and Fit Now Cal Cup later this weekend. And we are already underway in the next race here. We're back to fours, and this is the Women's Collegiate Varsity Four. Uh, Karen Plumley courtney Cup Heat One. This is the first of two heats, top four. In each of these two six-boat heats, we'll go to the first level final, remainder to final two. And so in lane one, poli polling near shore to far shore is going to be Texas. Lane two, USC. Lane three, Cal, California. Lane four, San Diego. Lane five, you see San Diego, and lane six, Santa Clara. So I would say that in the sport of women's rowing, one of the boats that has seen so much significant um, improvement in speed and competitiveness is the four. This is a boat that is raced at the national championship, so it matters. It's not just, you know, you are the four next fastest after the 2V, it's like these are these are some of the best athletes in the program. It is so hard to make the top boats at all of these programs that, you know, points. It comes down to points usually when we get to the national championship. So right here, these women on the course racing down the course to see who can get that best time. They're going to take a look at times, maybe, you know, make some changes throughout the season in terms of personnel. But this four is a crucial element of a Division I program. You know, and something else uh, interesting of note about fours is, A, the smaller the boat gets, the more technical dexterity you need to have to be able to stabilize the boat, make it go fast. Fitness, it's a longer race than the eight, so your fitness needs to be there. And also, you know, having coached division in one and two, uh, it's interesting to see that 
I've worked with athletes that prefer to row smaller boats. And so when they get into the smaller boats, sometimes whether they know it or not, they perform better simply because they actually like it better. So a lot of times internationally, they'll spend more time in small boats. And so that is just more of a home for them. There's just, every boat is something different. But like Adrian, like you mentioned early on in the season here, these athletes are potentially the next people out of the 2V or even the 1V later on in the season. A lot of shuffling can happen. It is still early. It's early April. It's April Fool's Day? It's April Fool's it Day. It is April Fool's Day. We're Just not going to play kidding. any pranks on anybody. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we might be wrong, but it's not a joke. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Pennsylvania, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> uh, right now, now looking at our drone shot, they are way overhead, but I am going to give an early call to both Texas and California. Looks like Texas maybe with a slight lead over California. Looking at those crews with the close-up shots, both of those crews looking so relaxed, so composed. Really, again, not a sense of huge sense of urgency. Again, this is about doing what you need to do, punching your ticket to the finals. You know, you said Texas and California. Both of those crews as a team overall are ranked in the top 10 in the women's CRCA NCAA polls. Uh, so to see them out in front among this group um, makes complete sense here. You know, one of the challenging things about being in these fours is these are bow loaded fours. And so you can't see everything that your crew is doing to be able to give someone a piece of technical feedback in the middle of the race the same way that you would if you're coxing an eight. I have never been a coxswain myself, but I can imagine there is a bit of a challenge compared to being in an eight in order to, you know, create some sort of technical difference that will, or recognize a technical difference to help your crew kind of what I like to call zip it up to bring themselves together. Rather than just asking for more, how can you help them be more technically proficient down the course then ask them for more in the four race which is not the one that you see currently oh yeah uh, in the fours race that you see currently on the on the screen it is still texas in that inside lane now with a decided lead over current second place california flanking in between them sandwiched between them is usc a decent amount of clear water back with uc san diego in fourth followed by you uh san diego currently in fifth and then Santa Clara on the far side rounding out the field of six and in typical fashion as we've seen Texas do this in other crew in other boats uh, over the last couple of years in particular is they just set a pace and carry on it oftentimes isn't the crew that picks up speed through the race that wins it it's this consistent rhythm all the way down the course just gradually extending can you be one inch faster per stroke and if you take a look out on the water and you're watching the bodies and kind of the emotion that you can see from the bodies is there is a sense of reserve and calm coming out of both of these top two boats the texas boat and the california boat maybe a little more sense of urgency uh, from california but texas again just doing the job that they're supposed to do to get into that final definitely making a statement here with quite a lead over california uh, USC occupying that third place position, but there is a huge spread here between boats and Texas taking a look at quite a fast time here in that four. Uh, we'll be taking a look between the two heats, maybe making some comparisons here, but California getting into that second place position and now here comes USC in third. We've got one more boat that's going to eke into the final. And it does look to be UC San Diego. University of San Diego, excuse me, in lane four, coming across the line to round out those top four for this heat in the women's four. For more than 40 years, JL Racing has been designing and manufacturing technical training and racing apparel for rowers. JL builds the highest quality technical garments in the industry with a dedicated design and development team that ensures your custom garments are just right. 
We make custom art for your team easy with free art and quick turn creative designs. At JL, we pride ourselves on our tailored sizing, building custom size options into our garments so you can get that perfect fit and the winning edge. Call us today to create your custom team kit or learn more at jlracing.com. All right, and here we are in heat two of the Women's Collegiate Varsity Four, the Karen Plumley Courtney Cup. In lane one, Stanford. Lane two, Washington. Lane three, Washington State. Lane four, Notre Dame. Lane five, Loyola Marymount. And lane six, MIT. Well, it seems that you have Adrian and I up here in the booth. Adrian and me. <laughs> now you, you know what's behind the curtain. <laughs> yeah, who's back here? The Wizard of Oz doing the talking. Thank you for listening to us this morning here at the 50th annual San Diego Crew Classic. We apologize. A couple of the cameras are down, so we're going to do the best we can from where we sit. Yeah, and we're waiting for an update from the course. Um, we have a very preliminary shot of what's happening out there on the water. Um, but we're not even going to make a guess because I don't think that's fair. But needless to say, this uh, six boat race, again, top four boats are going to move on to the final, creating an eight boat grand final, which is going to be insane with all of these crews and the relative speed. It's gonna be pretty tight as we move into uh, the grand final. And knowing that Stanford and Washington are both on the course right now with fours along with Washington State, Notre Dame, Lo Loyola, Marymount, and MIT, uh, we know that there's gonna be some, some solid racing happening here. And when these top four meet the top four from the previous race, which were Texas, California, USC, and San Diego, it's, it's gonna be a great eight boat final all the way across, it's just it's like gonna you be just hot. said. That's right, and th that's the type of racing that you wanna see. Um, in, in one of the, you know, your season opener, you want to see tight racing. You don't want to see blowout races. Those are never that much fun, you know. So to be tested, um, even sometimes to be in a situation where you're on the other side of, you know, where you want to be, that's the time to recalibrate and reassess 
the direction that you want that team to go. So as we move into a good angle here, we're taking a look at um, Washington and Stanford, most likely in those top two positions. I can see Washington right here, but we can't see Stanford yet um, as they come around the corner. But uh, previously, we had a really, really quick shot of the boats, and Stanford and Washington were those top two boats. Out in the center there, that is going to be, uh, that looks like Notre Dame actually um, doing quite well in that third place position mm -hmm. with a lead over Washington State. So here we are, we can take a little bit better understanding of where the boat placement is. Tight racing here between Stanford and Washington. It does look like Stanford has a slight edge over Washington, but Washington is not going to give them an inch, especially with this much course left to row. Whether it's 10, 20, 30, 40 strokes here, they're going to look to maintain contact or eat back into contact here. Again, in a four, you know, a similar amount of time for a boat length, but the amount of distance is not the same clearly as in an eight so can Washington get a few feet back stroke by stroke as they get ready to get into the go through the third 500 and get into the last 500 of the race here it is Stanford just with a little bit of clear water over Washington and in third two lanes over it is Notre Dame in third place right now Notre Dame coming out of the uh, Atlantic Coast Conference here, so being one of those kind of eastern side schools coming all this way to race this race, putting themselves in the hunt here with some of the probably potentially two of the best fours in the country right now. Absolutely, and, and Notre Dame, you know, I did take a look at the results from the Cardinal Invite. The four was one of their strongest boats, so they're they're showing that right now, being able to, to come toe-to-toe -to -toe with two of the best crews in the nation. So Stanford out in front, they've uh, trying to break clear of Washington, but Washington looks like they have a pretty strong final portion of their race. So they have come almost back into contact with Stanford. So we'll see as they wind up for their sprint phase exactly how close they can get. Um, not a whole lot of sense of urgency as they come into the final 500 because, again, it's that top four. They're very solidly in the top four, Stanford and Washington are. Notre Dame also with lots of water on either side. They're in that third place position with Washington State in fourth. They are followed by Loyola Marymount and MIT, respectively, in the fifth and sixth place position. But here we are. It's Stanford coming in to, for the win. In contact still, Washington in the second place spot. Stanford just attempting, just about to break open there, just to get the foul ball on Washington. But again, very, very close. Notre Dame bringing it in top three. And then Washington State in fourth. to be loyal and Marymount coming into the last 10, 15, 15-ish strokes of the race with MIT coming in after them. And we are back up at the start. Quick turnaround and racing. Not a whole lot of rest 
for us or the officials, so we've got racing all day here. It does not stop at the Crew Classic. And on the course right now is the Women's Collegiate 2V, the Jackie Ann Stitt Hunness Trophy. In lane one, Stanford. Lane two, California. Lane three, USC. Lane four, San Diego. And lane five, MIT. Top four boats will move on to the final and the remainder will move on to final number two. As you could just see in the in the picture there, we just had California. Uh, you could see the gumption. They want to uh, stay there right and hang with a Stanford, who seems to be a little bit calmer in the lane next to them on that inside lane, lane one. And so those two crews seem to be, uh, look. they are the two crews that are looking to uh, push into the lead, stay in the lead, um, and command this race from start to finish. But it is a, there's, there's some contact among all the crews on the field right now as we zoom in. That's right, we're still very early on, so there should be a lot of contact between boats. It doesn't look as if any boat has really broken free uh, with open water, but we'll wait to see uh, if we get a little better um, camera angle so that we can get a good spread between boats. But it looked like California and Stanford were out in front as your two leaders with uh, USC on, uh, on the chase. Slight advantage right now going to California for the lead. Stanford right there with them. So we'll see as we come down the course. Really tight here between California and Stanford. Right, and that third 500, that is where the truth is told. And that's where Stanford said, you know what? We're going to take this race and we're going to take off. So right now, Stanford, clearly your leader, they have broken free from California. So Stanford now with a couple seats of open water over California, those two boats just leaving everyone behind quite a bit of difference. It's like two different races here. Stanford and Cal out in front, back behind them. It will be USC. A uh, little bit of contact almost between USC and San Diego. That's University of San Diego, the Toreros. And then back to them by open water, it is MIT in the sixth place position. But you're looking at a couple of different races going on here. Stanford and Cal out front, USC and San Diego next to each other. And as we wind it up here coming into the closing stages, it is still Stanford out in front as they come into the last few strokes by the finish line and then followed by California. Clearly Stanford has broken to almost but not quite a full length of open water. So, you know, somewhere between three and six seconds over the second place crew, California. In which case both crews have walked to several lengths of open water on the next, the third place crew, uh, USC, Southern California. Staying together, sit, staying tidy as San Diego there in the blue is looking to charge. They want to take a couple of seats back if they can because the top four to cross the line here will go to that first level final, in which case some of these crews will see each other again later on this weekend. And rounding out the field of five is MIT in this heat one of the Women's Collegiate 2V, Jackie Anstit Hungness Trophy.
And we are off the start of heat two here of the Women's Collegiate 2 V uh, Jackie Ann Sit Hungness Trophy. In lane one, setting the field for you near shore to far side is in Texas in lane one. Washington in lane two. Lane three is Washington State. Lane four, Notre Dame. Lane five, Loyola Marymount. Lane six, UC San Diego. So an 11 boat event here. Eight will go to the first level final. Remainders will go to the second level final. You know, sometimes when crews come out here, they share equipment, borrow equipment from one another. So even if we zoom in, it isn't necessarily the crew who's blades. There we do see Texas in the field, and it is their trademark equipment. So that is definitely the University of Texas. But sometimes, just so you know, the, the equipment doesn't necessarily align with the crew itself. In the collegiate races, probably does. In the clubs, potentially not the case. So interesting to watch. As we have seen Texas race this morning, they have a little bit more of a patient start. So not necessarily feeling like they need to take it from the very, very beginning. Maybe let some of the other crews run out a little bit and, you know, just kind of patiently uh, tick away at their competition. So right now we're seeing good leads here coming out of lanes one and two, Texas and Washington. And we'll see how that shakes out as we progress down the course. So coming into the halfway mark, uh, it looks to be Washington with a lead, um, but with Texas right there off of their stern deck. You know, something of note talking about whether you have a quick start or not at this point in the season, I call that the special teams. The start and the sprint are your special teams. The hardest part to develop is going to be that middle portion of the race. So really, we say early, even though, you know, championship season is on the way relatively soon. But it, yes, again, is early in season. But expect those portions of the race to develop as champ season happens. You know, the sprint and the, the start and the sprint. Those we can see get better and better as we get into May, potentially um, even beyond if you're on the men's side. That's right. That's the fine-tuning portion mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. the race, right? The body of the piece, that's where the fitness is. That's where, you know, you've got to have that high level of fitness and then you've got to hold on to the technique to make that boat go fast. And these ladies make the boats go fast. I, sure I mean, do. you know, no doubt about it. You and I were both there watching the drama unfold <laughs> last year. Calling it year. stroke by stroke right on the, right on the wave attenuator. That's right. Car. And <laughs> just amazing athletic in yeah, all yeah. of these crews but cool thing about being this early on in the season being able to watch this high caliber of rowing is you know how that's going to change throughout the season so again we've talked about it before this is a chance for those coaches to stand on the shoreline they push their boats off and and it's up to them you know it's up to them to execute the race plan the best that they can you know I recently had a conversation with someone about the difference between race coaches and you know game coaches game coaches are involved from start to finish throughout race coaches you do what you can and then you shove your crew and you might not see them for an hour right that <laughs> accountability is all on the water <laughs> yeah yeah exactly and that's how important the coxswain is right so the, the coxswain really takes over they are the brains the eyes and ears of the boat and, you know, it is, it is something that we see the success of these programs, huge testament to the coxswain. And the maturity of the athletes. And the maturity right. of the athletes. You have the conversation with the coach after, and coach says, how did it go? Or tell me one thing that you can do better, right? And it's up to you to realize what that thing is. Recover a little bit and figure out what that thing is. But no doubt about it, these crews want to win, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I mean, no one wants to come out and just say, oh, we're going to do the best we can. Absolutely not. We want to win, right? Any of these programs on any day, that is what this is about. So you don't come all the way out to San Diego to just you know, show up and enjoy the sunshine. You want to make a statement, and you want to put your mark down. And as we see them, now we're coming into picture here in the closing, uh, definitely half of this race, getting close to the closing quarter of the race. All of the crews are still running across here in those inside lanes. Texas and Washington appear to be the ones that are out in front of the remaining four boats in the field of Washington State, Notre Dame, Loyola Marymount, and UC San Diego. As to be expected, Washington and Texas, those are definitely big names in the sport now. Uh, on the women's side, collegiately, they are the two that you see out in front of the rest of the field with clear water. But it looks like almost two boats, two boats, two boats here, where it's paired lane one, two, Texas and Washington, lane three and four, Washington State and Notre Dame are vying with one another and then Loyola Marymount and UC San Diego in lanes five and lane six are vying for one another so everyone here has a race going on what I love about the secondary races you know keep your eyes not just on 
you know, first and second place. Look at everybody across the field because lanes five and six through dueling can push themselves back into the duel that lane three and four are having. And there's still plenty of course left to be rode by those four crews. So uh, looking forward to see if those two trailing crews can eke back up into third and fourth. Because again, second heat, top four go to first level final. Yeah, and this is a little bit of a parade coming down the course at you. So take a look up front as Texas and Washington just pace off of each other. Washington looking to have a little bit of a jump here as they are eating away uh, from Texas's lead. Texas is going to, you know, they're holding on to it. But Washington doing a really good job being tenacious and not letting Texas walk away anymore. So actually taking a little bit of space back from Texas, but leaving everyone else behind. There's a lot of space in between Washington and that next crew. And a huge confidence boost at this point would be, can I get a seat? Can I get a half a seat? Not I need a half a length. Right. Okay. Do it digestible chunks at a time. Cox and stay aware of the bigger picture, but just give them something digestible in that moment right. as the last little bit comes out of, and it does, it looks like Washington is trying to take inch by inch, inch which is great inch. at that portion of the race. But we've only got 2000 meters. Uh -huh, so you got to uh -huh. get it done by the finish line. <laughs> Don't run out of room to go fast. A coach once said to me, it stuck for 20 years. <laughs> 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 Absolutely true. So coming into the spectator area, you can hear down at the shoreline. Let's hear those cheers as Texas wraps up their morning in fine fashion with another win. Washington still in contact to Texas as we come into the final strokes. And then back to them in third, it will be Washington State followed by Notre Dame. really tight here between Washington State and Notre Dame. It's been this way almost the whole time as we've come down the race course. And then back to them, it will be Loyola Marymount in fifth, followed by UC San Diego. Incredibly tight racing there by Washington State and Notre Dame, as Adrian already mentioned. Those are the races when you're going down the course and it's seat for seat the whole way that in your mind you're either totally blank as a, as a rower or you are thinking, okay, no one's rolling here. And that those are the mental, those are the psychological challenges. Every single stroke down the course, you are acutely aware of what is going on in the boat next to you because they are literally right there the whole time. You can hear them, you can feel them, you can see them if you can still see. So the four crews joining the four crews from the previous heat are going to be Texas, Washington, Washington State, and Notre Dame unofficially uh, for the remaining four spots in the first level final. We've set records in Wintec. We really felt the King was the most efficient, effective, and fastest shell out on the water for us. Wintec King is the perfect boat to rev. All hail the King! And we're off in the next event of the morning, the Men's Collegiate 2V, the Sharp Memorial Cup. This is your first of two heats. There are nine boats between these two heats. Top three will go to your first level final. The remainder will go to the second level final in lane one in the yellow hall, already making a statement here very early in the race. You see that bridge there, the first of two bridges. If you're local, that's the long bridge. Is California, they have already set themselves up for just about a length of open water as they cross that um, 500 meter marker here. Uh, Cal in lane one, lane two, UC San Diego A. Lane three is Purdue. 
Lane four is Colorado, and even in this early portion of the race, there you see it. We have clear water for California very early on here, and it is kind of a line straight back diagonally. Lane one, two, three, and four currently in the first quarter of the race. California with your early lead. You see San Diego in second behind them with Purdue, followed by Colorado currently. California with a quick start off of the line. They were able to take quite a bit of ground on the rest of the field very early on. Uh, knowing that they were the top contenders on the men's side collegiately last year. Again, this is their first time here since 2019, so a little bit of a break from the San Diego Crew Classic. So nice to see them back here competing on the beautiful water that we have here on Mission Bay this morning. Tiny little bit of puffs of wind that we see, but not much, just breaking the glare that was out there this morning very early for those early racers, but nothing of significance. Uh, something that is great about being on this race course, I raced yesterday myself, is that you get a little taste of lots of different water conditions all in the same row. And that's only going to help you as the season develops. Because as another coach said to me not too many years ago, it is an outdoor sport. So you need to be able to manage whatever conditions happen. Rarely is it nice weather when champ season starts to unroll. So being able to manage whatever the conditions happen to be, that's what you want to do. And right now, beautiful conditions that we have, everyone taking advantage of it. Still California out in the lead, still followed by UC San Diego's A entry, followed by Purdue, and then Colorado in fourth out in lane four. Great aerial view of California still extending their lead in that yellow hull. Uh, coming into the last quarter of the race. Will they wind it up? Will they practice their race plan knowing that they have another race left to race here in the Men's Collegiate 2 v Sharp Memorial Cup? This is, again, just your first heat, so there will be more racing for all of the boats that are on the water, whether they go to the first level final or the second level final. Being out in the lead, you know, it's always funny when you – you hear a commentator say they're rowing well. Well, I'm not going to say whether anyone's going to row well or not. It's, it's easier because the pressure is taken off, but at the same time, you're there because you didn't take off the pressure. You went for it right from the get-go. So they those guys are dialed in right now. Are they going to rev it up and have a sprint here as well? Because you only get to go to the line a certain number of times in the course of a season. So taking advantage of the situation they have here by being on a full buoyed course with multiple lanes across, that's a rarity in your season. So it's important every time you go that you lay down the best four quarters that you can so that you can continue to build throughout the season and create, put together better and better pieces until champ season arises. It looks as though California is coming across very calm, taking this from the very beginning. They set the early pace, got open to almost broken open water uh, very early on in the first probably 400 meters of the race. Followed by in second, you see San Diego maintaining their position from wire to wire. <coughs> Followed by Purdue. giving high fives from bow to stern there in the California boat as they turn to bring it to the dock. They'll probably have a little cool down maybe on land after they're done here.
Mission Bay is an iconic destination within San Diego, situated on 27 miles of sandy shoreline, offering 4,600 acres of aquatic adventure and a variety of lodging options at six different hotels and resorts. With diverse outdoor activities from boating and kayaking to paddleboarding and biking, Mission Bay offers endless family-friendly activities and access to the best San Diego experiences. Discover Mission Bay, a collection of esteemed resort properties and local attractions in the area, was created to elevate the destination by making positive contributions to the Mission Bay community through special events, promotions, and experiences for both locals and travelers. We are off in the second heat, the second heat of the Men's Collegiate 2V, the Sharp Memorial Cup. In lane one, as we are underway, is California. This is their 3V entry in lane one, and lane two is Gonzaga. Lane three is UCLA. Lane four, UC Davis. And lane five, UC San Diego's 3V as well. All five of these crews, of course, West Coast crews between here and the state of Washington with Gonzaga. Everyone else, state of California. From what we've just seen from California's 2V, it is not impossible that their 3V potentially would have a quick start as well. But we'll give it a few a little bit more time. Before we make that call, we'll allow the angle to widen out a little bit so that we have a better view of what's going on. And often what, uh, what Lindsay is saying is that oftentimes a program with such depth as California will race their lower boats, their 4V, their 5V, their... Uh, you know, 6V, I think that uh, I heard that Cal has, I think, six, seven boats of varsity oarsmen right now, but they'll race those boats against uh, the top boats of other programs. So again, huge amount of depth, huge amount of expertise. So California in lane one, uh, looking at a good challenge here out of Gonzaga uh, from lane two, but still pretty early on. So we'll come back with the race call as this race progresses. All right, so it looks like we're waiting for the, the camera shot, and um, you guys are looking at us as we entertain ourselves. Yeah. And here at this, again, this is the 50th anniversary of the Crew Classic, and in walking around just a few minutes ago talking to people, you know, it really doesn't get that much better than this. This is sunny San Diego, beautiful, perfect conditions, lots of people happy, getting some good racing in. Um, we need some cue cards out here, have some hot topics that we can talk about <laughs> on these in-betweens. <laughs> <laughs> we could have some guests if anyone wants to come down and uh, lobby for their Got program. all kinds of rowing stories that we could yep. throw out there yep. during this. We will be interviewing a couple of people as the weekend goes on. So, um, <clears throat> But it is all about the racing. It is all about what's happening on the race course. So on the in-between times, definitely take advantage of some of the vendor tents that we have over there. Yep. Take advantage, if you see a shirt someone's wearing, that we have people here with Freedom Rose, we have yep. people here with Stem to Stern. There are some great initiatives and programs and representatives of those programs here that are looking at how do we grow rowing? How do we, how do we get it to people? Because everyone that's here racing probably has that story of rowing changed my life by X, Y, and Z. Absolutely. So let's offer that opportunity to as many people as possible. So learn something this weekend that goes beyond what's happening on the race course in your own individual race That's if you right. have the opportunity. Spread the to message. Do so. And we're going to see that yes. this year with a lot of these different events that are coming up. But Boats right now, in screen race underway. Back to the <laughs> task at hand. <laughs> right now, let's turn our attention back yes. to the racing. So I uh, think that we're still 
If we look at these uh, five boats as they come down the course, California with the lead, they're followed by Gonzaga. We've got um, kind of a, a good pattern here going on. We've got in third place, UCLA, a very, very strong program. Um, actually gonna reverse that. Third place is not UCLA. It's gonna be pretty tight here between um, UC Davis and uh, Gonzaga for that second place position. So again, our angle is a little bit a uh, little bit different here in the six, in the fifth place spot. It will be UC San Diego's 3V, but again, California, their 3V well out in front, followed by Gonzaga, and then tight, tight between UC Davis and UCLA. Uh, sorry, that would be UC San Diego and UCLA. And Cal's 3V there racing in this 2V event does have clear water just as their 2V boat did have in the previous. And they also are coming across with what appears to be quite the gather and a little bit of calm as they have open water over second place crew currently Gonzaga coming in behind them. It's a tight race between UCLA and UC San Diego's 3V. UCLA is charging hard, but San Diego currently has the lead. So the question is, is, is it, I'm not going to call it officially because we have been rung. It is unofficial because the line is a little bit different across the finish line. But what a finish for UCLA. What a tight race. We've had s increasingly tighter races, whether you're in the top two or not. The tight races all the way across the line. To, as a reminder, this is a nine-boat event, so the top three go to your first level final. So that finish between UCLA and UC San Diego's 3V, that was an important charge by UCLA. So as you see it on the screen, though, very tight, two le uh, just about half a second or so separating those two, or just under a second or so ha separating those two, and it was San Diego that was able to hang on to the lead for that top three spot to put them in the first level final over UCLA. But a great charge by UCLA there at the end. They wanted to get in that top level final, but unofficially uh, were just edged out. All right, and as that final boat crosses the finish line in the men's collegiate 2V, we've already got a race on the course. Up next is the Women's Collegiate Novice Laurel Cor Laurel Corholtz Perpetual Trophy heat. Um, and again, this is just a heat, so all boats will move on to the final, but again, jockeying for position in uh, lane to get the, um, the favored lane, if there is a favored lane. I don't want to say that there is a favored lane, but that's what the heats are about. So in lane one, it is Washington. Lane two, UCLA. Lane three, British Columbia lane four, UC San Diego, and lane five, University of San Diego. So with novices, these are athletes with no experience. They've got just this year. Um, and so they are generally a lot of walk-on athletes. There might be some uh, athletes that have experience in high school, but this is their first year of racing. This race makes me file, smile, A, because it was the first race that I ever <laughs> raced like this, a big event like this, way back when I first started rowing and I was a novice when that amazing event existed, right? Uh, and Laurel Korholz, having been one of my coaches for a number of years. This definitely puts a smile on my face to watch. And this is where the age comes in because Laurel was one of my teammates. And <laughs> shared a boat, so, um, and she is from the San Diego area. She yes. um, is, you know, just a legend in the sport. So <laughs> really cool to see a trophy named after legend. her. I just yes. sat behind her and tried to keep up. So, mm. um, but let's turn our attention back to the racing. We have a crew here from British Columbia. UBC, a uh, strong Canadian collegiate program. Um, the system might be a little bit different in, in Canada, but really, really great to see them come down and race the top tier collegiate programs in the United States. But for the racing action, we're gonna look at a lead here coming from Washington, Washington rowing out of lane one.
you know, speaking of the novice, uh, novice race. Yes, there we go. So back to the racing here. We have <laughs> Washington out in the lead, a couple of lanes over in the red hull. And British Columbia in the second place position. So as this race shakes out a little bit, Washington can look down the race course and kind of see their comfortable lead um, continue to grow. And they are just past the, I would say just past the halfway point. Uh, British Columbia doing a really nice job there in that bright red hole. Again, I think that there is a lot of borrowed equipment out mm -hmm. there. So when mm -hmm. you're looking at the blades or looking at the boats, sometimes it is hard to tell. Um, those blades might not necessarily belong to the crew that is racing. Especially if they came from a, a great distance exactly. to be here. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. So a lot of borrowed equipment. Um, and, you know, that's, that's great to see that camaraderie that works between the crews. Yep. In third, it continues to be UCLA. Once we pan back a little bit, we'll be able to see uh, between UC San Diego and University of San Diego how those crews are faring compared to each other as crosstown rivals. The two San Diego schools both quite strong. And you can see Washington there still out in front. Nice and long, you can see the blades pretty together there. Great to see out of a novice crew like this. Early skill development happening. You know, again, early season to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. uh, and being novices, they will potentially, they stand the greatest chance of growing in terms of skill set between now and the end of the year. So, you know, again, will they improve their starts and sprints? I know when I raced here, I didn't even know what a sprint was at the time. So to be able to, in like, take care of the most important part of the race, the base, develop that skill, rely on that, and then kind of tweak a few things to get better and better at those higher rates, the quicker uh, the quicker stroke rates, the quicker pace of the boat itself. And the novices are really the building blocks of all of these programs. And again, I do want to mention that quite a few of these athletes are walk-ons, never having taken a stroke in their life, but coming from perhaps a really strong athletic background. That is something that's super unique to the sport of rowing, is that you can walk into any program across the United States never having taken a stroke and do a varsity sport it's really quite unique and and wonderful that it still exists you know and something that, uh, that maybe people have forgotten about but it's part of it is that uh, you know five of the men that won Olympic gold in 2004 learned how to row in college five of the women that won Olympic gold in 2008 learned how to row in college and so those are definitely it's not from a bygone era that's not that long ago that's it's just right. a matter of where is the space can we give the the opportunity to get in a boat that's right. And, you know, there is a lot to be said for those athletes that come into a program with no ability because they're fresh and they can really, you know, come into a program and learn the culture, learn exactly, you know, they, without the that culture. prior, ex they can be the culture and build that program. So um, Washington has always had a really, really um, strong dedication to those walk-on athletes um, and, and or, you know, those kids that are maybe with a limited amount of experience because they really prioritize athleticism. And right now, Washington walk away win for them along the shoreline. They have quite a bit of a strong lead um, over University of British Columbia. University of British Columbia, West Coast crew, but um, from a little bit higher north than Washington. Greater latitude. <laughs> and then with UCLA, UCLA a very strong uh, Pac-12 program and lots of water on either side of UCLA as they occupy that third place position over UC San Diego and San Diego. You know, this is the first time this morning where we've seen a little bit of a ripple on the water. Of course, nothing uh, to even have to contend with, but we've had just such glassy, perfect conditions. I don't know. Is this acceptable, Lindsay? Uh -huh. <laughs> we were discussing this a little bit uh, a few moments ago, but uh, yes, it is acceptable. I was <laughs> mentioning it is important. Novice crews, sometimes when it's dead flat calm, that's raw mm -hmm. speed. And then as it starts to get a little bumpier, it starts to maybe separate things out, expose the novice nature that's of the things. challenge. That's but right. And that's one of the beautiful things about being here is that you get a little bit of everything on the race course all at once. And that's, it, that's as right. you hear, I hear some bells. I hear some cheering. Don't wait till the last 10 strokes. Give this team, the University of Washington, they've been out in front the whole time. Give them a hand for their performance here. Uh, 
in the women's collegiate novice Laurel Corhol's per perpetual trophy. That's right. The pups crossing the line with that walk-away win, followed by University of British Columbia. UCLA just behind by about a bit of open water. And then finally, UC San Diego and University of San Diego in that fourth and fifth place position. And the, all of these crews out of this heat, it's a race for lanes. So they will have a first level final barring adjustment in the schedule over the course of the weekend. So to have two great races like this under your belt as a novice, fantastic experience on this April 1st. No joke. <laughs> no joke racing day. <laughs> All right, and a really quick turnaround time in races, just about seven minutes in between each race. Of course, these are pretty quick races, especially at this level. You can see them lined up here for the Men's Collegiate Novice Derek Gulker Memorial Cup. And it looks like we do have a start. We've got eight boats on the course, so this will be interesting to try and keep track of, but we'll do our best in lane one, California. Lane two, Orange Coast College. Lane three, UCLA. Lane four, Southern California. Lane five, UC Davis. Lane six, Loyola Marymount. Lane seven, UC Santa Barbara. And lane eight, Colorado. And right now, early on, that's exactly how you will find them. California with the early lead already by about a length. And then really tightly packed here between Orange Coast, UCLA, Southern California, and UC Davis. A Little bit back will be Loyola Marymount. UC Santa Barbara, and then Colorado. So again, eight boats on the course, really tightly packed, still very early on. So we'll come back with a race call as this shakes out. All right, so here we go. California already with substantial amount of open water between themselves and the rest of the field. Orange Coast College currently in that second place position. I love talking about Orange Coast, the Pirates, because they are a community college. It's a junior college. Mm -hmm. The only program that I'm aware of, someone please correct me, uh, the only junior college that hosts a varsity level rowing program. And really, you know, it's a, it, it is a program that continually sends athletes on to top tier division one programs. There's Olympians. I love Orange Coast. It is just so great that in two years, these men can, and women can progress um, so handily. 
And in similar fashion to their 2V and 3V, Cal's uh, young men here in the in the Men's Collegiate Novice Derek Gwelkum Memorial Cup, uh, shooting out to a commanding lead right from the start in lane one, uh, staying together and just extending the lead down the course. And it still seems to be a pretty stack from there with Orange Coast, UCLA, Southern California. And then on the outside, It appears that there's something something occurring in one of those farther outside lanes where we have a boat that veering off to the side uh, in the race, but still out in front by multiple lengths of open water is California, just continuing to extend their lead as they get ready to enter the last quarter of the race. That's the short bridge there that you see, the second bridge on the course that they've already passed. Orange Coast still sitting there in second place with now a sizable margin over the remainder of the field as well. Mm -hmm. Orange Coast looking really, really strong. They've got a lot of space between themselves and California, but then also ahead of the rest of the field. So between Orange Coast and UCLA, a good amount of, uh, of open water. We'll take a look back. See, see this as it comes down the race course. It really is kind of a parade of boats. Eight boats is a lot. And we've talked about this earlier. Rowing looks very calm, it looks very relaxed. You don't see the amount of intensity that is actually playing out on the water. You don't hear all of the, the voices coming from the coxswains. Sometimes, you know, you've got the, the cheering on the shoreline. The intensity is, is not easy to pick up unless you've been on the water and you know what it feels like. Even when you have a commanding lead like California does, the intensity is definitely palatable. <laughs> when, when you see they finally get into the picture, you know, there is nothing simple about it, even when they come across in clean, calm fashion. You can see, again, the similar to the boats, the crews that they've sent down the course earlier, coming down very calmly because there is, this is a race for lanes in this heat one that is set to go on to a first level final later on this weekend. Um, and if what you're seeing shows you anything, there is extreme depth in the California program on the men's side. That's right. That's almost like a light years ahead there for them. But, you know, that is that is the depth and the caliber of the program. But then right behind, here comes Orange Coast, really making a statement here in this novice boat. They are a top tier program, always with the freshman novice and uh, 2V events and competing really, really nicely today as they chase down California. and Southern California uh, taking that third place position. Um, the crew that we saw that possibly pulled off the course, I believe was UCLA, so causing a little bit of confusion. We won't talk too much about that since we don't have any information, but either uh, some sort of s something technical that happened in the boat and they um, chose to take themselves out of the fray. So in that fourth place spot, it is UC Davis. They are followed by UC Santa Barbara, and then finally Colorado. And we have a start here in the next race. It's going to be the Collegiate Men's Novice 8 B, the B lineups here. And there were there were three boats here set to start in lanes 1, 2, 3, and 4, but it appears we have two boats off the start. In lane 1, Orange Coast, it looks as though we are missing lane 2 of UCLA. And so in lane 3, we have UC Santa Barbara. So right now, the two crews that appear to have taken off cleanly are Orange Coast and UC Santa Barbara in the Men's Collegiate Novice 8 B.
All right, Lindsay, one of the things that's interesting to note with this novice race, this is a novice 8B, so clearly a lot of these oarsmen, this is their first year of competition. And again, this is a really high level, high pressure event if you put the pressure on yourself. So a great way to start the season to kind of gauge your speed. But what's happening right now, and this is the first time that we've seen this this morning with the college races, is that this has become a duel. And the mentality is a little bit different, right? When you're just facing one other crew, it kind of becomes sort of a time trial in some ways. Especially when you have a gap of a lane in between, yeah. um, as we saw at the start where there was supposed to be a boat there. You know, you, you do find yourself, even though as the rower, it is not your job to wonder what's going on. Where did they go? They don't let that be a distraction. Get in there. Do what you need to do. You know, the referees didn't put them next to one another. They just let it lie and let it go as it was. We don't have the information on what was going on in lane two. But that is not deterring Orange Coast, who you were alluded to earlier as being a solid junior uh, community college, so junior program, um, junior college program, if you aren't familiar with how that works, uh, producing strong crews and bringing in novices that can then step up to higher levels from here, which That's is... That's right. Moving up to, to some top tier programs in Division I, um, Division Three programs, again, producing um, Olympians. And then racing against a club program like UC Santa Barbara. I can't talk enough about um, the caliber of rowing out of UC Santa Barbara. They finally have a lot of water in their lake this year <laughs> after all of the rains that we've yeah. seen. So that's got to be a relief not to have to walk the boats down. There's your silver um, lining. Yeah, the silver lining is <laughs> it takes less than a half an hour to get the boats to the water. <laughs> Uh, but UC Santa Barbara, they've built up this club program that is, you know, national caliber. They've won several national medals, but they can come up and compete against Division One, Division Two programs. And, you know, we have to remember that they are a, a club program. We had mentioned earlier the passing, uh, Lindsay and I had been talking about the passing of Amy uh, Fuller Kearney. UC Santa Barbara is where she rode as, mm. Um, mm. as a collegiate athlete. So they have, you know, really quite a history. And that club program for both the men and the women now nationally competitive so you'll see them all over the map here in in San Diego at all the different um, all the different events this weekend you know I love learning the rowing history every time that I get to do this I always learn something and and every team out there every program out there has some sort of cool backstory you know and being aware of the history being uh, being aware of where you came from only helps you build for the future you know, not separating from one or the other, but use it all to make you better over time. But as Peter Mallory mentioned earlier, when he was in the booth with us, the family nature of rowing, the interconnected nature of it, you meet a rower, you're immediately connected by some underlying story there. That is, and that, that's the connection that we have on the personal level, right? I married a rower. <laughs> <laughs> as soon as we found out that we were rowers, it was like that done deal. But uh, uh, maybe there will be a romance story here at San and Diego you know, this weekend. So to go back to the race in this on the water, having Orange Coast out here with a commanding lead from the very early portions of this race, the thing is, you, like you said, it is a time trial. It's a time trial. And, you know, at the youth national level, the time trial is where things all start. You travel all the way there, and you have to go through a time trial to get even seated into the heats. So how do you self-motivate? How do you keep yourself going from point A to point B and put down the best race that you possibly can? It's different when there isn't a boat right next to you in that lane, but you still have to find a way to be completely internally motivated and maintain that to be able to build intrinsic motivation that's, that's right. the true challenge that's not right. the carrot yep the and inside and the pirates here as they come across the final strokes here looking really really sharp this is a novice b boat so you know again there's still a boat that's above them and they look great i mean they look like the building blocks of a really strong varsity program so here they are taking this race uh, this is i guess we'll be we'll move on to a final as well so we'll see these two boats contesting again um, for the collegiate novice 8B. And behind them, you see Santa Barbara also finishing. Very strong. We'll look out for them again. Uh, again, recalibrating. That's what the coaches do. The crew comes together. They decide, okay, what is it that we need to work on uh, between now and the next time we race? San Diego Tourism Marketing District is a tourism improvement district serving all areas within the city of San Diego. 
SDTMD uses fees collected from local hotels to support the marketing and promotional efforts of a variety of programs, services, and special events throughout America's finest city. SDTMD's support for tourism marketing allows San Diego to maintain its status as an aspirational first-tier visitor destination and is vital to the strength and success of the city's tourism economy. SDTMD is pleased to support the San Diego Crew Classic in 2023 for its 50th anniversary. And we're underway here in the next race. This is the Women's Collegiate Four, Cox 4B. This is Heat 1. All of these athletes will uh, go to the A final. So we're looking at a race for lanes here, as far as we can tell. In lane 1 on the near side shore, that's going to be Stanford. In lane 2 is USC. In lane 3, San Diego. And lane 4, Notre Dame. All right, so we're going to actually come and make a correction. It does look like there are just three boats on the on the water. It looks like USC is closest to the shoreline. They're in lane two, followed by uh, San Diego, University of San Diego, and then Notre Dame. So right now, it looks like San Diego has a really solid lead well out in front. This is University of, uh, excuse me, I am going to completely reverse that. That is Notre Dame right now that has that substantial lead by several lengths of open water. Behind them, it's going to be University of San Diego and then finally USC. And you mentioned earlier, Adrian, that, that Notre Dame had a solid showing in their fours at their previous races at the Cardinal Invite with Oak Ridge. Uh, against other crews, Notre Dame coming out of the ACC. So since this is the Collegiate 4B, then this is potentially their second four for their uh, team. So um, they're clearly showing some depth of that field uh, in these fours. That's right. And as you know, you know, Lindsay, a lot of these programs prioritize the pairs for training in the fall and then the winter, they use that for selection. So it is no surprise that these boats are being rowed so well by these programs. These smaller boats are harder to row. Um, they are, I would say, a little bit more technical. They're, um, they are, it's different and it's a much longer race. So the level of fitness and technical acuity is really, really important. And we're seeing Notre Dame right now doing a really nice job by taking this race. And again, traveling so far away from home, they wanna come out and say, you know what, let's make a statement. Let's put this program on the map. Yep, and you can see uh, Notre Dame has already passed that black flag the last 250 meters of the race. They're well into it. So give them a hand here as you can see them come into your line of sight. If you're on shore, you could see them a long time ago, and we told you that they had a commanding lead. They still do. So give them a little extra oomph as they get down to the finish here to see if we can get them to ramp it up, rev it up even a little bit more, get a little more speed out of it. All four of these, three of these, all of these crews are set to race each other once again, go to the first level final in this women's collegiate B4s. Behind them are still San Diego and USC, but it is Notre Dame start to finish by a commanding amount of clear water over the other two boats in this field. That's right, the fighting Irishmen coming down to take their final strokes and it will be them with their bow first across the line in this collegiate B4. <laughs>
and we are off in the next race, the Women's Open 8 Carly Copley Cup. This is the first of two heats, nine boat field. Uh, it'll be top three to advance to the first level final in each of these heats. In lane one is Texas. In lane two, California. In lane three is USC, Southern California. In lane four, Trinity. Lane five is UC San Diego. And as might be expected, California and Texas off to an early quick start. Um, Going to potentially expect those two to stay side by side as they make their way down the race course here in the first of two heats here in this Open 8 Carly Copley Cup. Mm -hmm. That's right. And we talked a little bit about who is this that's in the Open 8? Is this the 3B? Is this a combo of some freshmen, some novices? It's, it, you know, it's really hard to tell. It's hard to predict. But what I can say looking at the caliber of rowing is that these women are sharp. So this is going to be fast. You know, this is right now looking at uh, California, actually, with that slight advantage over Texas. So California with maybe about three seats over Texas, Texas in lane one. Still in contact, also USC. So USC looking at a third place position down to Texas by about six to seven seats early on. And right as Adrian was speaking, it was like Texas herder because it looked as though they put a little more zip on the pass momentarily to see if they could take back a few inches because they don't want to give anything up in the middle of the race. That's the bread and butter, you know. That's right. But we've also noticed that their race plan right now from what we can see is to start out a little bit more patiently, mm -hmm. maybe be a little bit more calm. And, you know, so just kind of tick away at the competition. They don't have to get it all done in the first thousand. The only thing that matters is what happens at the finish line. What happens for all the strokes over the course of the two. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go through the middle portion of this race. You can see Texas is inching up little by little on the lead that California had early on. Cal had a eh, quarter to half length tops at most. And you can see as they pass that next uh, next marker there, that black flag that you saw, um, almost even at this point. And now it might be that Texas has moved through and now they've flip-flopped leads here as we catch up in terms of our time delay uh, with those two crews. And it, it is, it looks as though they've completely flip-flopped and now uh, Texas has not in you know 10 stroke fashion but remarkably you know just not in this a massive you know 10 stroke fashion but over the course of the middle portion of this race been able to take inch by inch to be about a lead now looking to break open water on california you know and that's a strategy too that in some ways like just lurking there off the shoulder mm -hmm. of a crew is that is a strategy and then as you slowly tick away can you break the composure of a team can you you know kind of break them down a little bit i would say you know mentally because we know that all of these crews are super strong but you know to be honest the mental piece is super crucial as well you know i love love thinking back to this is where coxon's really coming to play because You know, Adrian, you were just talking about lurking off the shoulder of the other crew. Be, having the coxswain be able to tell you, this is all I need right now. That is an incredibly powerful thing to jump right in there when you're starting to have a moment of, you know, ready to be done. And the coxswain can get in there and say, okay, now we go. And as we cross the line, Texas, who started a little bit behind California, California had that early lead. They were able to take open water. So just over three seconds lead over second place California as they cross the line. Uh, and then here comes USC for the third place spot. Again, this is a challenge to race with water on either side of you, that much water, that much distance between uh, a boat that's in front of you or behind you. So really, this is an internal piece um, for some of these crews in a race that looks like this. Behind them, it will be Trinity, and then finally, UC San Diego.
right, here we are in heat two for the Women's Open 8 Carly Copley Cup. Just four boats on the course in lane one, Stanford. Lane two, Washington. Lane three, Washington State. And lane four, University of San Diego. All right, and just a quick update from the course. We've just got the four boats on the water, and you are going to find them in terms of placement in lane order. So Stanford with a lead. They are leading Washington by about a half a boat length. Washington with about a half a boat length over Washington State, and then a length or so back to University of San Diego. So um, in lane order, again, the collegiate coaches seed themselves coming into these races. So seeding here is playing out exactly the way it should. Since 1987, So Sporty has produced the highest quality, comfortable, and durable rowing apparel right up the road in Vista, California. So Sporty offers team uniforms, splash jackets, spirit wear, and much more. We are committed to ensuring quality products and orders that are delivered on time. Master Masters Rowing is your partner for all things Masters Rowing. If you race, come get a training program. If you like podcasts, Faster Masters Rowing Radio is live every Thursday at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Find out more at FasterMastersRowing.com. Faster Masters proudly sponsors the new Intermediate Masters 8s at the 50th Anniversary San Diego Crew Classic. And through the middle portion of this race, as we cross that second bridge coming into the last little bit, it is Stanford has consistently just um, moved away from the rest of the field, and we do still have that same stagger in lane order. Stanford very gradually lengthening uh, several, a few boat lengths of open water over Washington, who then has some open water over Washington State, who then has some open water over San Diego State. So again, another opportunity for some internal racing here, being able to practice that intrinsic motivation, that conversation inside your head. This is something I often bring up, we talk about looking at athletes for their mental toughness. Let's take that at practice. It's something we can use in life outside of the sport as a technically an endurance, technically an endurance sport. I would argue that really when we talk about mental toughness, talk to the endurance athletes because it's not over in 45 seconds. You have to sit in that hurt voluntarily and constantly have the conversation with yourself of, yes, I have more. Yes, I have more be quiet you be quiet you yes i have more and so that's mental toughness not just the moment of something not just the how fast can i go right now for this short period of time before my breath starts to my lungs start to hurt you have to constantly goad yourself on while feeling pretty awful <laughs> <laughs> and that is absolutely no joke um, it feels good to feel awful. It doesn't does. Always have it's to be weird. Fun to be it fun. actually is weird. The more often you keep in touch with the hard stuff, not leaving it behind. The more days you have between hard things, the harder the hard things become. When That's you stay in touch with it, there's something about it that just keeps you coming back. Either that or we just forget pain or we're 
<laughs> we're not very smart. <laughs> Forget pretty well. <laughs> no, but you know, in, in this sort of a race that we're looking at right now with Stanford so well in front, that coxswain does have to redefine what does this race mean for us today? Mm -hmm. We do have to be in the top three to move on to the grand final, but what is it that we want to accomplish? Is it a fast time? Is it a particular time? Is it a particular split? How do we want the boat to feel? It could be all of that. Are you hard, racing an imaginary teammate in another <laughs> boat? You know, <laughs> right? And, it, and it's proving the lineup, right? So they ha they have to earn their seats and you know defend their seats. Really, uh, Washington also here with the open eight coming across the line solidly in a qualifying position to move on to that grand final with Washington State separated by about two and a half lengths of open water. And then finally, University of San Diego, they will miss out on making the grand final, but they will ha also have another chance to race. This is what I love about doing commentary with uh, someone. You, you say something and then it makes you think of something. What you said about defending versus earning your seat. I like what you said first before you corrected yourself. Every day earning your seat. You're mm -hmm. never defending a seat because it's never yours. You are always earning it. That's that, correct. That just popped into my brain. Thank yep. you for making me think of that. <laughs> Take note. Awesome. <laughs> So the top three in this second heat of the Women's Open 8 Carly Copley Cup will meet the top three from the previous heat. In the final, all others will go to the second level final. If you want to stay active and fit these days, you need flexibility. We get it. Active and Fit Now is a new fitness program that gives you options. For one low price per month, you get access to thousands of fitness centers and studios nationwide, so you can easily find your perfect fit. With no long-term contracts, you can switch your gym or cancel anytime. And stay active at home with thousands of workout videos included in your membership. It's super easy to enroll online. Just get active and fit now by going to activeandfitnow.com. Get it? It's in the name.
on the field here we have eight boats across in this men's open eight Anderson Borthwick Memorial Trophy presented by San Diego Rowing Club. In lane one is California A. In lane two is California B. Lane three, California C. Lane four, Club Nautico de San Juan. Lane five, Dolphin. Lane six, Riverside. Lane seven is Dolphin, Friends of California. And in lane eight is UC Santa Barbara. Right now in picture, you see seven crews here on the field. But this, the water right now holds names that don't really stand up to who is actually on the water right now. There is a mixture of potentially current or future or retired Olympic or national team athletes out there from all over the world. Uh, when you come to races like this, you never know who's hopping in and what colors they're wearing or what blades they're using. But it certainly is a type of race that draws a wide array and high caliber of athlete. That's right, and it's important to note that uh, California has these three boats. These are most likely their 4v, 5v, 6v, but it could be, you know, in any of these boats, it could be anybody. An open race means literally anybody, a master's athlete, a retired, you know, Olympian, a, a current, you know, um, collegiate athlete. So there is a wide swath of athlete out here on the water. Um, and I do believe that we are looking at seven boats, not eight. Uh, UC Santa Barbara does not appear to have come up to the start line. But early on in the race, we did see California A, B, and C. Um, California A in the first place position, followed by California C, and then just slightly behind them, California B. But again, we have quite a bit of race course to go. In the fourth place position, it was Club Nautico de San Juan, followed by the Dolphin Club. Dolphin Club uh, training on Lake Merced in San Francisco, most likely filled with a good mix of Cal alums and um, friends. <laughs> and then in lane six, Riverside from Boston. Lane seven, a mix of Dolphin Club and Friends of California Crew. Friends of California Crew instrumental in keeping the California men's program alive, financially funded, and um, a top tier program in the country. As you can see, noted by their performance here on the water, you can see a, a few moments ago before the picture went down into stripes was the, uh, the trademark stripes of Riverside coming all the way here from Boston, as you just recently mentioned. Um, and so as this race unfolds through the middle portion here, will there be trades of lead? Will there be extensions of lead? Um, who's really going to pick it up and uh, show their medal here, show their worth here on this, on this beautiful Mission Bay this almost afternoon? To defeat the unpredictable threats that our nation faces, you must be able to adapt. U.S. Marines train tirelessly, both mentally and physically, to be able to overcome any scenario, be it land, air, sea, or an evolving digital landscape. In the battles for America's future, there is one constant, Marines who will win them. Do you have the mindset to protect our nation's future? Visit the U.S. Marines tent on Vendor Row or Marines.com to learn more. Just a moment ago, we saw that nice aerial shot collecting all the crews that are on the field, which it does appear to be seven instead of eight. Uh, California's A entry does appear to still be out in front with a sizable enough margin over the remainder of the field. But the B and C entries, C currently having a margin over the B entry here, looking to regain some of the distance that the A entry took right from the very beginning. And off toward the back of the pack in the middle of the course is going to be the club not to go to San Juan and Dolphin dropping back from the group from that lead trifecta of those three California crews. But those two crews in lanes four and lane five still maintaining a decent margin on one another, still maintaining enough to with enough race course left that that there could be another lead change. That's there. right. They're going to just let California duke it out up front. And again, you know, we're looking at um, could be the four, five, six B of that program. We've talked about it um, a couple times this morning, but huge amount amount of depth in that collegiate program. So those guys fighting it out, looks like the A team right now has, um, has the
the upper hand, but then the C boat coming in um, with about a length and maybe a little bit of open water over their brothers in the B boat. Well back behind them in the fourth place spot, it looked to be Dolphin, Dolphin Rowing Club, um, with a slight advantage over Club Nautico. And then behind them, Riverside, and then finally Dolphin Club and Friends of California Crew. And as we come down to the final few strokes, it's still the A lineup, California's A entry here in this Open 8 event. And the B lineup, even though they've been trailing behind the C the entire time, they're looking to take a few more inches, but C is still going to maintain that margin over the California B entry here. Just about a little over half length. with Riverside rounding out the top four. <laughs> Followed by Club Nautico to San Juan. like fallen in love with this FLX design. Everyone I put into the boat uh, kind of raves about it and I've just seen good jumps in speed. The FLX especially, it just feels great as it moves through the water. It's very responsive. It reacts to what you want it to do and runs out really nice in between the strokes. And taking off from the start is the next race on the course. This now, what appears to be now is afternoon, is the Men's Masters 8 Coronado Keys Realty Club Champ. Uh, this is the heat one of two here. Top four will go on to the first level final. We have a seven boat field with, we have seven boats having taken off, which is a fantastic thing to see of the seven boat field that we have listed in lane one is Cambridge. Lane two, Riverside A. Lane three, North Dakota. Lane four, Lake Union. Lane five, Bear Island Aquatic Center. Lane six, Crimson Death Barge. Lane seven, Wimble Bowl. And right now it looks to be lane four with an early n part of a boat, part of a deck ahead of the rest of the field. That's Lake Union there in lane four with a slight advantage, and I do mean slight, at this early portion of the race with basically a chevron coming from behind them, which means that they're kind of the lead, creating this kind of nice trickle down on both sides of them um, as far as the rest of the placement goes. 
so that middle of the race course for Lake Union, that's really an advantage to be right there where they've got their competition on either side. Um, sometimes rowing in lane one or lane six, seven, where you're in the lead, it's kind of hard to tell what's going on, but very clear right here with Lake Union. Uh, well in the front, they look to have about a six to seven seat advantage over Bayak. Uh, just off of their starboard side. And then North Dakota also coming in hot. They're very closely followed by Riverside A and then Cambridge. So a lot of overlap as we come down the race course. We'll come back and, and take a look at that thousand meter line. That seems to be where a lot of the placement really changes. Um, right now, it looks like Wimbleball in lane seven is in the sixth place position, followed, excuse me, Crimson Death Barge in that. Um, in the, sorry, nope, I was right. It was Wimble Ball in that seventh place, uh, sixth place position, and then Crimson Death Barge in seventh. Crimson Death Barge, I believe, is a Harvard alum composite boat. Um, they train remotely and then come together for events like this at San Diego. So if you hear some of the strange team names, it's most likely um, those old collegiate buddies that have managed to stay in contact with, that, with each other and come out and have a good time here at a race like the Crew Classic. And I like that you say they train virtually and then come together. It's, you know, with the nature of how things have changed with rowing clubs, being at the master's level, you know, finding your people, your buddies that you rode with or your friends that you rode with for a long period of time, and you still want to race together, you kind of create a virtual team. And you are teammates even though you're across the country or across the continent, um, to into a different country even from one another. But you come together and race these races because you love each other and you love to race, and you love to race fast. And uh, a lot of them are on the same training programs. A lot of them share a lot of similar sensibility around racing and training. And that just shows a high level of love for the sport throughout a lifetime. And as we've been talking about it, it looks to be lane two, Riverside A wants to get up in there and take the lead from our early leaders uh, of, of Bear Island, I believe, uh, sorry, of Lake Union from lane four. So it's still very close among lanes two, three, and four with lane five also sticking in there. So almost as though lane, um, uh, lane two with Riverside and lane four of Lake Union are kind of having a bit of a battle. Meanwhile, North Dakota and Bayak are having a bit of a battle. So lanes two and lanes four and lanes three and lanes five are those four lead crews uh, coming down into the final stretch of the race. But as you can see, with a lot of action out there on the water with seven boats, there's a lot to keep track of. It's a lot for the coxswains to keep track of as well because, you know, when you're in the front, you've got to make sure that you take a look behind. You apprise your crews of what is going on, who is close, who's coming up on you. You've got to be savvy. And so as we come into closer to the spectator area and come to that finish line, look at this pack coming across, four boats across, all still within contact with each other, but really tight here as we come to the line. With Riverside coming across in first. And it does look to be as though there were some lead changes that did occur. So right next to them, it's going to be North Dakota coming in right behind them as my eye can see, followed by Lake Union and Bayak. And then on the inside, uh, Cambridge and, uh, Cambridge and um, Wim uh, and Wimbleball, with Wimbleball taking uh, the lead ahead of Cambridge in the last little quarter, with Crimson Death Barge still on the course. So something important to note, too, as we watch these Masters races, remember there are handicaps involved, and I'm not even going to take a guess as to you know how that is calculated. There is a formula um, there, but just because they finish in a particular place doesn't necessarily mean that's where they end up in placement order. Um, so a raw time does not equal a handicap time. It all depends on the age. So again, the results that we are given um, right now on the screen are not necessarily the official results. The handicaps still have to be taken into account.
And we have an eight boat. This is the Heat 2 of the Men's Masters 8 Coronado Keys Realty Club champ, uh, champ 8. This is the second heat with eight boats off uh, from the start cleanly in lane one, San Diego Rowing Club A, lane two, Sammamish, lane three, Riverside B, lane four, Texas Center, lane five, Kent Mitchell, lane six, Lane six, Sacramento Aquatic Center. Lane seven is San Diego. And lane eight is San Diego Rowing Club B. Sharp Healthcare congratulates the San Diego Crew Classic on five decades of rowing excellence and is proud to sponsor the Men's Collegiate 2V Sharp Memorial Hospital Cup. The affiliated physicians, nurses, and staff of Sharp Healthcare have provided quality health care to the San Diego community for more than 65 years. This tradition of service excellence and caring is further demonstrated by Sharp's support of the San Diego Crew Classic since 1982. American Specialty Health has been a sponsor of the Crew Classic for 24 years thanks to its co-founder, chairman, and CEO, George DeVries, an alumni of the UCSD rowing team. The company's commitment to the Crew Classic is rooted in its objective to empower individuals to live healthier lives. You can learn more about American Specialty Health and its partner brand, Active and Fit Now, at activeandfitnow.com. All right, and then just a quick update from the race course. It does look like lane one, San Diego Rowing Club, and lane eight, San Diego Rowing Club B, are your top two boats. They are followed very, very closely by lane three, Riverside B. And then uh, quite a bit of overlap between the remaining crews. It's going to be, uh, that looks like Sammamish actually in lane two, that's in your fourth place spot, followed by Texas Rowing Center and Kent Mitchell. And then in the seventh and eighth place spot, it will be San Diego and uh, Sacramento. So Sacramento Aquatic Center in your final position. And those two boats between Texas Center and Kent Mitchell, because they are in lanes adjacent to one another, they are having a very tight race a down. Yeah, a battle all the way down the course, even though they're in places uh, five and six at this, uh, this point in the race. And even though these two San Diego crews are so far horizontally from one another because they are in complete outside lanes right. from one another, they are also having a very tight race. So that's a coxswain's race right there. You gotta make sure that your team, or that you stay aware of what's going on over there because it is very tight again with San Diego Rowing Club A and San Diego Rowing Club B in your top two spots with Riverside's B lineup there for those top three and then sitting in four kind of by themselves to a certain extent is Sammamish. They have clear water over that tight duel happening with Texas Center and Kent Mitchell. And just out of, pic uh, out of picture are gonna be uh, Sacramento Aquatic and San Diego. Mm -hmm. And slight advantage coming into these final strokes to Kent Mitchell, 
for that fourth place spot. So we'll keep an eye on them as they come down to the line. But it is your hometown crew, San Diego Rowing Club, taking that first and second spot. Although we do have to keep our eye on Riverside. Quite a sprint here for them. They might actually sneak into that second place position, and I think that they did. I'm reversing my call there, San Diego B taking the third place position. That was a significant charge in the last 500 that by Riverside. Absolutely it was. And that's why it it's not over till it's over. And Sammamish in fourth with a significance of talking about the top four coming across. You've got Kent Mitchell taking about a half a length over Texas Center, followed by what appears to be uh, San Diego and then uh, Sacramento Aquatic. The top four in this heat two of the Men's Masters eight, Coronado Keys Realty uh, Club Champ eight here. The top four will go on to the first level final to meet the top four from the previous heat. All others will go to final two. But with 15 boats on the course, either of those heats, uh, either of the finals are going to be phenomenal. And you did already mention the, the Masters the handicap, handicap as well. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, so anything that we say is unofficial until you see it. And uh, the, the lanes are drawn for the next race. That's right. So you're looking at raw times as they come across. But those raw times aren't necessarily what they will be uh, calculated at after the handicap gets put in. So. In 1996, the Chapman brothers, Ron and Rick, opened a brew pub in their hometown of Coronado. Today, Coronado Brewing Company stays true to its San Diego roots, brewing abundantly hoppy West Coast-style ales. Coronado won a bronze medal at the 2019 Great American Beer Festival for its Weekend Vibes IPA, a silver medal for its Salty Crew Blonde in 2020, and a gold medal for its Palm Sway IPA in 2021. Coronado Brewing Company, stay coastal. Right, and again, the racing never stops here on Mission Bay. We are already underway in the Women's Master 8, the Talia Kelly Considine Cup. In lane one, Wimble Ball from all the way across the pond, Somerset, England. In lane two, Sammamish C. In lane three, Bayak A. Lane four, San Diego Rowing Club. Lane five, Los Angeles Rowing Club. Lane six, Sacramento Aquatic Center. And lane seven, Sammamish B. So again, a lot of action on the course, but what is clear is that off out of the gates, it will be lane three, Bayak, that has the early lead. They're followed very closely by Sammamish C. And then also Wimble Ball in lane one and San Diego Rowing Club in lane four. The fifth, sixth, and seventh place position is very hotly contested here between Los Angeles, Sacramento Aquatic Center, and Sammamish B. And you see that the water is not quite as glassy as it was this morning. There's a little bit of a ripple there. Definitely nothing that these athletes can't contend with. In Masters rowing, we tend to see quite a wide range of athletes. Uh, Lindsay, you coach Masters athletes, so I know that you're intimately connected to, uh, quite to this level of racing. And one of my favorite things about coaching Masters athletes, I mean, it's a huge range. We see all the different levels, the AA, the A, the B, C, D all of the age ranges that come together in race and one of my favorite things is just the inspiration the vitality that is proven through what we're doing every single day i just i, I stand in awe of the people that i get to coach and sometimes get to race with if they let me <laughs> but as we speak you know through this first quarter of the race it is in lane three bear island aquatic that is taking a, almost to an open water lead here you can see those buoys it's almost a straight line across so they've just about broken clear of lane two so maybe just see entry Sammamish does have three entries in this event with their A entry in the next heat of this particular event. And behind them was Wimble Ball. So as we just saw, it was uh, Bayek in lane three, then Sammamish C in lane two, Wimble Ball in, la in lane one. Then all the way over on the other side out in lane seven on the far side of the course, Sammamish's B entry sitting in four and then kind of going down the Chevron, fifth, sixth, and seventh, San Diego Rowing Club, then Los Angeles, then Sacramento. Really cool part of this Masters 8 race, again, we talk about the handicap, but this is the club championship 
Um, so, you know, this does reflect a wide range of Masters athlete. Um, this is not necessarily age-based, so you have the different categories in Masters racing where there's the A category, a B category, a C category. This could encompass any number of those athletes. So um, in a lot of programs, my, having raced Masters myself, it usually was, it was your top eight athletes overall. Could be a 60-year-old uh, sitting in the five seat and a 27-year-old sitting in the stroke seat. So we're gonna see a lot of uh, range here in, in handicap. Um, and uh, technical uh, technical expertise. But right now, wow, that boat from Bayak just really t putting nothing uh, behind them. They're not keeping those cards very close to their chest because they are well out in front. You know, and that is, if you've never raced with a handicap before, that is one of those things. You have to get out there. It's, it's an intrinsic motivator. You have to get up and get out and go as fast as you possibly can, whether you're being pushed directly right in the next lane over or not because that is you have to overcome those margins. That's right. That's so true. So you know as a master's athlete, hey, we have a we have to overcome a 70-second handicap in one of the other lanes. So they know that, you know, yeah, in some ways this is sort of a time trial. All right, so Bayak well out in front as they come into the final strokes. We've got Sammamish B, uh, excuse me, Sammamish C continuing in that second place position. And then their teammates from Sammamish B in third. So those are your top three boats. In fourth, we're going to move all the way to the outside or the, in, uh, excuse me, lane one closest to shore. That is Wimbleball. And then San Diego Rowing Club in fifth, followed by Los Angeles and then Sacramento. And our next race, Heat 2 here, is underway off the start here. Uh, seven boat final here to round out the second half of this field in the Women's Masters 8 Club Champ, the Talia Kelly Considine Cup. This is, again, Heat 2. In lane 1, College Club Seattle. Lane 2, Texas Rowing Center. Lane 3, Sammamish A. Lane 4, Vancouver. Lane 5, Toronto Sculling. Lane 6, Portland. And in lane seven is Bear Island, Biax B entry. Top four go to the first level final with the remainder going to the level two final. So it will be a, an eight boat across a final for this event. And one of the things that's really cool to see with Masters Rowing is where these clubs are located. We've got quite a few Northwest crews with Sammamish, College Club Seattle, Vancouver, Toronto, obviously coming from Canada, and then Portland. But then we've also got the Bay Area crew with Bayak. That's the Bear Island Aquatic Center. Bear Island located um, in the near the port of Redwood City, right there near Stanford. And then, of course, Texas Rowing Center with a super, super strong crew coming out of Austin, Texas. One of their coaches there in, in the Coxon seat, I see, with Felicia Thrash. She's been with that program for a very long time, having been an athlete with them and now coaching with them as well. Definitely a fun to see her in the Coxon seat. Very cool. Great name.
Mission Bay is an iconic destination within San Diego, situated on 27 miles of sandy shoreline, offering 4,600 acres of aquatic adventure and a variety of lodging options at six different hotels and resorts. With diverse outdoor activities from boating and kayaking to paddleboarding and biking, Mission Bay offers endless family-friendly activities and access to the best San Diego experiences. Discover Mission Bay, a collection of esteemed resort properties and local attractions in the area, was created to elevate the destination by making positive contributions to the Mission Bay community through special events, promotions, and experiences for both locals and travelers. All right, a quick update from the course here on the last race of the morning session. This is the Women's Masters 8 Club Championship, the Talia Kelly Considine Cup. This is heat number two, and we will have uh, three boats that will, excuse me, top four boats will move on to the final, and again, all based on handicap. But in the first place position, it is going to be, te excuse me, it will be Toronto Sculling. All right, so Toronto Sculling indeed is in that lead position. They are followed by Texas Rowing Center. And then in third, it will be College Club Seattle, rowing out of lane one. In fourth, Vancouver Rowing. Vancouver with an open water lead over lane three. That's Sammamish A. In the sixth place position, it will be Bayak B. And then finally, Portland Boat Club. So a lot of action out there, but a good amount of separation. That what we can see here as we move into the final strokes, Toronto Sculling really kind of took off in that third 500 and have come into uh, quite a good lead here over the Texas Rowing Center. Texas Rowing having held on to that top spot for a good portion of the race, but really nice wind up here from Toronto as they continue to hold off Texas. And you can see Texas looking to ramp it up here and see if they can get back contact with our leaders at this point coming across the line in Toronto. And the rate higher, but no, they just got back a seat, ga got the bow ball up into maybe the coxswain of the stroke seat there with Texas Center. And in third coming across the line here, College Club. College Club coming across the line. And now here's Vancouver in the fourth place position. They are followed by fifth place. Here comes Sammamish A. And then by Ack B and finally Portland. Some of what we're seeing out on the course is we have these boats side by side for the early portions of the race. And then, you know, you have a little bit of protection. And so they stay side by side. And then potentially if there's a little bit of a challenge in the water, then you start to see the crew that can manage the conditions a little bit better. Right. Take advantage of that. So they're able to apply their technical uh, dexterity, which allows them to make better use of the fitness that they do have, which shows some of those lead changes and separations that we see through the middle portion of the race. And let's be clear, the conditions are still yes. really good. Absolutely, so absolutely, <laughs> for sure, for sure. We are enjoying this right now. And yeah. I know for a lot, it's definitely the Northwest crews, they, they're used to <laughs> yes. they're used to conditions. Yeah. So Absolutely. <laughs> All right, so Portland here coming up uh, with their final strokes to round out this Women's Masters 8 Club Champ. And then we'll take a bit of a break, give everyone a breather, grab a beer, grab some lunch. <laughs> talk to some friends and we'll come back for the afternoon racing session with Freedom Rose. And in that break, we'll have a couple of other demonstrations as well of some uh, non-traditional types of rowing. That's right. So stick around. We will have some really cool stuff coming up at 1.15. Mission Bay is an iconic destination within San Diego, situated on 27 miles of sandy shoreline, offering 4,600 acres of aquatic adventure and a variety of lodging options at six different hotels and resorts. 
with diverse outdoor activities from boating and kayaking to paddle boarding and biking. Mission Bay offers endless family-friendly activities and access to the best San Diego experiences. Discover Mission Bay, a collection of esteemed resort properties and local attractions in the area, was created to elevate the destination by making positive contributions to the Mission Bay community through special events, promotions, and experiences for both locals and travelers. The Mission Bay Yacht Club has a strong tradition of Corinthian sailboat racing. This is encouraged by club-sponsored regattas throughout the year. You'll find national champions and novices alike competing in our regattas. Mission Bay Yacht Club's ideal location makes it a favorite venue for national and world championship sailing regattas. The San Diego Crew Classic thanks the Mission Bay Yacht Club for their many years of support and volunteerism that helps the regatta thrive in our shared home on Mission Bay. For more than 40 years, JL Racing has been designing and manufacturing technical training and racing apparel for rowers. JL builds the highest quality technical garments in the industry with a dedicated design and development team that ensures your custom garments are just right. We make custom art for your team easy with free art and quick turn creative designs. At JL, we pride ourselves on our tailored sizing, building custom size options into our garments so you can get that perfect fit and the winning edge. Call us today to create your custom team kit or learn more at jlracing.com. Concept 2 brings more than 45 years of innovation to the sport of rowing. Their newest comp blade is a smaller size blade that feels lightweight, efficient, and stable. Unlock speed with the comp blade, available in both sweep and skull. Find out more at concept2.com slash comp. Concept 2 is the proud sponsor of the Women's Youth Quad Trophy at the 50th anniversary San Diego Crew Classic. I'm coming. Now I'm engrossed in this sandwich. Apparently I needed it. <laughs>
Campland is celebrating 46 years on Mission Bay. Campland has a full marina. and a complete range of boat and water sport rentals for use on Mission Bay. As in rowing, the time-honored values of teamwork and good sportsmanship are instilled in the young campers who participate in the sports, games, and activities offered year-round at the park. Camp Land on the Bay is proud to sponsor the Women's Masters F Trophy at the 50th Anniversary San Diego Crew Classic.
Testing one, two, three. There we go. And we told you that we have some fun things happening during our lunch break. We also talked earlier during the racing that we have a mix of people out on the water. You never know who you're going to see or you're going to run into. I am sitting here against, uh, against, but alongside <laughs> fellow Olympian. I think I can you hear me. Uh, yeah. Sitting alongside fellow Olympian Adam Creek, uh, best-selling author. I'll let you give the uh, title of your book there. The Responsibility Ethic. Thank you. Best-selling yes. author of The Responsibility Ethic, Transatlantic Rower and uh, Orboard Ambassador. So tell me a little bit Heck about yes. Orboard. What does that mean? Well, Orboard is all about fun. You know, Orboard is about uh, staying fit, staying active into the golden and best years of your life. It's about getting out there and being adventurous. You know, what I love about these boats, I've got three young kids. I throw them on these boats. We go camping. We go fishing. Uh, we uh, throw some crab traps off the side. We go playing uh. in the waves. We go messing about. You know, if you're all about going fast, don't go on these boats. <laughs> if you're all about messing around in boats, having a good time, having a good piece of equipment for your lake house, yeah. for your sailboat, for, you know, wherever you want to go on the beach and have some fun, these boats are great. And if, if you haven't seen an oar board in play, that's what you have. Come on down to the finish line. Take a look toward the finish line of the race course and you'll see several of them out there on the water right now. It's I love the concept of being an inflatable 
basically stand up board. It's it's convertible. You can pack it up. I know that I've seen that you can basically pack them and carry them onto an airplane. You know, mm -hmm. so you can wherever you like to go, wherever you want to row. This is a way to keep rowing. You can't put your single in the overhead compartment, let alone in the cargo hold. Yeah, so. no, ma'am. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I've taken this thing all over the place. You know, I've taken it down to Rio de Janeiro, mm -hmm. paddled around, cruel place to explore. Took it over to Hawaii, went rowing with the whales. Mm -hmm. If you can picture that, yeah. rowing with whales. Underneath you, so cool. Uh, uh, these boats are like they—they they are inflatable and collapsible, easy to store. Um, yeah, they're great boats. Am I seeing a double out there as well? So you have singles and doubles. Can you connect them? Yeah. Well, <laughs> we actually uh, had a, a junior crew out of Oklahoma, and they connected nine of these oar boards together. And it was during COVID, lots of social distancing. It was really fun to see the juniors going out there, tooling around. Uh, they're actually great for rowing clubs that want to expand their seats for rowing camps. Mm -hmm. uh, you can throw kids on there. They connect with the water. They connect with play. They connect with fun. Yeah. You know, often in high school rowing programs, you lose a lot of kids due to burnout. Mm. And I think it's because we don't have enough fun mm -hmm. as rowers. Mm -hmm. And this is a great way to, to bring fun back to the sport. We have fun. Oh, well, we do. <laughs> well, come on. High level, it's all about the fun. <laughs> well, <laughs> let me, let, let, I know that you and I talked about this a little bit before, but, you know, for people that are out there looking to grow clubs, it's always the, m the monetary value of the seat itself. And we had talked before where, and I've talked to other people that have gotten these for their clubs, that the cost per seat is quite a bit low relative to a bigger boat. And so it does allow you to put more butts in seats, more people on the water to kind of be that gateway to get people interested in our sport, which is so special. Yeah, rowing an oar board is the gateway drug to flat water racing. <laughs> <laughs> well, and with coastal rowing growing, oh, you know. True. So, yeah, yeah oh, it's so true. You know, and again, if we try to talk about cost per seat, uh, if you're to buy the rigger, it can go on any SUP. Mm -hmm. It can uh, uh, stand up paddle stand board. Up paddle board. That, yeah. We also sell the inflatable paddle boards themselves. Uh, the the rigger itself is less than two thousand bucks, and then we also uh, sell the boats. If you look at the yellow boat that's on the water or the red boat, uh, those are around three thousand bucks. If you look at the double that's set up. Uh, it's um, just around 5500 bucks, and the green boat is around 3400 bucks, and we've got the pink one, which is probably around 3000 bucks. So a range of equipment. Yeah, range of equipment, and if you think of it from a cost perspective with a club, you host a summer camp for a week for kids who have never rowed ever before, you throw them on one of these things, and instantly they can row. Yeah. They don't even have to have any training. You just shove them out, and you say, figure it out. Uh, they can tootle around. Uh, you have one of these boats. You charge the kids 500 bucks for the rowing camp. Yeah. You, know, you only need to host a rowing camp for uh, eight weeks, nine weeks. You've fully paid for the equipment. You've paid for the coaches. And you've got a ton of kids in, you know, in the programming. You've introduced a whole new swath of young humans to yeah. this amazing sport. Yeah. You know, I, I was about to ask the stability relative to, you know, your traditional racing single. Um, I mean, the, the people that are out on the water right now just uh, just look like they're having a good time, playing around with some boat skills, getting ready. What exactly are we getting ready to see here? Well, we're about to do a rowing race, and let me just see. I'm, uh, I'm adjusting the <laughs> headphones because I have one of those things where I'm hearing my voice five seconds later, and it's really distracting. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. You can't multitask. You don't want to yeah. hear yourself in surround sound. <laughs> give me all the words. Let oh. me give Lindsay a mic, and she'll just have it all day. <laughs> <laughs> it's like old-school satellite uh, telephone conversations. Yeah. It's hard for my brain to work through that. Yeah, so we're getting ready for an oarboard race. We're at 116, so racers on the water, if you can hear me, We've got four minutes to the oarboard start, four minutes to the start. Uh, what we're having is a bit of a mm, 
acrobatic rowboat race. Uh, the, our, the goal of this race is to uh, row down to the other end of the finish line, but before you get to the other end of the finish line, you have to cross over the buoys once. The rowers can choose when they cross over the buoy line. Once you get to the other side of uh, the start line buoys, you turn around and start heading back towards the beach. On your way back towards the beach, the, you have to then cross the buoy line one more time. Huh. And once you get to the beach, you have to row your oar board, beach it on the beach, run off and give Diana Legere, uh there she is wave, giving us a big wave, giving her a big high five. Say a high five yeah. yeah, big high five. And that's the nature of the race. We've got a, a number of amazing athletes here taking part of this. I'll give you a quick overview. Uh, we've got uh, David Miedge, and he's a cattle farmer. Yeah, every good rowing race needs a cattle farmer. Uh, he's been a rancher for 50 years, has an organic beef farmer from Salmon Arm, B.C., also a Pan Am Games uh, medalist, 1991, shook the hand of Fidel Castro. Uh, that's Davy Miedge. Uh, we've also got in the double uh, Ed Ives and his forever never wife, uh, Kelly Johnson, uh, two two. Love birds. They actually had their first kiss in a rowboat, <laughs> if you can believe that. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, Kelly Johnson, what a wonderful athlete. Uh, she went to Western Washington University, rose at Late Washington Rowing Club. She was the first woman in the 748. Uh, what an accomplishment. Uh, she's also big uh, in the sound rowers. Uh, Ed is an Olympic silver medalist, Pan Am Games gold medalist, cancer survivor. Glad you're still with us, Ed. Uh, that's the biggest battle of his life. An inline skater who also uh, rode his rollerblades from uh, the south of California all the way up to western Washington. Wow. Uh, we've got two minutes to start, everybody. Two minutes to start. We've got uh, Eamon Glavin, who's a YouTube star, for so those of you, you kids <laughs> who like YouTube and Instagram. Uh, I fell in love with Eamon when I saw his work of art, The Regatta of Death. If you haven't seen it, uh, it's about the, the Regatta Lucerne, Lucerne, the final last chance qualifier for the Olympics, The Regatta of Death. Absolutely incredible. This kid rode at Duke and Trinity College Dublin, a great content creator and one of the biggest rowing nerds you have ever met. So that's Eamon. We've also got Natalie Foster rounding it out in the pink boat. Uh, she's from Oakland Strokes, got to know her through Allison Ray, uh, who worked closely with my former coach, Mike Spracklin. Uh, she's a national junior champion at the Oakland Strokes, passing on you know, wisdom to the next generation, to juniors. And she's a sculling lover. Uh, sculling, she says, is the purest form of rowing, and she hates sweeping. <laughs> she finds it a barbaric <laughs> act. So for all you sweepers out there, you you're barbarians. <laughs> learn how to sweep, balance out that body. You know, that's why we learn how to skull, balance out that body, body for life. I heard uh, that slip of the tongue. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I like sweeping. I'm convincing so, myself that I'm not a sweeper. <laughs> so we've got one minute to start. One minute to start. I'm going to be doing the race call here. I'm going to be quiet and watch this. Yeah, you're going to watch. It's going to be a ton of fun. <laughs> One minute to start. <coughs> I'll start doing a, count, a countdown. I'll pull. I'll pull the boats. Let's get into alignment. Uh, we've got the double with Ed and Kelly. You're looking great, Kelly. Ed, you're looking not so, so great. So not to interrupt, just to be nope. clear, so they're basically doing a figure eight on the course here is what you're saying. They have yes. to go down, go to the other end, but they have to cross whenever they want to and then spin, come back, and then cross again. So they'll create kind of an eight. Down the, uh, down the finish line. Exactly. Okay, so we're doing a figure eight down the course, and uh, you're interrupting my polling. I'm sorry. That's I fine, but that. I appreciate that. Just wanted to clarify, <laughs> make sure I had it right. I'm yes, like clarifying. So we're doing figure eights here. down the course. <laughs> so rowers, get ready. So we've got uh, Kelly and Ed. I'm polling you. You're looking great, Kelly. Ed, you're okay. Uh, the <laughs> and then in <laughs> the yellow boat, we've got Gavin. There he's all slapping his legs. Yeah, whooping. Give him a cheer. Give Gavin, <laughs> give Eamon Clavin a big cheer, people. <laughs> and we've got sitting beside him, Natalie Foster. There she is, uh, looking great. She's going to skull. And we've got the cattle farmer. There he is, David Mejay, sitting in the green boat, ready to go. And we've got, uh, oh, and I forgot this guy, Igor Baraska in the red boat, Olympic bronze in the eight. Uh, you know, well, to talk more about him, you're looking great, Igor. I had a great row with him in Croatia many moons ago. So, so rowers, 
Are you ready? Attention. Row, row, row! Give her, give her, give her, give her, give her! So here we have Ed and Kelly got a quick start. How are they going to cross back over the buoys? <laughs> They're a little bit off course. And here we've got a little bit of a dance. Igor's looking to be the first guy to cross the buoy. Uh, Igor's looking great. Uh, what a great raw road for Brown University. Good friend with uh, uh, classic Olympian Zito Mueller. We see him on uh, social media. He's been out there for a long time. The original rowing influencer, if you want to call him that. Oh, we got another crossover. Nicole Foss. She's ready to be the barbarian, taking it to David Mige. Stay out of the way. Okay, we've got no Eamon crossing and forward. <laughs> and there we've got David on the other side. All rowers have crossed over except for the uh, uh, forever never married uh, Kelly and Ed, uh, lovers for life, partners in the boat and off the water. You know, what a love story. I love a good love story, don't you? Yeah, I know. Yeah. I would say that probably like here, if you had a bunch of singles doing this, you as a coach would be freaking out right now. But uh, with the oar board, it seems a intrepid nature of the athletes out on the water and they're perfectly comfortable in the equipment which is so much fun <laughs> well it is fun and this is the beauty because we have the rubber hulls they can bang into each other you have to worry less about the equipment it's really resilient we've played other games like row ball where the you get five oar boards on each side and then you try to hit the other per other team's buoy and you pass the ball back and forth we've got Igor Baraska in the lead he's ready for the crossover I don't know if there's anyone else who is going to challenge challenge him for uh, the first place prize. His last step is to ram onto the beach and run up and give Diana a high five. Uh, in the next, I, d uh, I think we've got Eamon Glavin. What do you see, Lindsay? I, I think that's what I see, except with a hood up. He can't see quite behind himself. However, it does look like Igor had the best plan. He knew exactly where his high five person was. <laughs> He's making a beeline for her to well, beach the boat and come right up and race toward her. Well, Igor is a, a lifetime right competitor. There. He's <laughs> been to three Olympics and the Summer Olympics, and he actually crossed over to the Winter Olympics, raced in the bobsled. What a guy. Uh, in his day job, he's a quality management systems consultant, also does insurance sales. And there he is, Igor Baraska <laughs> from Croatia, winning the robo race on the oar board. What a gentleman. Uh, then we've got Eamon Gavin to the beach first. Is he going to beat the dairy farmer? No, the cattle farmer. I think he is. There he is, sprinting up. <laughs> there we go. In second place, Eamon Ga Glavin. And then we've got uh, <coughs> Mr. Miedge. Uh, there we go. You want organic beef? Talk to that man. Look at his muscles. You can tell he eats beef. <laughs> and there we've got Miss Foster. Uh, what a champion. She's amazing. And even though they had the, t the false start, the false they start, had the yeah. head start. They took a lead. Oh. You know what? Love is grand, but and love can sometimes twice. slow they you down. Come back. They what? just let it go. They were like, we're, we're going now. We're just going to start this race without everyone else. <laughs> you know what I love about seeing this, too, is wrapping our heads around non-traditional uses of rowing and looking at mm. beach sprint. This is very similar to what a beach sprint would look like. It becomes so interesting. It takes this sport that we love and it gets creative with it because you are still trying to figure out how to move something through the water as efficiently as possible. Mm -hmm. And when you have a blast doing it, you're going to get so much more out of it. I know that, I mean, in my own Olympic career, that definitely helped having yes. a blast along the way yes. with everything you're doing. And I can hear through everything that you're saying that you're still enjoying <laughs> rowing in every way possible which well, is exactly what it's all about well we know this rowing is a love story you know there's so many people who have fallen in love with the sport of rowing either as racers as referees as umpires as volunteers as parents and the goal of a, of a piece of equipment like the oar board is to spread the love of rowing introduce more people to the sport uh, we sell hundreds of these every month all over the world most of the people that purchase these are not rowers actually yeah. they, you know we're building the base they are here now. yeah and so <coughs> but lots of rowers love purchasing these too. There's discounts at the booth. We've already sold two or three of these units. If you want to buy one, come talk to Harold, Diana, or myself. We'll give you an extra discount. We don't want to ship these home. We flew these here on the airplane, but uh, you know what? <coughs> I know the next race is a bunch of military personnel, and I and what I love about this is it's a really great, uh, the Freedom Rose USA, and what I love about Freedom Rose is it, it the values really align with what we're trying to accomplish here with Orboard. See, how do we make the sport more 
more inclusive? How do we make sure that more people can row? How do we uh, get more people fit, having fun, and being adventurous on the water? And we're going to have some more experts up here with us from Freedom Rose to tell us a little more about it as we go. Uh, so looking forward to what's up next as well. Yeah. Well. Thank you. Thank Adam. you, Miss Dare Shoop. <laughs> well, this was a lot of fun. Yeah. Hugs <laughs> behind the booth. <laughs> you hear the hear the mics clanking and. Sports, games, and activities offered. Camp Land is celebrating 46 years on Mission Bay. Camp Land has a full marina and a complete range of boat and water sport rentals for use on Mission Bay. As in rowing, the time-honored values of teamwork and good sportsmanship are instilled in the young campers who participate in the sports, games, and activities offered year-round at the park. Camp Land on the Bay is proud to sponsor the Women's Masters F Trophy at the 50th Anniversary San Diego Crew Classic. And we are back after our midday break here with the Freedom Rose Women's and Men's PR3 Mixed Inclusion Double here. And you'll see on the screen, uh, you said that we have eight doubles in this event. We only have five listed right now, but uh, one from Endeavor Racing and then the rest from Freedom Rose. I'm here with uh, Deb Ehrenberg, 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 <laughs> I apologize, Deb Ehrenberg, who can tell me a little bit more, who can tell all of us a little bit more about what Freedom Rose means. Well, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about the event. This is actually San Diego Crew Classic's first adaptive and Freedom Rose military race. Uh, in this race, we have in lane one, Endeavor. It is a women's double event. They're from Tempe, Arizona. And lanes two through five are represented by Unity Boat Club. This is a veterans minority owned rowing club and it's an inclusive men's double, which translates to having an injured veteran in one seat and a military veteran support partner in the other. The last three lanes 
are mixed doubles, and that translates to one male, one female. One of the rowers has some sort of disability. And those clubs are represented by uh, San Diego Rowing Club, another boat from Unity, and uh, Community Rowing of Boston. So we'll also have an eights event after this, but let me talk a little bit about Freedom Rose. Yeah. Uh, U.S. Rowing partners with the U.S. Veterans Administration, and we are given a very generous grant to run 33 programs throughout the United States, and the grant gives us funding for equipment, for supplies, for some coaching stipends, mm. and what's evidenced here at the San Diego Classic is we're given funds to uh, allow the veterans to come out to this wonderful event and come together, oftentimes in composite boats. Mm -hmm. They've never met each other, yeah. and all the services are uh, represented. We have veterans here from Army, Navy, Coast Guard, uh, Marines, and Air Force. We don't have uh, any reps from uh, Space Force, but we're pretty well represented. And they're here to uh, join together and yeah. have an awesome time. You know, I know that the Paralympic movement, movement was originally started with wounded war vets cutting, coming back, yes. kind of redeveloping skills, reintroducing it to society. Some of them are athletes before their military careers. I love a sport, first of all, you know, but I love the ability to use rowing um, to just kind of bring everybody together on the water. There's something special about being on the water. Absolutely. And What's really special about Freedom Rows is there's something, as we all know, about rowing. I mean, the benefits we all enjoy about rowing are benefits that anyone would, but there's something about that repetitive, mm. hypnotic motion of rowing that we found is really beneficial to mm. so mm -hmm. many of our vets who are experiencing PTSD. Yeah. And I just want to point out that all of our vets here today are wearing these really great camo hats with a red, white, and blue eagle logo. And if you see a vet, would you please thank them for their service when they go by? Yeah, it's I can really imagine important. that there are vets that aren't on the water that are here that this all resonates with. So I'm glad that you're here to explain a little bit about what this is as we continue to wait for the start of this race that was set to start at about uh, half past. So we'll give it a few more minutes and we'll yeah. get underway with eight boats across in all of these doubles from all <laughs> over the country. <laughs> you already mentioned that some of them, you know, may or may not have rowed together before, yep. um, but they're going to come together. And in the double is not an easy boat to row. A lot yep. of times uh, people look at it because, you know, it's, there's no sweeping, there's no sides, there's no coxswain out there. The double is something that can look like you're matched, but uh, to be able to come together and really, really row it well is, is a huge challenge. So Absolutely. to you, ah, and here off. we are. And we, we're off here in the start of the, of the women's and men's PR3 and mixed inclusion double here. Uh, again, eight lanes across on beautiful Mission Bay, yep. rarity to be able to have eight boats take off. W this is a first for us uh, and 100% veteran participation. So it's pretty exciting. Fantastic, I was gonna ask you what you're looking forward to most in this. So as we come through the first quarter of the race here, it appears that uh, out in lane three and then lane four and lane five are going to be the three lead crews, the two on the inside out of Endeavor in lane one and, and in lane two, a Freedom Rose entry of Mike Curtis and Samuel Meter are in fourth and fifth place as the field seems to create sort of a chevron as we come down the course. Yeah, lanes uh, three through five are Unity Boat Club out of Washington, D.C. and Raleigh, Durham, North Carolina. 
strong team. They've been together, uh, formerly known as Athletes Without Limits, and they're uh, directed by Patrick Johnson. And I know in those, I recognize a couple of names here with Maurice Scott uh, is in one of those Freedom Rose boats, you said out of Unity, um, and then Brooke Yimmer as well. He's associated with uh, STEM to Stern programs. Yes, yeah. So. What's interesting about that Unity program is they're really strong in mentoring their youth uh, rowers. Uh, Brooke Yimmer was a high school rower and then came back and entered their mentor program and now he's back as a coach and now he's evolved into the STEM to STEM program and is helping U.S. rowing with this education program nationwide. Mm -hmm. In the picture there is the double from Arizona out of Tempe, Arizona from Endeavor Racing Alliance. Uh, Aaron Jewell and Pam Newharth uh, racing this boat together as a composite. Those two uh, have the opportunity to row together every now and again out on Tempe Town Lake. Is uh, Paul Hurley and his rowing partner. Uh, they are from Unity. Uh, Paul is a former national para team rower. He won the bronze in the 2013 Paralympics. So, you know, something of interesting note here is nationally, we don't have that many opportunities for inclusion events on the water of any scale, whether it's a single or a double, um, whether it's mixed, whether it's male, female, PR one, two, and three. So to be able to race against people from across the country at a big, large scale event isn't something that happens as regularly as non-inclusion events. So if you're a coach out there, you know, who has athletes that could be race in, in inclusion events or be in interested in getting involved in it, reach out to the U.S. Rowing Para, look up the Para Rowing uh, contacts and figure out how we can get more people on the water. Uh, you, we were just saying, Deb, that how many races nationally do you think maybe are out there right now, at least of this scale? Um, not at this scale, I would say. Uh, Bayada is a really large regatta in Philadelphia. It's 100% uh, participation by athletes with disabilities. Uh, but we'd certainly like to see more uh, coaches may even have athletes right now with a minimal eligible impairment that could classify. And we'd love to see you out there with some of these large international regattas coming up. We're always looking for para rowers. Go to the U.S. Rowing website and just type in para rowing and we'll set you in the right direction. Yeah, especially it's important to have experience going to the race line before showing up at trials or trying to go and race internationally. Having more races like the Crew Classic here, having adding these classifications, it only opens up the field and strengthens the field, not only nationally, but internationally. And para rowing is a relatively young sport. Mm -hmm. So for athletes to uh, get into the sport, you can fast track, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. unlike uh, the senior team where mm -hmm. it, there's a lot of evaluation and tryouts if you have a
and give them a hand as you see them come into the closing quarter. The closing 15 or 20 strokes of the race is going to be in lane three. That's Maurice Scott and his partner. Give Unity Boat Club a big hand, please. Nice job. Coming across the first in this eight boat field. So that's them. Yep. Coming up in lane four is another boat from Unity Boat Club. It's Ken Edwards and Josh Martini from Unity. Nice job, guys. Coming the last couple of strokes as they cross the line here in second place from Unity Boat Club. And in third, it looks to be uh, Brooke Yimmer in the bow there. Brooke Immer and Jeff Bolt. Also from Unity, correct? Yes. yes. Out of the D.C. area. That's a recently formed club. Uh, great to see them here uh, on the field here. In lane two, Mike Curtis and Sam Medor from Unity Boat Club. And we have the women's double coming up in lane one from Tempe, Arizona, Endeavor Boat Club. That's Aaron Jewell and Pam Newharth out of Tempe, Arizona, rowing on Tempe Town Lake. Last couple of strokes crossing the line here. Over in lane eight on the far side, Paul Hurley and Lexi Hegman. Again, representing Unity Boat Club. Nice job, San Diego, in lane seven. That's John and more Dahl. Concept 2 brings more than 45 years of innovation to the sport of rowing. Their newest comp blade is a smaller size blade that feels lightweight, efficient, and stable. Unlock speed with the comp blade, available in both sweep and skull. Find out more at concept2.com slash comp. Concept 2 is the proud sponsor of the Women's Youth Quad Trophy at the 50th anniversary San Diego Crew Classic. Sponsored by the James S. Copley family, the Copley Cup is considered one of the marquee races of the Crew Classic. This coveted prize recognizes the longtime support of the Copley family since the first Crew Classic in 1973. Since 1975, the Copley Cup has been presented to the winner of the Invitational Race for Top Men's Collegiate Varsity Crews. The San Diego Crew Classic is grateful for 50 years of support from the James S. Copley Family Fund. Just crossing the line is Paul Hurley and his rowing partner, Lexi, from Unity Boat Club. And coming into the finish is a club from San Diego, Community Rowing. Give them a hand as they round out this field of eight in the women's and men's PR3 and mixed inclusion double. This is a final. It was an eight boat race with a mix of athletes from all over the country between Unity Boat Club, some from Community Rowing San Diego, some from Tempe, Arizona, and several crews with, uh, as we mentioned, uh, Unity Boat Club carrying three, four crews out of the D.C. area? Five, uh, five from Unity. Five, okay. Yeah. This is the first year... Uh, uh, San Diego has uh, entered in this race, and we're just really glad to have him here. And next up, we are already underway in the second event, in the second uh, uh, para event that we have here, and it's the men's and women's and mixed. 
uh, Para 8, and it's also a final. We have two boats in this race represented by Freedom Rose. They're going to be in lanes 1 and lane 2, and that's what you see out on the course right now. And it does appear that the Freedom Rose 8 in lane 2 has taken a sizable lead over the uh, crew in lane 1. What can you tell us about what's on the water right now? Lane 1 are the Oklahoma Warriors. This is a returning uh, team, a uh, composite team. And in lane two, we have a composite boat consisting of Detroit Rowing Club, Boston Rowing, uh, Community Rowing, and Atlanta Rowing Club. And if you can imagine, these folks just met uh, yesterday, went out for one practice row, and they're out today uh, finding a way to uh, get together as one and get down this course. And enjoy the sport. They're here in San Diego on a great course. You know, this is this might be some of their first experience racing on a course of this scale. Uh, you already mentioned rowing with some of the their teammates now in these boats. So hopefully they'll have more opportunities to come to races like this, represent Freedom Rose, represent themselves, and learn something every time that they do. Absolutely. There's a gentleman sitting uh, two seat who uh, has only been on the water three times, ah. and his stroke has been rowing for 15 years and is very experienced. So we have quite. Uh, quite a wide variety of uh, capabilities and abilities out there, but they're all having a great time. That's, again, another thing that I love about this sport is the ability to share skill. You know, hopping in a boat with people you might have 15 years or 15 days, three days, as you <laughs> said. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but being able to, to get in the boat together and help each other come along because you care about the sport, you care about growing Absolutely. as a human being through this sport. Absolutely. The, it, the military is one thing. They are a family. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I heard you talking earlier that rowers mm -hmm. uh, were all here as family, and I think that you certainly get a strong sense of that with a military family. And it's, it's awesome for me to watch uh, these people come from 33 different programs across the United States and literally in, in 24 hours uh, transform themselves into a, a unit that mm -hmm. can make it down the course. I had a question out of curiosity. You may or may not know the answer to this. Do some of these athletes come off of being introduced to rowing through the indoor rowing machine, perhaps, and then come to it? Yeah, absolutely. When we um, start a Freedom Rows program, uh, typically we'll start on ergs to get that mm -hmm. base fitness, get that range of motion, flexibility, workout kinks. If there's a uh, an athlete who has uh, some impairments that require additional equipment, we'll modify the equipment, mm -hmm. we'll modify coaching methods, whatever we can do to uh, make sure the athlete is safe and happy and comfortable. After they've erged a while, uh, we'll oftentimes start in these recreational doubles, the doubles that just came down are a little bit wider, mm -hmm. more stable, oftentimes we'll use pontoons with them. And then eventually they'll graduate into sweep rowing. And in many cases, we now have uh, folks racing in sing racing singles and doubles also. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, so, so expanding uh, the subscription here will expand the events that are available too, which will just continue to ma allow people to grow their personal skills. Because we yes. al always talk about how the single helps the eight and how the eight, how every different boat class has a specific unique component that helps you develop your own skill set. The eight's a lot quicker, quad is quick, but then the single is so tippy, it tests your technique. <laughs> so you can really benefit by being able to race all of those things. That's also one of the beautiful things about Masters Rowing is having recently started to coach more and more Masters is how many, you know, you go to a race and athletes, oh, I row starboard. Whereas a lot of Masters right. will say, just put me where you need me because I can do it all, which is really special. Up oh, here comes uh, in the red. This is uh, Oklahoma coming down to the finish line. Oklahoma Warriors looking really strong. Has Oklahoma developed its program? Uh, they're pretty well established, okay. um, and they participate in their night sprints in Oklahoma City mm -hmm. and the head of the Oklahoma. And uh, Jess, who's uh, coxing that boat right there, is a pretty well-known uh, corporate coxswain through the program yeah. in Oklahoma. So they're pretty well experienced. I was That's what made me think of it was everything that's developed in Oklahoma yes. in the last you know decade or so, if they've yeah. really put some um, access out yes. there you know, yeah. for, for this specific uh, event. And our composite crew, you said, was from Detroit and Boston and Atlanta. What proportions of that boat? Is it, is it about even? Uh, I, there's one representative from uh, Community Rowing in Boston. Uh, we have four rowers from Detroit. And uh, 
Several of them have already raced today, and some will be racing tomorrow in other <laughs> master's boats. And then Atlanta Rowing has uh, four rowers, and they, have a, they also have a fantastic program in, rega in uh, Atlanta. All right on. And here they come, coming down to the last 15 or so strokes here in their composite boat in lane one to round out the two-boat event this final in the men's and women's mixed PR8. Oh, is this the Atlanta boat? Just a correction, the boat that just completed that course was the boat from Oklahoma City, Oklahoma Warriors, and the first boat was our composite boat. Good job, everyone. In 1996, the Chapman brothers, Ron and Rick, opened a brew pub in their hometown of Coronado. Today, Coronado Brewing Company stays true to its San Diego roots, brewing abundantly hoppy West Coast-style ales. Coronado won a bronze medal at the 2019 Great American Beer Festival for its Weekend Vibes IPA, a silver medal for its Salty Crew Blonde in 2020, and a gold medal for its Palm Sway IPA in 2021. Coronado Brewing Company, stay coastal. Mission Bay is an iconic destination within San Diego, situated on 27 miles of sandy shoreline, offering 4,600 acres of aquatic adventure and a variety of lodging options at six different hotels and resorts. With diverse outdoor activities from boating and kayaking to paddleboarding and biking, Mission Bay offers endless family-friendly activities and access to the best San Diego experiences. Discover Mission Bay, a collection of esteemed resort properties and local attractions in the area, was created to elevate the destination by making positive contributions to the Mission Bay community through special events, promotions, and experiences for both locals and travelers. Faster Masters Rowing is your partner for all things Masters Rowing. If you race, come get a training program. If you like podcasts, Faster Masters Rowing Radio is live every Thursday at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Find out more at FasterMastersRowing.com. Faster Masters proudly sponsors the new Intermediate Masters 8s at the 50th Anniversary San Diego Crew Classic. For more than 40 years, JL Racing has been designing and manufacturing technical training and racing apparel for rowers. JL builds the highest quality technical garments in the industry with a dedicated design and development team that ensures your custom garments are just right. We make custom art for your team easy with free art and quick turn creative designs. At JL, we pride ourselves on our tailored sizing, building custom size options into our garments so you can get that perfect fit and the winning edge. Call us today to create your custom team kit or learn more at jlracing.com. We are underway with the next race of the day after our break here, after our Freedom Rose races. What a fantastic thing to learn about Freedom Rose here on the water. Watch what's happening, unfolding, the expansion of rowing, the inclusion, all, everything that's happening with rowing in all the ways after that great demonstration by Orboard as well. So, again, rowing in all the ways. This weekend, or this right now, this is the first race of the weekend that has more than two heats. We have four heats here in the Women's Youth Cup. This is the first heat, so the top two will make it to the first level final. The next two places, places three and four, will make it to the second level final. And the remaining 
places in each of these heats will go to the third level final. So already underway on the water in lane one are Marin. Lane two, Oakland Strokes. Lane three, San Diego Rowing Club, Lane 4, Texas Center, and Lane 5, River City. Adrian, we are already well underway here. This is a, just an amazing, a testament to not just the depth of the programs, but the depth of junior rowing. So when we see this number of heats on the water at San Diego, being able to, con to, to contest for a grand final, a B-level final, and a C-level final, I mean, how cool is that? So, you know, the, the level of competitiveness here is, is just phenomenal. And we're going to see some times being thrown down by some of these crews that are comparative to collegiate crews. Um, right now, though, what we're looking at on the water is their lane number is exactly the order that you're going to find them in. So Marin right now holding on to a lead spot, followed by Oakland Strokes, and then San Diego Rowing Club in the third place position, followed by Texas Rowing Center in fourth, and then River City. So again, the seatings as they come out from the coaches look like they're working right here because they are exactly in the order that they should be. And we've seen some Marin crews jump out, per, you know, to handy leads in the first half of the race. And those, the, the striation that we're seeing, as Adrian just mentioned, from lanes one, two, three, four, and five are falling as they are placement wise mm -hmm. as well. And Marin's lead is now open water over current second place, Oakland Strokes. Marin in that red hull out in front. And you can see the energy popping out of that boat. It looks like maybe they went out and had some lunch or had a nice sleep last night and so yep. they're able to lay something down oakland strokes is about to take open water over san diego rowing club and we have texas center looking like they're trying to creep back into that bit of a lead that uh R san diego rowing club took over them but again still in contact with them river city no one is out of contact yet with the group yeah, there is a lot of overlap still between the crews. Really the only one that's broken open and broken broken free in terms of open water is Marin. I have them clocked at 36 and a half strokes a minute. Pretty aggressive, um, but not uncommon uh, for, for junior rowing at this level. So these women very, very fit. Um, they had a great year last year. Again, perpetual national champions in a variety of events and uh, participants, of course, taking trophies home every year from San Diego and doing nothing different um, at this point. So looking really, really solid here, Marin out of lane one. Behind them, Oakland Strokes, also one of the larger junior programs in the Bay Area. They continually have over 200 athletes that go through that program on a yearly basis. San Diego Rowing Club, of course, the biggest rowing club down here in, uh, in the San Diego area for juniors and also obviously quite for masters. Texas coming all the way from Austin. They have really shown themselves on the national stage, both for juniors and for masters. So, you know, with the influence, I would think, for of the University of Texas having such a, a, an amazing program, I would think that that ha would have a direct uh, direct influence on the junior program. And Everyone wants to get on the water. And the growth of the city alone, and I know that some national team athletes or national team hopefuls uh, go and train in, in Texas because it is a warm body of water, oh, uh, yeah. a warm climate throughout the year, just another place to go you know something that I have to say is of course Marin synonymous with uh, Sandy Armstrong I know that there are numerous coaches there she is not the only one recently had a conversation with her and it was super flattering for me because complimentary and I'm standing there in awe of her you know but she's they've also started paying a lot of attention to making sure that the athletes are taking care of themselves off of the water moving really well yeah. being able to move in all the ways because in order to row well Think about it, coaches. You look at an athlete, you're trying to get them to do something, but they can't, and you just can't figure out why. It might not be what you're saying. It might be that they have something that is inhibiting them from a range of motion perspective. Right. So I know that they have been paying attention to that stuff out there at Marin, and maybe that is helping them row better. Well, that is really, you know, it's a smart thing to do because mm -hmm. you're looking at, at athletes that longevity. are still growing. Yeah. And it is all about longevity. A lot of these kids want to go on, and they want to row in college. You want to continue to row as a master. You don't, you know, you don't peak when you're 16 mm -hmm. years old. Mm -hmm. And you still have a lot of maturing to do, especially Joint for women. Integrity. Yes, exactly. So, you <laughs> Gonna know. Going to preach to the choir out here while I have the mic. <laughs> paying attention is not just about them logging, you know, thousands of miles a year. This is about them taking care of themselves during cross training, making sure that, you know, all the muscles are, fi are, are fly firing. And then also what I'm seeing is a lot of these programs um, prioritizing sculling, especially mm -hmm. for the younger mm -hmm. rowers. I personally think that that is super, super smart. Um, Boating and big boats from sculling, yeah, from yeah, small boats, absolutely. absolutely. Doing mm -hmm. a lot of training in the small boats, but a lot of focus on um, on those sculling boats. So, 
what we're seeing play out on the screen is that attention to detail that we know Marin has um, and that Oakland has. All of these crews, San Diego, Texas, River City. River City rowing in uh, the port of Sacramento. They have their crosstown rival, Sacramento State Aquatic Center uh, in Capital Crew. So there are a couple of area rowing teams in the Sacramento area. River City, always a very, very strong crew. So here we go with Marin. You can hear the cheers on the Cowboys shoreline. Redwood, that is for them. <laughs> That's for Marin. Just behind them, but by a good amount of open water is, is Oakland Strokes, San Diego, and Texas Rowing Center, probably the closest competition to each other. And then finally, River City. You can see the energy right there, and I'm sure coming across the line, knowing there are four heats in this event, the first of this Women's Youth Cup here. No matter what time you come across, it's only it's uh, when you get to the final. Top two go through to the first level That's final. Right. Next two go to the second level final, and then after that go to the third level final. And here we are coming in lane four. Texas Center making a good push for it, but they are going to come a little bit shy. San Diego Rowing Club had enough of a lead early on to maintain it. So maybe that's something to correct for the next race down the line is give it a push a little bit sooner. Sometimes I'll tell athletes, you know what, I don't need you to start going 500 meters, meters sooner. Next time you have it to go out there, just start sprinting five strokes or start going a little harder five strokes sooner than the last time you did it. And that'll put you a little bit closer come finish line. You won't run out of time to go fast. All right, we are into the second heat of the Women's Youth 8 Cup. In this uh, event, we will have five boats on the course in lane one, Newport. Lane two, Long Beach Junior Crew. Lane three, NorCal. Lane four, Casitas Rowing. Lane five, TBC Racing.
Okay, sorry about the delay there. We were just double checking our heat sheets, making sure that we have the right information for you. But indeed, it does look like, again, the lanes are seated properly. We've got Newport pulling out to a very substantial lead here just by the halfway point, looks about 750 meters in. They have a half a length of open water over Long Beach. So Long Beach Junior Crew there in that second place spot. They have pulled clear of NorCal. And then the biggest race is behind NorCal between Casitas and TBC Rowing. So Casitas, TBC Rowing, very slight advantage going to lane five, TBC. And it looks like that's a really great, great race there coming in for, you know, again, we want these crews to move forward. Casitas and TBC, it's going to be between them for the, the B level final or a C level final. That's a big difference. But right now, Newport, way out in front, they have now a full length of open water advantage over Long Beach. Long Beach with about a half a boat length of open water over NorCal. Top two boats to advance to the grand final. All right, and all crews approaching 500 meters to go. Nothing has really changed here. We definitely see that that Newport crew is well out in front. They're still holding off Long Beach and NorCal. So in that order, Newport in first, Long Beach second, NorCal in third. But then that really tight race between Casitas and TBC has changed a little bit. We've got TBC in the fourth place position, having overtaken Casitas for the fourth place spot. So. TBC doing a great job here in this final 500 meters, seeing if they can take away a little bit of room from NorCal, maybe come in to that third place position, but might run out of space here. Both of those crews, NorCal and TBC, at this point looking like they'll be moving on to the B-level final, but it's not over till it's over. There's still some space left out on the course, but Newport leaving nothing on the table. They are definitely putting down a show here and making a statement. All right, big spread here between these top three boats and even between the first two boats. Newport, very solid, also very, uh, very well regarded in terms of their national ranking uh, throughout the season. So they definitely are going to put on a show. And again, coming through, looking at a fast time, we're going to compare times. These coaches are going to go out. They're going to take a look at, well, what happened in that first heat? How do we compare? How do we improve knowing that we're going to be going into a grand final and racing against some other really fast crews? But here we go. Newport across the line. For that first, first place spot, here's Long Beach in second. And now here comes NorCal.
And then just like we said, it is not over till it's over. Look at the spacing here between Casitas and TBC. TBC, can they hold off Casitas? Casitas moving. Casitas moving in the final 20 strokes here in that beautiful lime green boat. Great program out of the Ventura area. Doing a nice job here finishing off this piece. American Specialty Health congratulates the Crew Classic on its 50th anniversary, and we're proud to sponsor the Men's Varsity Collegiate Active and Fit Cal Cup. New this year, American Specialty Health is sponsoring the Active and Fit Recovery Lounge. The lounge will feature massage chairs, spin bikes, stretching mats, foam roller sets, and guided stretching videos. For race fans and rowers, American Specialty Health invites you to participate in the Pitch for Prizes game at the Active and Fit exhibit tent for a chance to win a prize. Through the Active and Fit programs, fitness enthusiasts can enjoy low-cost access to thousands of gyms nationwide. Learn more at activeandfitnow.com. U.S. Rowing is a nonprofit membership organization recognized by the United States Olympic and Paralympic Committee as the national governing body for the sport of rowing in the United States. U.S. Rowing selects, trains, and manages the teams that represent the U.S. in international competition, including the World Championships, Pan American Games, and Olympic and Paralympic Games. U.S. Rowing serves and promotes the sport on all levels of competition and reflects the spectrum of American rowers, youth, collegians, masters, and those who row for recreation, competition, or fitness. Learn more at usrowing.org. And in heat three of the Women's Youth Cup here, again, top two go to the first level final. Next two, that's places three and four, go to the second level final. All else to the third level final. In lane one and out front with the early quick start is Capital Crew. Lane two, Holy Names. Lane three, Marina Aquatic. Lane four, Pacific. And lane five, Ikaika out of Hawaii. And just as I read them in this very early portion of the race is how the lead is kind of falling right now with, like I said, Capital jumping out to kind of a quick start here. Holy Names. Uh, close behind them in second place with Marina Aquatic. Uh, you could probably expect Marina Aquatic to dig back in through the middle of this race and make sure that they maintain contact, if not crawl back up into those leaders. That's right, and this is a really nice cross-section of junior rowing here. Capital crew out of the Sacramento area, coached by Sarah, P Sarah Puttacombe, always very, very competitive, both with the open weight categories and in the lightweight categories. They've seen a lot of success at that level, and very fast, of course. Uh, their home course is Lake Natoma, one of the best venues in the country. Just behind them biased? is Holy Names. <laughs> I am biased. I, I love Lake Natoba. <laughs> but just behind them is Holy Names, a private school in Seattle, um, all-girls school, I believe and again also a super strong program they travel quite a bit um, to get the best competition they have they have come to the Bay Area for races they of course uh, coming to San Diego traveling to um, different races across the country and is seeing that good cross-section of nationally ranked junior rowers Marina Aquatic Center, you see them on your screen. They are wearing pink shirts. I do want to just mention that the sixth seat of the Marina boat, that is Amy Fuller Kearney's daughter. She's a senior rowing for Marina Aquatic Center. She will be moving on to row in college. And, you know, it's a, a heavy weight to carry on your shoulder to experience a loss of a parent. Um, but also the legacy that Amy has passed on to her daughter, to the rowing world, is just so present here and I just want to acknowledge that. 
in the fourth place position, Pacific Rowing Club from San Francisco. Pacific Rowing on Lake Merced. Very small body of water, so they do a lot of turns. Um, not quite 2,000 meters long, so it's a little bit of a, a different uh, practice situation that they have to go to, probably very similar to Green Lake. And then probably the crew of note that is, that's really interesting is gonna be Akaika from Hawaii. They don't even practice in an eight. So the only thing that they have out on the island is a four, um, might be convertible to a quad, but for them to come out and race an eight, probably with very little if none, no practice, um, is just super cool. You know, what we've seen with some of the delays here on the cameras and the starts, and what we're giving you uh, is we had capital out there early, and just as we said, holy names, those two crews have seen each other quite a bit over the last several years, um, have had some good success against one another, a good success on the national stage, and holy names through the middle portion of the race decided, it, not not decided, they decided from the first stroke. It was part of their <laughs> race plan. <laughs> their fitness and, and technical dis dexterity is showing as they've taken the lead away from capital and now looks to be a half length looking to extend to out to a full length of lead as they get into the last quarter of the race. Marina Aquatic sitting there in third place behind our, the two lead boats have been Holy Names and Capital from the very get-go with Marina Aquatic in third the entire time. So those have been your three leaders with Pacific in fourth um, right off the bat. But it is Capital and Holy Names that were the two that said, hey, we're here for one of those top two spots, if not this top spot. But through that middle, Holy Names did do some work that allowed them to overtake at least a half a boat lead that Capital had on them and now it's completely inverted and Lindsay I'm looking at a really nice sprint here from capital um, so they have al although holy names took over capital crew is answering they are responding so this is going to be again an amazing final to watch tomorrow as these crews go after each other they are definitely capital is moving every t time their blades are in the water they are taking inches so this is going to be a good thing to do at the end of this race holy names here with the win capital in second Good for those coaches to sit down and say, what can we do differently? How can we recalibrate and move forward? Marina Aquatic Center in the third place position, coming across nicely with a lot of room between themselves and Pacific. And then Pacific, a couple of lengths of open water over Akaika. And again, really cool to see the Hawaiian crew um, just in the picture there. You know, I, I already mentioned that I love the way that you say cal recalibrate, you know, and it's 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 a collaborative thing. I, one of my favorite pieces of advice that I ever got from a coach was, OK, maybe 20 things happen that you could improve. Don't do 20 things differently. Pick one or two of those things and really hone that, because every time you have an opportunity to practice, even if it's for 20 minutes, you can improve that thing. Every race warm up you do, you have an opportunity to improve that thing. Have that aha and make the boat faster. That's the, that's right. And I just, you know, I can't talk about it enough, but the, the crew from Hawaii was just very impressive. I mean, just exceptional technique, boat moving skills, you know, for not rowing in an eight and to come out here on the national stage um, at a regatta like San Diego is just super impressive. And what an amazing experience uh, for these kids. I mean, I hope it's their spring break and they enjoy San Diego um, and just great job. Sharp Healthcare nurses, staff, and volunteers provide health screenings and medical service for the San Diego Crew Classic and Sharp hosts Sunday's Brunch by the Bay. The Cushman Wellness Center, located at Sharp Memorial Outpatient Pavilion, encourages men and women to take action to live a healthier life. The center takes the annual physical to a new level by providing a comprehensive health assessment, personal health coaching, and lifestyle analysis.
And our fourth and final heat is underway in the Women's Youth Cup. Such a cross-section of teams that you will see a lot of these crews show up again at Youth Nationals. So a lot of fast racing happening here, a lot of strong racing happening here out of these women's youth crews. Again, top uh, two here advance to the top level final. In lane one is Connecticut. Lane two, Saugatuck. Those two certainly see each other throughout the year. Lane three, Mount Baker. And lane four, Sammamish. So Mount Baker and Sammamish probably see each other throughout the year being from similar portions of the country. And as you see it on the screen, as we're getting into the first quarter of this race, that first long bridge is the first quarter of the race. Then there's a little bit of protection um, as the bridges close up here. But those two, uh, it's two, it seems to be a two, two boat races here. Capital and Holy Names in lanes, uh, sorry, uh, Connecticut and Saugatuck in lanes one and two, and Mount Baker and Sammamish in lanes three and four in this fourth and final heat of the Women's Youth Cup. And for those of you who are watching on the screen, I hope that you saw that start because that was actually really cool to see. So important to note, these boats are, are long. They're 60 feet long. They weigh 200 plus pounds. You've got all this mass. You have to move that boat from an absolutely dead stop up to racing speed as quickly as possible. And the boat that really had the best start was Connecticut. I mean, they just shot off the line. It almost looked like they lifted that boat up out of the water. But then Saugatuck, not quite as, I would say, um, as explosive out of the gate, but more patient. And now we're seeing that play out right here as Saugatuck moves into the lead position and already a bit of open water for them over Connecticut. Now, still a good connection between Connecticut and Sammamish. So Sammamish in the third place position, bit of overlap for Sammamish and Mount Baker. So like Lindsay said, Sammamish and Mount Baker likely racing each other throughout the season. Mount Baker is a program in Seattle that's run by the Seattle Parks and Rec. So a really a true community program. And again, you know, looking at the cross section of junior racing that we see out here, all sorts of different programs uh, with different funding, with different um, coaching you know, models. And here they are all competing on the same stage. You know, and throughout that, you know, We've s we're just watching Saga Tech continuously walk away here, just continue it within their plan, just little by little. And that's just something that's so beautiful to see. It's, it didn't, again, happen all in 10 strokes, but mm -hmm. just ever so slightly, every stroke just a hair faster than the other crews. Uh, Sammamish over here on the far side in lane four is looking to creep back up into what uh, Connecticut looked, uh, the lead that Connecticut had on them in the beginning. So look for Sammamish to be vying for one of those two spots, top two spots as well with Connecticut. But clearly Saga Tech is out by several boat lengths of open water here. Uh, for that crew, that is a much more internal. There isn't someone right next to you. They, all of the athletes in that crew can see every other boat that's out on the field right now. And so looking to make a statement here, have the best race that you can lay down here on the course, knowing that they will potentially be going to that top-level final to see some of the other crews that we've seen come across in the top two, which is going to make for a fantastically fun first-level final. But before I get ahead of myself, yep. here's heat four of the women's youth or women's youth eight. This is the 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 women's youth cup. That's right. So here they come into the spectator area. You can get yourself down to the shoreline if you want to see an amazing display of oarsmanship. Look at that Saga Tech boat. I mean, what a uh, clinic, really. You know that they're they're showing you what they have, and this is just a heat. So tomorrow. It, like Lindsay said, it's going to be bananas in that final. But Sagatuck looking super speedy here and very sharp. Staying um, quick. Yeah, very quick, elevated stroke rate and, you know, just really nice composure. And again, calling out how difficult it is to travel all the way across the country and perform at this high level. So hats off to them for being able to do that here out in San Diego. Just behind them is going to be Connecticut. Again, just their, you know, across the state rivals. Connecticut doing a nice job holding off a late charge by Sammamish. Sammamish in third with Mount Baker in the third, fourth place position. You know, when these crews cross the line, they've, they've laid down a lot of effort here. And I love it when they come across the line and then they just, they collect themselves right into their rhythm as if it's no big deal. No drama, maintaining composure. You know, that's that's another thing that you can say to your competitors out there is, yeah, we just did that. Yep. Now we're just going to keep rowing and yep. keep we, it clean. We did what we were supposed to do. Yep.
All right, we're taking a look here at the Men's Youth 8 San Diego Rowing Cup. This is Heat 1. Top four boats go on to the grand finals, but it does look like we are stopping the race. They're actually pretty well underway, almost at 250 meters, and um, whew, that's quite a start because you've already got all that adrenaline out, and then to come to a quick stop, have to turn around, and get back into the starting block. So and I was not just the adrenaline, but to trust that it's okay to do that. Yeah, it's because a little it bit has of a to be within that first hundred meters. Right. And unless the referee and you can see the flag wave to call the race back, it's hard to go. Wait, should we? Should, uh, we? should we stop? Should we keep going? <laughs> What's happening here? So yeah. for those of you who are new to the sport of rowing, maybe watching at home, um, what happens is that within that first hundred meters is your zone to be able to say, "Oh my gosh, my seat." broke in half or my or you know I don't know something, something happened has to break and the coxswain has to, has to put yep. their hand in the air very visibly for the referees and they will stop the race because um, you know there's obviously um, something that needs to be uh, fixed repaired some yeah. sort of an issue and, and remember that the coxswain is facing down the race course so they can't see what's going on behind them so then that's the rower that would have to communicate right. to the coxswain to let them know that something's going on and then they might have to take it back right to the start right and so that came from the the outside lanes um, and so we'll let them pull uh, the crews back into the starting box. Most likely what's going to happen is that they will let the next heat go off first. Um, so we're going to jump ahead most likely to race number 63. That's the second heat of the men's youth eight. And then we'll circle back and rerun heat one. So we'll be back with you in just a minute once we figure out what's going on. At WinTech and King Racing, we are passionate about rowing. It empowers individuals, teaches them unshakable discipline, and gives all who endure its trials the strength to take on the world. However, rowing still struggles with broad accessibility. WinTech seeks to break down these barriers by making affordable shells for elite athletes, recreational rowers, and everyone in between. WinTech, fair price, unfair advantage. American Specialty Health congratulates the Crew Classic on its 50th anniversary, and we're proud to sponsor the Men's Varsity Collegiate Active and Fit Cal Cup. New this year, American Specialty Health is sponsoring the Active and Fit Recovery Lounge. The lounge will feature massage chairs, spin bikes, stretching mats, foam roller sets, and guided stretching videos. For race fans and rowers, American Specialty Health invites you to participate in the Pitch for Prizes game at the Active and Fit exhibit tent for a chance to win a prize. Through the Active and Fit programs, fitness enthusiasts can enjoy low-cost access to thousands of gyms nationwide. Learn more at activeandfitnow.com. Masters ladies, are you rowing through menopause? This challenging time of life can be confusing. There's a lot of conflicting advice. Faster Masters Rowing has a pre-recorded webinar available right now at fastermastersrowing.com slash menopause. The Mission Bay Yacht Club has a strong tradition of Corinthian sailboat racing. This is encouraged by club-sponsored regattas throughout the year. You'll find national champions and novices alike competing in our regattas. Mission Bay Yacht Club's ideal location makes it a favorite venue for national and world championship sailing regattas. The San Diego Crew Classic thanks the Mission Bay Yacht Club for their many years of support and volunteerism that helps the regatta thrive in our shared home on Mission Bay.
All right, we are returning back up to the start. And like I said, we are going to be running heat two of the men's youth eight, the San Diego Rowing Club, uh, Cup. And then we'll, like circle back. <laughs> we'll circle back we'll circle back and we will run the first heat. So seven boats on the course with the progression here. It will be the top four boats that move on to the A level final and then the remainder will move on to the B level final. So boats still putting themselves into that perfect alignment. If you're looking at the screen, um, then you can take a look at what exactly that entails. Lindsay, you want to talk a little bit about what that's like from the oarsman's perspective? Uh, sure. When you're up there at the start, I mean, it's SeaWorld. There's a roller coaster. <laughs> I was up there yesterday. Shamu. There are people going, ah, screaming as they're going across <laughs> on the roller coaster, and you're trying to get aligned. So it's not an easy job here if you have any sort of, uh, you know, wind of any kind for any coxswain. There, there isn't a ton today, but even just a little bit, because especially when you add more crews to the event, so six, seven, eight boats, you have to get six, seven, eight times nine together all at once there's no boot up there so then you'll see how some of the the just in this yellow hole in the near lane here with Newport how there's an oar that looked like it was just about to touch the bow they've actually that's bow seat has handed their oar handle to two seat and two seat can then almost put the blade parallel to the hull which helps the coxswain point the boat without pulling it forward right. without advancing down the course it allows them to adjust laterally the thing is there's no there's sometimes they'll go to a quick start because of that if they need time if it to takes adjust. too long yeah exactly. they'll finally just be like let's go and there are no more hands there's no more i'm not straight yet it's okay pass it back to bow person and then off we go can you explain what a boot is a boot sure they have those only in a few courses around the world and it's an apparatus underwater sarasota right? sarasota has mm -hmm. one yet yeah, because that's a world rowing regulation size mm -hmm. you could have the olympics their course only one in the country kind of the only one that stays in year round in North America, right. I believe, right? Um, so then there's a boot that would emerge from the water and actually come up with a plastic cup that you can then push the bow ball up into. And it, it doesn't lock onto it. It's just like, you Holds know, it in uh, place. yeah, almost like a hand <coughs> sort of like a, mm -hmm. no, it's like a it's like plastic cup mm -hmm. that pops up out of the water and prevents the boat from shifting side to side. There right. is a little bit of error, like it's not a little bit of float side to side, but it's only a couple of inches. And as you look up on the screen, you can see those bows coming into alignment. It's a hard job to be the aligner, especially when there's any sort of wind, any sort of weather you can only imagine. Um, juniors, because they have raced so much, I, I have to admit they're, you know, probably some of the best crews to work with. And they, they are, are still out there really good. Those boats yeah, out. and they're still <laughs> trying to get those, those boats into alignment, get that boat pointed perfectly straight, especially with seven boats. Mm -hmm. That is a lot of action out on the course, and the boats are moving really quickly. These boats are going to just, just shoot off of the line, and so you can't steer. I mean, if, if, if anything, that coxswain, the, the goal is to not steer on a 2,000-meter race course. Of course, you make micro adjustments, but you want the oarsmen to be so evenly matched that you have to do very little with the rudder because that slows down mm -hmm. the boat. Mm -hmm. And the aligner isn't necessarily looking at whether every boat is straight down the course. They're looking at from as the side is, are we all starting on the same start line? That's the most important yeah. thing. <laughs> Super important. When Safety, obviously, when things is come down to tenth of things. a second. You <laughs> yes. know? Yeah, you want, you want the alignment to be yeah. perfect. You know, it's always interesting when that happens. You know, Don't leave it in the hands of the judges is what an old, old uh, coworker of mine would always say because really, Really, it's a mile and a quarter, and sometimes this is won or lost by a bow ball. So Absolutely. that difference at the start matters. And that's what these crews train for. They train for inches. They train for tenths of a second, and everything matters. So, you know, at the end of the race, you want to come across saying, you know, we did everything right, and we did what we could to make up those, you know, micro adjustments, those micro seconds that, um, that really comes down to a win or a loss or making it between a grand final and a petite final. Yeah. And, and considering that top four here go to the first level final uh, it, with seven crews across, it could, it could make a difference because it's pretty tight. Obviously, it's always tight when you take off from the start line. Top two crews right off of the start, Newport uh, and Capital there in lanes one and lane three, but just by the tiniest little margin in those first couple of strokes. So I'm sure, again, very early in this race that there will be potentially lead changes, certainly tight races happening across all seven crews and as you can see this race is underway and continuing on so we don't have the same whatever happened in the previous heat that we will then go back to at some point following these races so this is heat two of the men's youth san diego rowing 
Cup. Uh, and, and as I said, this race looks like it's going to continue without any stoppage. And we've got all California crews out on the course except for Lane 6, Mount Baker from the Seattle area. And we've got some pretty good racing going on here. Still quite a bit of overlap with these boats, but Lanes 1, 2, and 3 already pushed themselves out in front. So Lane 1, Newport, looking at a six-seat advantage over Oakland Strokes in Lane 2, Oakland in second place. They have about the same distance between themselves and Capital crew. Now the next closest crew to Capital is going to be all the way over in lane six. That is Mount Baker. So Mount Baker in fourth, but still tight to Capital. Back in the sixth, uh, excuse me, fifth place position will be Long Beach, followed by Pacific in sixth, and then Capital, uh, excuse me, Cathedral Catholic High School in seventh. Apart from, apart from Newport seeming to slide out there, uh, relative to the other crews, it, it, it's almost as if it's one t lanes one two three and then lanes six five four. Yeah. So toward the middle of the field is where uh, there's a little bit of drawback there. It's lane four with Long Beach Juniors just dropping back there from that capital eight in lane three, who is currently in third place, and that fourth place crew that does seem to be at almost a slightly lower rate, getting a lot of distance per stroke here in out in lane six is Mount, Mount Baker. Baker. So the yeah. one non-California crew that you mentioned here is moving really well. You know, you already mentioned that the waterway up there in the Pacific North west isn't the cleanest so you know taking advantage of whatever may or may not be happening out there they're like ah it's an outdoor sport let's make it happen <laughs> on any body of water and look at any lane these <laughs> perfect conditions yeah they're going to take advantage of it as best they can so i have both capital and mount baker clocked at 36 and a half strokes a minute again right next to mount baker in lane six is their next closest competitor which is pacific rowing club rowing out of lane five pacific again they race and row in san francisco on beautiful lake Merced right there it's like basically a coastal environment mm. so a lot of varying conditions they are used to dealing with uh, with the elements let's say so um, anyone that rows in the Bay Area definitely has um, a lot to contend with and just such a delight to come out here to San Diego for these sorts of conditions and and as we continue to talk about Mount Baker and Capital rowing at similar stroke rates and Mount Baker looking, because again, top four go through to that first level final. Yep. It's important to hold on to that spot. So yeah. they have they have their work to do and to they hold wanna, off Pacific. And they want to, yep, they want to make sure that they hold off Pacific. And certainly Long Beach Juniors, who were dropping back a bit, uh, a bit from them and Pacific, still Newport out in front followed by Oakland Strokes and Capital. Mm -hmm. Those three crews that are the three lead crews, are you will not see them in the picture here for the angle that we have, um, but just know that they are quite a bit out in front They're from there. the crews that are vying for that fourth place spot, those top four spots to round out who's going to that first mm -hmm. level final, which we will only find out who the other four crews is are once Heat 1 is rerun in uh, a little bit later. That's right. And so we're going to take a look at times, you know, as they come across the finish line um, as we move into the grand final and the petite level finals for those matchups. But right now, the only crew here of the seven that's just a little bit off the pace is Cathedral Catholic High School. Again, they are a scholastic program, much more difficult to field um, a program with a ton of depth when you're just pulling from one high school. Again, a lot of these clubs, they're pulling from the entire city or region that they're in. Um, but Cathedral Catholic like really has built up over the years. They are San Diego based crew um, and really have done a fine job. And then being able to go on and compete against other scholastic crews at Scholastic Nationals. Um, so a little bit of a different category, but just, you know, so much fun to see uh, them out here and contributing to the San Diego rowing community. But now up front, take a look. It's gotten a mm. little bit closer here between Newport and Oakland as we come into the final 500 meters. Definitely closing in, but know that the angle is not straight across. It's not diagonal from right to left, it, or it is a little bit diagonal from right to left. So even though Oakland Strokes is making a surge here, they're definitely taking in part of that lead that Newport took. Newport had a much more sizable lead uh, going into the middle portion of the race. Oakland Strokes has 100% cut that down in, in through the middle portion of the race. And now they are in contact. And they are looking to get and make sure that, that um, Newport Aquatic or Newport, excuse me, does not break back open water as they get into the sprint in the last 20 or so strokes of the race, 25 strokes. All right. And we see their fans down here on the shoreline as we follow the last 100 meters here. Newport continuing to hold off Oakland strokes and really, really nice work here by Mount Baker as they really try to hold off Pacific Pacific. Uh, I think having pushed themselves into that third place uh, position, it does look like Pacific has 
overtaken Mount Baker for the third place spot, but then holy moly, we've got another crew on the inside here. Capital also looking really strong. So you can see how much things have changed between Capital and Pacific. Wow, what a turnaround here. Pacific was definitely patient through that whole race because they were not in the top four. Now they're looking for top three, and you can see them sprinting there, and it looks like they've overtaken Capital, who was easily in the top three up to this point. But this is the heat. This is the second heat of this event, and it is. Pacific comes across. Pacific comes across in a position to move themselves into the top four ahead of Capital. So those are the four crews unofficially that round out those top four in this second heat. Mount Baker in fifth, so dropping back just a little bit. And then we have Long Beach Juniors followed by Cathedral Catholic High School. Sharp Healthcare nurses, staff, and volunteers provide health screenings and medical service for the San Diego Crew Classic and Sharp hosts Sunday's Brunch by the Bay. The Cushman Wellness Center, located at Sharp Memorial Outpatient Pavilion, encourages men and women to take action to live a healthier life. The center takes the annual physical to a new level by providing a comprehensive health assessment, personal health coaching, and lifestyle analysis. U.S. Rowing is a nonprofit membership organization recognized by the United States Olympic and Paralympic Committee as the national governing body for the sport of rowing in the United States. U.S. Rowing selects, trains, and manages the teams that represent the U.S. in international competition, including the World Championships, Pan American Games, and Olympic and Paralympic Games. U.S. Rowing serves and promotes the sport on all levels of competition and reflects the spectrum of American rowers, youth, collegians, masters, and those who row for recreation, competition, or fitness. Learn more at usrowing.org. To defeat the unpredictable threats that our nation faces, you must be able to adapt. U.S. Marines train tirelessly, both mentally and physically, to be able to overcome any scenario, be it land, air, sea, or an evolving digital landscape. In the battles for America's future, there is one constant, Marines who will win them. Do you have the mindset to protect our nation's future? Visit the U.S. Marines tent on Vendor Row or Marines.com to learn more. All right, and we are back on the course with heat one of the Men's Youth San Diego Rowing Cup. So here we are back. We had a little bit of breakage or something happening happened in the first 100 meters, so they called back heat one of the Men's Youth San Diego Rowing Cup. So here we are. This is race 62 of day two here at the San Diego Crew Classic. So in lane one, let's set the field because they took off quick here, and it looks to be a clean race now. Marin in lane one. Lane two is NorCal. Lane three is Saugatuck. Lane four, San Diego Rowing Club. Lane five, Marina Aquatic. Lane six, Sammamish. And in lane seven, Newport Sea Base. Top four in this race will go on to meet the top four from the previous race, which was heat two, to for the first level final remainder of this 14 boat field. And this event will go to the second level final. And it looks, you can see in the in the background of that picture, Marin just looking like they are sliding out from the field. They, they're rowing pretty upright there, keeping it quick, keeping it light, keeping it strong, not doing too much at the front or the back, which is allowing them to use their legs and just kick the boat right along in lane one. And from where we saw at that moment, it, it looked like they were pushing out um, from the crews that were a little bit uh, pushing out from the field. Yeah, and we can see um, from quite far away, definitely Marin uh, with a solid advantage. Right now, uh, we've still got quite a bit of overlap between 
the remaining crews, but just as we saw the women's team do from Marin, not that there's, you know, the shared uh, coaching or anything like that, but hey, maybe that's the hallmark of this team is like, let's get out in front and stay out in front early on. We don't want to have any questions about how fast we are, but we're seeing that right now with Marin, quite a bit of lead for them, just uh, not quite even at the halfway point. And apart, as you said, Adrian, apart from the crew, from from Marin on that inside lane, from being out in front of everyone else, it does seem to be well, quite a bit of overlap through the rest of the field, which is a seven boat field. So six boats across, that's a tight race. That's a solid race, especially knowing that there are four spots on the line for that first level final. Six boats vying for uh, now three spots. And what I'm looking at definitely is a tight pack here between NorCal, Saugatuck, and San Diego Rowing Club. Uh, back a few meters ago, I was going to give that advantage to Saugatuck, and now I think I'm going to actually give that to NorCal, but just barely. So again, um, they are just coming past that second bridge, maybe a little bit more exposure, maybe a little bit more um, wind to deal with. Again, nothing that these crews can't contend with, uh, but you know, a little bit of change up in that, that glassy water. Yeah, and it may be NorCal taking a few inches here as we come into the closing portion of this race to kind of take a bit of a lead over Sagatuck, uh, who still is still is in contact but has a bit of a lead over San Diego Rowing Club. And then the out of the next three crews in lanes five, six, and seven, Newport Sea Base looks like they're in there on the outside along with Marina Aquatic looking like trying to get up in there and see if they can take away one of those top four spots from uh, either NorCal, Sagatuck, or San Diego Rowing Club. Yep, I, we've got... Um, almost deadlocked here between Marina and Newport Sea Base for that fifth place position. Sammamish in sixth, but the real race is up front for that second, third, or fourth place spot. Right now, advantage definitely is going to be going to NorCal, but we still have a lot of race course left. We have about 500 meters or so to go. NorCal looking at about three seats over Sagatuck. Sagatuck looking bow to stern over San Diego Rowing Club. And we've seen Sagatuck come through with strong finishes. And so as they have, they're going to wind up for their sprint. We'll see if that can give them a lead change, which might put them into, uh, instead of potentially third where they're sitting, possibly overtake for second place. And, you know, I was so focused on the uh, places two through seven that I forgot about Marin because they're almost in their own race category up front. They've got, you know, just uh, miles between them and the next closest crew so again we're looking at a pretty amazing final tomorrow with these boats and with the remaining two through place places two through seven it's going to be really really hot in that final looking like a very mature and dynamic crew here comes marin you can hear the cheers for redwood down there that is an old cheer that they've had for a number of years <laughs> And there they are with their bow first across the line, but very tight here still between NorCal and Sagatuck. As we come down to the final strokes, it is depends on whose blade is in the water at what time. So I'm not gonna call it. I do think that NorCal was able to hold on to that. It was very, very close here. And now here is San Diego. So those are your top four boats unofficially. Marina Aquatic Center in fifth followed by Newport Sea Base and then Sammamish. You could see that Sagatuck's sprint there was effective, but it just, they ran out of room to go fast. So again, take it back a couple of strokes sooner and maybe you'd overtake them in the next time that you see these these other crews on the field. It, knowing how the race went down previously, the other heat, which was heat two, yeah. there were some significant lead changes through the middle and knowing how tight that pack was here, regardless of times, once you put all these crews on the water for their respective finals, both the first level and second level finals, that middle portion of the race is gonna be really fun to watch really tomorrow. Fun. Yeah, absolutely, and we're looking at Two tenths of a second right now, unofficially, between NorCal and Sagatuck. So uh, that's going to be great. It's going to be a hot one tomorrow, that is for sure. As we wrap the Men's U San Diego Rowing Cup, that was both Heats 1 and Heat 2, are done before we move on to the Women's U17 Referee Cup LA84 Foundation Trophy. The LA84 Foundation, if you don't know it, that has to deal with you know 1984, what happened there, Lake Casitas, rowing was held, the Olympics were in LA in 1984. First time I ever saw rowing was 1984 on my TV screen in my living room. <laughs> that changed my for life. Me. <laughs> yeah, that changed my life, Fantastic. watching, watching the women take a gold medal in that, that first race so I've, I've watched that race on a VHS in my living room before we went to Beijing <laughs> does anyone know what a VHS is do you remember that yes <laughs> at least this half the people here should know 
It's not a Betamax. <laughs> it's a real. I watched the LA Olympics on a real to real. I spun it with my own hand. <laughs> All right. So coming no. up, they're probably already on the race. Know course, your actually. history is yeah. what we're saying. That's right. It's pretty special. That's to be right. A part Juniors, of. if you have not seen the races from uh, Los Angeles '84. Go back and take a look into the record books. I'm sure you can YouTube it. Those were amazing races, amazing commentary as well, but just historic at Lake Casitas, um, mm -hmm. a, an amazing venue. And think about where the next couple of Olympic Games might be. Where are they going to be? Long Beach. Paris, Paris, then back in the U.S., and then out in Australia. Yep, yep, yep. All right, so heading back up the course for this women's under 17-8, we've got five boats on the course. In lane one, Marin. Lane two, Holy Names. Lane three, Newport. Lane four, Cathedral Catholic High School. Lane five, Oakland Strokes B. So Oakland Strokes with two entries here. Their B boat is in this first heat and the A boat is in lane one of the next heat. At WinTech and King Racing, we are passionate about rowing. It empowers individuals, teaches them unshakable discipline, and gives all who endure its trials the strength to take on the world. However, rowing still struggles with broad accessibility. WinTech seeks to break down these barriers by making affordable shells for elite athletes, recreational rowers, and everyone in between. WinTech, fair price, unfair advantage. American Specialty Health has been a sponsor of the Crew Classic for 24 years, thanks to its co-founder, chairman, and CEO, George DeVries, an alumni of the UCSD rowing team. The company's commitment to the Crew Classic is rooted in its objective to empower individuals to live healthier lives. You can learn more about American Specialty Health and its partner brand, Active and Fit Now, at activeandfitnow.com. And we're off to a clean start here in the first quarter of the uh, Women's U-17 Referee LA-84 Foundation Trophy. This is Heat 1 in the in the 8th uh, with Marin, Holy Names, Newport, Cathedral Catholic, and Oakland Strokes B on the water. And it is Marin in that inside lane taking that, as we saw just a moment, a few moments ago, um, setting out, jumping out to a quick lead over the rest of the field with Holy Names and Newport in second and third place currently. It looked as though Newport had a jump early on, but it looks like Holy Names took that lead back from them uh, to be in currently in second place. Well, one of the things that we noticed with Holy Names earlier on is that they uh, definitely are patient. I would say that they're very composed and that they turn it on in the second half of the race. So that's something to keep an eye on. Right now, Marin looking super strong here out in, uh, out in that lead position. They've got the all red blades. And, you know, again, they've already opened up some open water for themselves. So Marin in that first place position, they are followed by Newport rowing out of lane three. Newport sitting with about five to six seats over both Holy Names and Cathedral, uh, sorry, Holy Names and Oakland Strokes B. Cathedral Catholic in lane four, just a little bit off of the pace.
And then this field of nine here that we have, it will have two heats here in this event. Uh, it's a field of nine, and so top three will go to, to the first level final. Remainder will go to final two. Marin uh, staying clean over there in that lane one, uh, extending their lead stroke by stroke. And uh, Newport, even though it was quite close through hol with Holy Names and Newport in lanes two and three, um, Newport is inching out as well, their lead over Holy Names. But those are currently the top three crews. But out here on the far side, Oakland Strokes B entry is moving as well through the middle portion of the race, and it's getting cleaner and cleaner for them. You can see the momentum building as they've overtaken one of those top three spots. And the question is, is will they continue to gather momentum? It looked like they just kind of uh, made, uh, took a good bite into the lead that Newport had over them. But then it also looked like as soon as we, I finished saying that, that they kind of, um, Newport either answered or that was all that Oakland Strokes had at that moment. And they've stopped the advance that they had on Newport. So interesting to take a look at the stroke rates. I've got Marin clocked at about 31 strokes a minute. So not super aggressive, but comfortable. And I would say that, you know, there is something to be said for holding it at a little bit of a lower stroke rate so you can conserve energy and really let the boat run. So maximi ma maximizing boat run is a really smart move when you know that you're going to be racing again. You know, when it comes to stroke rate, stroke rate's not synonymous to speed. It's what are you efficient and effective at. And stroke right. rate has to be built with the legs. I'm not, you know, uh, ha it has to be built with the legs. I've just worked with people that sometimes trust. They're like, oh, well, we're not at this rate. And how, how can the boat go faster? Well, it depends on what your strength is. depends on how you're built. It depends on how you train. It depends, depends on, on the conditions. Exactly, what you're right. prepared for. And mm -hmm. so there are all these things. But allowing them to be, being at that 31, it tells us that maybe they have somewhere to go. You right. know, But right now, because they are out in front, it's super effective for them. They don't necessarily need to go anywhere, at least not yet. And I would, I would think that they do have somewhere to go. <laughs> knowing, uh, knowing seeing this the trends program, so far. Yeah, yeah, seeing yeah. the trends, but yeah. knowing knowing this program for sure. Special teams. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but then Newport, you know, Newport, and we looked at um, a second to third place position for Holy Names. I think the challenge right now, as we come down the race course, is to keep your eye on lanes three and lane five. Oakland Strokes, mm -hmm. they were really on the move. Mm -hmm. So that last half of the race is going to be interesting. I can't see the between water right two, now. Between lane two, three, so and five. Yeah, yes, lane yeah. two, it was very close between them, and it seemed like each of those crews was looking to make a move at some point in that middle portion of the race, not necessarily trading uh, places with Holy Names, but possibly Newport and Oakland Strokes trading places. But, Adrian, you already alluded to Holy Names being patient and yes. kind of accelerating or at least continuing and being consistent through all the way down the race course. Right. So no discounting them at all until we get down to this last little portion and see what unfolds. But also important to know, only the top three boats mm -hmm. here. Every progression has been a little bit different as we've come through the racing uh, today. But right now, this is only the top three crews. So you got to make sure that, you know, you are you're in there somewhere. So these crews are going to put everything on the line to make sure that they can squeak in to that grand final. And it does look like Oakland Strokes and Newport are the two crews that have uh, put, they're trying to put a little bit of distance between them and Holy Names. And even though Oakland Strokes is out there in a, a little bit of no man's land, lane five, because Cathedral Catholic has fallen off the pace a bit. Um, the coxswain is keeping them aware, or at least she's keeping herself aware of what's going on to make sure that they're staying in those top three spots. The interesting thing that I have always seen with uh, junior rowing and with this under 17, again, this could be a lot of different levels of experience with uh, with the athletes. You could be looking at some, some ladies that are in their first year of rowing. They could maybe be in their second year of rowing, but as relatively young athletes, um, it could be all over the map. So, you know, right now it is between Newport and Oakland Strokes for that third place position. Holy Names fell a little bit off of the pace at about that halfway mark. So right now those are your top three crews that look to unofficially be moving forward as we come into the tent area you can get yourself down to the beach um, i'll be listening for that marin cheer the iconic redwood foghorn cheer so marin out in front a couple of boat lengths of open water for them they are followed by newport and then oakland strokes b a little bit of clear water among those crews and of course they'll meet whomever comes through in the top three in the next heat from this race uh, marin is a name for the last couple of races so far in this afternoon we've set out in front so that's a trend that is developing over the course of these different races uh, Newport does have is open water back from Marin and Oakland Strokes is open open water back from Newport question is is in a sprint 
are any of these crews going to sprint? Will they close some of those gaps or will they maintain this gap coming down the line? Right, that's a really good point actually, Lindsay, because some crews um, maybe want to keep some surprises, some tricks up their sleeve <laughs> until they get into that final. They might no surprise one's playing themselves. Games. Yeah, no <laughs> one's playing games out here, but you know, there in some ways is not necessarily a need to do a full sprint if you're not necessarily being pushed. Um, and we see that Marin looking very calm, clean, um, and composed mm -hmm. as they have all day. Mm -hmm. And in lane three, that was Newport crossing the line. Unofficially second place in this heat. And in lane five, Oakland strokes B entry. Followed by Holy Names in lane two. How confident are you about rigging for Masters? Get the inside track from Volker Nolte, Mike Purser, and Mike Davenport on the webinar recording Rigging for Masters, available exclusively at fastermastersrowing.com slash rigging. For more than 40 years, JL Racing has been designing and manufacturing technical training and racing apparel for rowers. JL builds the highest quality technical garments in the industry with a dedicated design and development team that ensures your custom garments are just right. We make custom art for your team easy with free art and quick turn creative designs. At JL, we pride ourselves on our tailored sizing, building custom size options into our garments so you can get that perfect fit and the winning edge. Call us today to create your custom team kit or learn more at jlracing.com. And Cathedral Catholic rounding out this field of five in the first heat of the Women's U-17 Referee Cup LA-84 Foundation Trophy. The Mission Bay Yacht Club has a strong tradition of Corinthian sailboat racing. This is encouraged by club-sponsored regattas throughout the year. You'll find national champions and novices alike competing in our regattas. Mission Bay Yacht Club's ideal location makes it a favorite venue for national and world championship sailing regattas. The San Diego Crew Classic thanks the Mission Bay Yacht Club for their many years of support and volunteerism that helps the regatta thrive in our shared home on Mission Bay. Masters ladies, are you rowing through menopause? This challenging time of life can be confusing. There's a lot of conflicting advice. Faster Masters Rowing has a pre-recorded webinar available right now at fastermastersrowing.com slash menopause.
Masters ladies, are you rowing through menopause? Two in, uh, with Oakland Strokes, lane three, Long Beach Juniors, lane four is Capital, lane five is Marina Aquatic Center, and it looks like the Long Beach Juniors are fighting with Oakland Strokes right now to see who are two of those other crews that are going to go through to the first level final. That's right, and like we've seen all day, it is Marin well out in front, several lengths of open water for them, and then the good battle really tight here is between Long Beach Juniors and Oakland Strokes. So getting yourself down to the beach, we've got the top four boats already. We'll move on to the grand final. It is pretty clear who those are going to be at this point. It's just, you know, pick your lane. So Marin, well out in front. They are followed by Long Beach and then Oakland Strokes. It is Long Beach right now in the second place position. Back to them by about a length with a bit of open water. It is Oakland Strokes. And then just off of the stern deck or stern deck of that uh, Oakland boat is Capital in fifth place Marina Aquatic Center. As in rowing, the time-honored values of teamwork and good sportsmanship are instilled in the young campers who participate in the sports, games, and activities offered year-round at the park. Camp Land on the Bay is proud to sponsor the Women's Masters F Trophy at the 50th anniversary San Diego Crew Classic. Concept 2 brings more than 45 years of innovation to the sport of rowing. Their newest comp blade is a smaller size blade that feels lightweight, efficient, and stable. Unlock speed with the comp blade, available in both sweep and skull. Find out more at concept2.com slash comp. Concept 2 is the proud sponsor of the Women's Youth Quad Trophy at the 50th anniversary San Diego Crew Classic. Sponsored by the James S. Copley family, the Copley Cup is considered one of the marquee races of the Crew Classic. This coveted prize recognizes the longtime support of the Copley family since the first Crew Classic in 1973. Since 1975, the Copley Cup has been presented to the winner of the Invitational Race for Top Men's Collegiate Varsity Crews. The San Diego Crew Classic is grateful for 50 years of support from the James S. Copley Family Fund. In 1996, the Chapman brothers, Ron and Rick, opened a brew pub in their hometown of Coronado. Today, Coronado Brewing Company stays true to its San Diego roots, brewing abundantly hoppy West Coast-style ales. Coronado won a bronze medal at the 2019 Great American Beer Festival for its Weekend Vibes IPA, a silver medal for its Salty Crew Blonde in 2020, and a gold medal for its Palm Sway IPA in 2021. Coronado Brewing Company, stay coastal. Faster Masters Rowing is your partner for all things Masters Rowing. If you race, come get a training program. If you like podcasts, Faster Masters Rowing Radio is live every Thursday at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Find out more at FasterMastersRowing.com. Faster Masters proudly sponsors the new Intermediate Masters 8s at the 50th Anniversary San Diego Crew Classic. Mission Bay is an iconic destination within San Diego, situated on 27 miles of sandy shoreline, offering 4,600 acres of aquatic adventure and a variety of lodging options at six different hotels and resorts. With diverse outdoor activities from boating and kayaking to paddleboarding and biking, Mission Bay offers endless family-friendly activities and access to the best San Diego experiences. Discover Mission Bay, a collection of esteemed resort properties and local attractions in the area, was created to elevate the destination by making positive contributions to the Mission Bay community through special events, promotions, and experiences for both locals and travelers.
So here we are back at the start, awaiting the start of Heat 2 of the Men's U17 Cup here. And the eights that we have up there aligning themselves and awaiting the start I in lane one is NorCal. Lane two, Newport. Lane three, Los Gatos. Lane four, Pacific. <laughs> lane five, San Diego Rowing Club. And lane six is Texas Center. So again, up there awaiting the start, you have those nerves and you're sitting there and you're ready to go and you're sculling the boat around to keep that point. If, they're, if the coxswain needs your help to make sure that you're, they don't advance down the course by correcting their point, you have to scull it by handing the blade to the person in front of you. Uh, and here we are, they're, they just put the, put the oars back and off they go. And sometimes you'll see some crews maybe not quite prepared to take that first <laughs> stroke. They were still sculling it around. Um, and it's this is like the blind fury of junior rowing. This is what exactly what we're seeing Imagine right now. Imagine the nerves now. that you have up there and you're having to do that and then pass the oar back and then go. Yes, yep. it all and happens very quickly. And that's one of the things we see um, it, with these great camera angles that we get sometimes. You um, definitely can see some of the steering that comes into play from the coxswains. Again, like I said earlier, hopefully you don't have to steer at all. If you have a good crew that's well matched, that boat should go straight, and the coxswain really doesn't have to do uh, any sort of sort of steering, like very minimally, because it does slow down the boat. But right out of the gates, it is Newport with the hottest start. They are in the first place position just by a couple of seats over NorCal. NorCal rowing out of lane one. Those two boats already almost a full length ahead of the rest of the field. Los Gatos looks to be in the third place spot, and right next to them it will be Pacific, followed by San Diego, and then Texas Rowing Center. You know, it did look like Newport was going to take off there in those first eh, 10, 20 strokes, and they did take a bit of a margin over the two crews flanking them in lane, lane one, NorCal, lane three, Los Gatos. But those two crews have also picked up speed as they've worked their way through their start sequences and getting into their uh, base rhythms here. Mm -hmm. So Newport did not continue to walk out from the rest of the field, and now NorCal mm -hmm. has overtaken them. What you could see, like I said, 20 to 30 strokes in, they started to walk up on Newport and then continue on from there. And there is kind of a stagger coming straight down the lanes, first, second, third, uh, and fourth in lanes one, two, three, and four. But then it is Texas Center out there vying for basically balanced or close to balanced with Pacific San Diego Rowing Club, the only crew that's dropping back just a little bit, um, almost at Clearwater back of those uh, Pacific and Texas Center, who are the next two trailing crews. Of this uh, six-boat race, top four will go to the first level final, and the other two crews will go to the second level final. And Texas Rowing Center has now overtaken Pacific to lock themselves into that fourth place spot. I don't want to say lock in because there's still a lot of race course left, but Texas Rowing Center even pulling up even, I'm going to say, more with Pacific for the fourth place spot. A little bit hard to see in terms of the angle, so we're going to see how this shakes out as we come a little bit farther down the race course, but I think that Pacific was able to answer that push that Texas Rowing Center put on, and they are now pulling a little bit farther away. So I think I agree with you. <laughs> a lot <laughs> happens. It's funny because, you know, this is such a long race, and you don't think that a whole lot happens in a very short amount of time, but sometimes it does. I mean, sometimes we'll say one sentence and then everything's mm -hmm. completely different from what we just called, and that's a lot of the time what you see, especially with uh, junior racing. You know, it was almost as if that first 500 kind of stacked everyone up. Yep, Newport jumped out, then NorCal overtook, but those margins that each crew kind of took, they've been sitting there in kind of a half-length, half-length, half-length right. pattern for the last uh, 500 meters or so, and then from there, n it, it looked as though NorCal might want to can edge out just a little bit farther from Newport, but the contact that was had between Newport, Los Gatos, and Pacific was pretty similar uh, apart from one another. So as the race unfolds, we get into the last 500, 600 meters or so. <laughs> Will a crew start to sprint a little bit early? And when they do, that's when you start to see the rate come up a little bit. They start to ramp it up coming through the finish line. You know, we've talked about s the special teams. I, it's like a football reference, of course, the right. kickers and all that kind of stuff. Uh, well, some people might know, you know, but, uh, <laughs> but this early. People in the probably season. pay attention to other sports. Yeah, other yeah. Than <laughs> right. so. But, you I know, know, just to but clarify, yeah. we have to be clear on this. What I mean by that is the start and sprint portion of the race. At this point, you wouldn't have that perfectly dialed in. Yeah. But this is a good precursor to test it out and see what sort of kinks what sort of practice we need, how, m how often we need to build that into our practice otherwise. Right. Don't need to spend tons of time on it, but you do need to visit it for quickness reasons. So uh, who is going to start sprinting early? Do they need to? Do they want to? 
Because, again, top four go through the A-level final. We may not n see a need for early sprinting. Right. Well, and I think Texas is going to have to try and think about where that sprint is going to be if they want to try and sneak into one of those top four spots. So right now, again, like we said, the only team that's just a little bit off the back is San Diego Rowing Club. But, again, a tighter race in between, between Pacific and Texas with Pacific holding on to that slight advantage. But then your one, two, and three crews, NorCal, Newport, and Los Gatos in that order. And one of the things that we're taking a look at here in that third 500 is, you know, NorCal, very patient at the start. They just kind of, you know, were uh, maybe a little bit more composure, maybe a little bit more controlled with the stroke rating. Um, so the sign of a mature crew is to keep composed when you're nervous, when you have the jitters, when you have a lot of adrenaline, and to try and hone that energy into something that's productive. So NorCal doing a really nice job here with the efficiency as they continue to edge away from the rest of the field. But now it's tight here between Newport and Los Gatos. It might not matter all that much because they know that they are in one of those top four spots. But of course, this is a matter of pride. You want to put down the best time possible in the heat. You want to get a good lane. So Newport and Los Gatos going after each other. And then Pacific really trying to hold on to that fourth place spot and make sure that they keep Texas Rowing Center off of their stern. You know, here I made mention of not necessarily needing to sprint early, but uh, Los Gatos there is, I mean, they've walked right back into Newport and they've almost overtaken them at this point. And so this will, will really come down to the sprint portion of the race in this last 250-ish meters or so that those two crews have left. It is, you know, nearly brought even here, maybe a few seats back. A few, there are a few seats back uh, for Los Gatos. They haven't quite caught level yet. And as I'm talking about Los Gatos, Pacific is also working their way in there. So their sprint is effective. They're move, they are moving at this portion of the race, but are they're a little bit farther back to be able to get up into top two and three, but they're certainly putting themselves in good position to maintain top four. And really nice showing here from NorCal. The teams that are all out on the water right now have really quite large teams. So, so they're fielding an A boat, B boat, C boat, D boat. I mean, you name it, they are top to bottom, just stocked with talent. So NorCal, great job as they push their bow first across the line in this U-17 Heat 2. Super tight here between Los Gatos and Newport. What a comeback by Los Gatos. And I think this is going to be a learning experience for them for tomorrow. Newport still just slightly holding them off. Los Gatos right there. Pacific also really great last half of that race and last 500. Texas Rowing Center right now. And then finally, San Diego Rowing Club. And the one thing we know with the with the youth races, this is that U17 race. So we know that at least everyone in these crews is 17 and under. They could potentially be 14, 15 years old uh, racing up. So that's the only range that you'll find here. But we know that there isn't anyone over that age here. That is a really good point, Lindsay, as we look at the final races of the day here at the 50th anniversary of the San Diego Crew Classic. With the juniors, a lot of these kids starting to row when they're in seventh grade, eighth grade. I mean, can you imagine having started when you were 11 years old, 12 years old, and how much experience you have as you move forward into high school, potentially in college? I mean, uh, just really amazing to think about the level of talent and depth. American Specialty Health congratulates the Crew Classic on its 50th anniversary, and we're proud to sponsor the Men's Varsity Collegiate Active and Fit Cal Cup. New this year, American Specialty Health is sponsoring the Active and Fit Recovery Lounge. The lounge will feature massage chairs, spin bikes, stretching mats, foam roller sets, and guided stretching videos. For race fans and rowers, American Specialty Health invites you to participate in the Pitch for Prizes game at the Active and Fit exhibit tent for a chance to win a prize. Through the Active and Fit programs, fitness enthusiasts can enjoy low-cost access to thousands of gyms nationwide. Learn more at activeandfitnow.com. How confident are you about rigging for masters? Get the inside track from Volker Nolte, Mike Purser, and Mike Davenport on the webinar recording Rigging for Masters, available exclusively at fastermastersrowing.com slash rigging.
Orboard, the ultimate fitness, fun, and adventure product. The Orboard rower converts any paddleboard into a sculling boat that's fun and excellent exercise. With a convenient Orboard travel bag, you can transport the rower anywhere, meaning you're no longer bound to row only at a club. Enjoy the freedom of getting out on your favorite lake, river, or ocean, or even take it along when you head off for vacation. Orboard, row anywhere for fitness, fun, and adventure. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are nearing the final races here for the day, and we are going to come into an eight-boat race. There is a lot of action out on the water. This is the Women's Youth 8B, the Zlack Rowing Club Cup. In lane one, Marin. Lane two, Holy Names. Lane three, Capital. Lane four, Los Gatos. Lane five, Marina Aquatic Center. Lane six, Pacific. Lane seven, Texas Rowing Center and lane eight, Newport. And as we have seen throughout the day, Marin off to a hot start. They already are sitting with four seats over their next closest competitor, which is gonna come out of lane two, Holy Names. So Holy Names in second. They have a seven to eight seat advantage over lane three, Capital. Those are your top three boats. Those boats having pushed themselves a little bit farther away from the rest of the field. And then it's just a whole lot of overlap, a whole lot of bow balls back and forth between the remaining five boats. So Los Gatos, Marina Aquatic Center, Pacific, Texas Rowing Center, and two Newport, very tightly packed there. So of all of those crews in fourth, it will be Los Gatos. Next closest competitor to them will be Pacific rowing out of lane six. So we'll let it sit for just a little bit as we watch these crews progress and get into their base pace and really set the rhythm for the remainder of this piece. All boats now approaching 1,000 meters. Right, a lot of action out there on the course. You don't see many regattas or races that uh, honor eight lanes across. That is just a lot to try and keep track of. Uh, but with the popularity of junior rowing and so many different crews that want to race here, you know, we've got to do the best that we can. Sometimes you see nine lanes across, hard to tell. But right now with the eight lanes, we are looking at places one, two, and three coming out of Marin, then Holy Names, and then Capital. So looking to find out who is gonna occupy that fourth and final spot to get into the grand final. That's gonna be the question as we come into the last half of this race. All right, so we've got a little bit better picture of what's going on out there on the water. To be clear, Marin has pulled up to an open water lead over the rest of the field. 
And then behind them, in the second place position, it's going to be Holy Names, continuing to hold off capital. But then for that fourth place spot, the real question is, is it going to be Los Gatos or is it going to be Newport? Newport out in that far lane eight. So Newport trying to come up and furiously catch a good charge here by Los Gatos. That caution from Los Gatos has to be savvy and look all the way across at that far lane eight to make sure that she knows that Newport's on the move. And make sure, of course, there is that angle across the, across the field. So uh, Los Gatos still has a bit of a margin over Newport as the final strokes here are being taken. But just as Adrian mentioned, you, she does need to stay aware. They do need to stay aware of what's going on on the course because Newport was surging, and, and now it does look like you know Los Gatos does have a handle a handle on what was going on on the field. Again, Marin well out front, Clearwater over second and third place. Still Holy Names and Capital, and they're still battling it out. But it does look like Holy Names has a enough of a, co a, a control over what Capital is trying to do in the closing section. What a section. great race here! That's right, Marin. First across the line, but good job, Holy Names, holding off Capital. Capital maybe inching themselves a little bit more into Holy Names' lead. And then it's really, it's going to come down to the wire here between Los Gatos and Newport for that fourth place position. So keep your eye on those bow balls. And the finish, remember, it's just shy of those orange buoys. I do think that Los Gatos was able to hold on to that spot to inch themselves into the grand final. And now here comes Texas Center. Texas Center. Followed by Pacific and Marina And Aquatic. then Marina Aquatic Center. There it did look to be like it was maybe about a half a length there between those two crews uh, with Los Gatos and on the, out on the far side with Newport as they came through. But we'll see. Um, always check the official results. Yeah. Uh, looking for the timing. Uh, everything we say here is unofficial. Unofficially official. <laughs> We're official. <laughs> No April Fools. We make no <laughs> yeah, we make no promises. <laughs> that was the eight boats on the field for the women's youth bees lack rowing club cup. Yeah, Top four to the first level final. And up next on the field we will have or up next on the course we will have heat two. And another eight boat race coming up. So this is the final uh, big race across the field for us this, uh, this afternoon. And then we just have three more races to round out our day. And then crews can get back on the course and practice. I know that a lot of people like to take those evening laps, um, get a little bit of a shakeout ready for tomorrow. And it's nice, we'll be done fairly early and we'll see you at the beer garden pretty soon. San Diego Tourism Marketing District is a tourism improvement district serving all areas within the city of San Diego. SDTMD uses fees collected from local hotels to support the marketing and promotional efforts of a variety of programs, services, and special events throughout America's finest city. SDTMD's support for tourism marketing allows San Diego to maintain its status as an aspirational first-tier visitor destination and is vital to the strength and success of the city's tourism economy. SDTMD is pleased to support the San Diego Crew Classic in 2023 for its 50th anniversary. All right, and we have a race on the course and coming down at us, this is heat two of the women's youth 8B, the Zlack Rowing Club Cup. In lane one, Sagatuck. Lane two, Newport. Lane three, Oakland Strokes. Lane four, NorCal Crew. Lane five, San Diego Rowing Club. Lane six, Mount Baker. Lane seven, River City. And lane eight, Holy Names. As we're underway here, 
uh, getting through the first quarter of this race. Uh, Sagatuck and Newport are there in lanes one and lane two in first place, and it was Newport who had a slight edge very early on over Sagatuck. Uh, but as we saw earlier, Sagatuck maybe had a little bit more patience uh, with some of the earlier racing that they did. Um, and we're able to, to overtake the lead through the middle portion of the race. But right now it is Newport that has that little bit of a margin still over Sagatuck with Oakland Strokes not far behind in lane three next to them. So those are the three crews that are slipping out from the rest of the field. Still almost contact among everyone else. There are certainly th kind of three groups, three clusters here developing with Newport, Sagatuck, and, and Oakland Strokes in that kind of top cluster with NorCal and San Diego Rowing Club in a cluster and then the three boats on the far side Mount Baker River City and Holy Names also in a cluster so as those three t different races happen even though it's one race there are three kind of se separate sections of the racing that are happening and sometimes those separate races can allow for more exciting racing as those tiers start to intermix because different tiers above or below are pushing one another. That's right, and we're going to keep our eyes on that bright red boat out in lane five, that San Diego Rowing Club, because they are challenging NorCal, those two boats just right next to each other. One of them is going to have to be in that fourth place position unless we see one of the other three crews, Mount Baker, River City, or Holy Name, sneak into that top four. But right now, between lanes four and five, it's too close to call. Clearly, though, Newport out in front. Sagatuck in the second place spot right there with Oakland but again quite a bit left on this race course we've seen it happen all day long where position changes especially within that third 500. And Lindsay what is it about the third 500 that makes that difference with some of these crews? Uh, some you know if you've ever done a one minute test if you've ever run a marathon let's talk about a marathon that's way longer than this what is the part where you feel good uh, just before three quarters of the way through? Right, and then it's that third quarter. Don't make any mistakes about miles 18 to 22. It's going to mess you up, right? So something about that th third quarter of no matter what the distance is, it just gets to you psychologically. Sometimes I think of it as the horses to barn mentality. You're not close enough yet to home. You don't quite smell the finish line, but you're far enough from the start line that it hurts a lot, but you're not ready to sprint yet. It's 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 training. It's There's a base fitness in there that helps, but there's also a psychology of it, and that's one of the things I love to talk to coxswains about. As a rower, talking to coxswains, some of my favorite calls, Mary Whipple was my longtime coxswain, uh, so one of my favorite calls that she ever gave us was we're, we crossed the 1,000 of our Olympic final, and she said, this is all I need right now, <laughs> and they don't know we have another gear because that reassured me that she had faith in us as a crew, as the nine of us, it's not an eight, it's nine, that we had more, even though it hurt like all get out. And as soon as she called for that more, she called us together first, and then we took it. And that helped build that confidence to push through that kind of wall and world of hurt that is what you feel in the third 500. And that's what I think we just saw from NorCal. So NorCal, they had that extra gear, maybe San Diego uh, lacking a little bit within the, the body of the piece because NorCal just took off. They have walked away and they're actually inching up to push a little bit inside of Oakland Strokes. But Nor Newport, well out in front, they've got about a length of open water between themselves and Sagatuck. Sagatuck right here against the shoreline. And then back to them by several lengths of open water. It's that tight race between now Oakland Strokes and NorCal. So those are your top four boats. And then behind Mount Baker, River City, and Holy Names occupying sixth, seventh, and eighth place. So Newport con continuing to extend that lead. It was only a little bit in the first thousand or so, and now they've continued to extend through the second half of the race. Sagatuck is still there, but they are certainly well open water behind our not quite wire to wire leader Newport uh, and behind them Oakland Strokes they were up in the top three but have fallen off of the pace from the top two leaders here Newport and Sagatuck and NorCal is certainly with them pushing them because it is really great sprint here by top NorCal four. Yeah. top four to go through to that top level final and this is going to be again we've seen it all day this is going to be the learning curve here for NorCal how much faster can we get they are so close to Oakland and they've picked up so much speed in the last half of this race that this is going to be great for them to analyze and see what they can do maybe a little bit differently as they come down the race course tomorrow in that A-level final. Just a couple of seats, and they're continuing to walk into Oakland. And here's San Diego in fourth. In fifth, we're going to look at uh, Holy Names on the far side. They are followed by Mount Baker and then River City in very closely uh, to Mount Baker. So that's your second heat of the Women's Youth Bees Lack Rowing Club Cup, rounding out a field of 16 here. 
really tight right there between River City and Mount Baker at the finish there. It was just barely even a beep as both of those crews came across the line, probably very little separating each other. That's right. You know, all three of those crews right there, uh, Mount Baker, River City, and Holy Names, that was at least five, six, seven, maybe ten strokes after the line that they kept going. They were still racing well <laughs> beyond those buoys. So That's a smart coxswain, actually. Yeah. <laughs> Keep them going. <laughs> no one wants to stop short and uh, know that you still have another five strokes to go. So um, that's where hats off to these savvy coxswains. That's good coaching when you know that you have coached your coxswain well crucial part of the and the team. rubber's not taking that good yeah yeah they, they don't take <laughs> it they don't take it for granted at all up next we have the final three races of day two here at the 50th annual san diego crew classic uh we have the first two heats of the men's youth b Jean jessup hervey cup uh, followed by a the first final from the women's youth cup that we saw the heat in earlier today that'll be a three boat final sea level final all right two more big races coming up to qualify for a grand final tomorrow and they are already underway this is the men's youth 8b so second level youth eights uh, this is the gene jessup harvey cup in lane one marin lane two sagatuck lane three norcal lane four marina aquatic center lane five pacific rowing club and lane set lane six newport and we are seeing something similar as to things that have unraveled earlier with Marin Cruz this afternoon is that on that inside lane, lane one with, with Marin in that particular lane, they jump out to a lead and then just continue to, to extend it through what they're doing one stroke at a time down the course. So Marin is the only crew here that has separated itself out early on in this race. All right, so as we have seen throughout the day, I know you guys are going to get tired of hearing us say that, say this, but this is how it's playing out. Marin, a very seasoned, very mature-looking crew. They have quite a substantial lead this early on in the race. Um, we're about at the halfway point right here, but with about two and a half, maybe three lengths of open water between themselves and the rest of the field. And then it's pretty tightly bunched. It looks like Sagatuck in that second place position with their closest competitor being Newport all the way across in lane six. And then just a battle royale for that third or fourth place position between NorCal Marina and Pacific. So we will watch as they progress down the course, but keep your eye on Sagatuck and Newport with also Pacific chasing uh, Marina Aquatic Center right there as well. So, you know, tightening up as we get farther down the race course. You know, right, as you said, Sagatuck, it, they it looked like they were taking a move. like it, Or it looked like they got a little quicker, a little que cleaner, a little more energetic because they realized that there were things happening on the far side of the course that maybe they didn't, uh, didn't find the sense of urgency for earlier on because those crews are staying so tightly bunched that they're pushing one another. And so Newport, all the way on the other side, was vying for some, uh, jockeying for some position with Sagatuck, but just in the last minute or so, Sagatuck has continued to push out. When you saw that injection of speed right after you mentioned them about a minute ago, they uh, that has allowed them to slip out from the field, certainly from NorCal in the lane next to them. But that tight field, the next couple of boats across in, in Marina, Pacific, and Newport, that tertiary race, we'll say, is going to put pressure on NorCal, which could potentially push that whole group up And you definitely don't want to be in the position where it's too little, too late. And we're going to see a little bit of that here with these remaining three crews. We've got Marin a while out in front. We've got Sagatuck. But between Newport, NorCal, Marina, Pacific, it is getting tight. So come on down to the beach. Watch the finish of this race because whoever's going to slip into that fourth qualifying position for the grand final, they've got to turn on the afterburners here. But here's Marin, composed, patient, looking very relaxed and clean. Staying pretty upright, just using the legs. Pretty spectacular yeah, for a, a little shift. Beat crew. Push. But look at yeah. the tight pack here behind them. It is Sagatuck for second. And then between third and fourth, I'm looking at NorCal and Newport. 
NorCal and Newport, I'm going to give that advantage to Newport right now for the third place position. But now who is going to take that fourth place spot? We've got NorCal, we've got Pacific, Pacific we've got Marina. In there. Yeah. Pacific, it looks like Pacific took the edge over NorCal. I think you're right, Lindsay. We're going to keep our eye on the official results. Did Pacific sneak in to that grand final? I'm not saying sneak. They earned, they <laughs> earned their way. <laughs> but we like to it use those the words that kind of slip out sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they did not, by any stretch of the imagination, <laughs> sneak in there. They earned that spot. But, yep, it would be Pacific unofficially uh, just slightly over NorCal and then Marina Aquatic Center in sixth. U.S. Rowing is a nonprofit membership organization recognized by the United States Olympic and Paralympic Committee as the national governing body for the sport of rowing in the United States. U.S. Rowing selects, trains, and manages the teams that represent the U.S. in international competition, including the World Championships, Pan American Games, and Olympic and Paralympic Games. U.S. Rowing serves and promotes the sport on all levels of competition and reflects the spectrum of American rowers, youth, collegians, masters, and those who row for recreation, competition, or fitness. Learn more at usrowing.org. Sharp Healthcare nurses, staff, and volunteers provide health screenings and medical service for the San Diego Crew Classic and Sharp hosts Sunday's Brunch by the Bay. The Cushman Wellness Center, located at Sharp Memorial Outpatient Pavilion, encourages men and women to take action to live a healthier life. The center takes the annual physical to a new level by providing a comprehensive health assessment, personal health coaching, and lifestyle analysis. At WinTech and King Racing, we are passionate about rowing. It empowers individuals, teaches them unshakable discipline, and gives all who endure its trials the strength to take on the world. However, rowing still struggles with broad accessibility. WinTech seeks to break down these barriers by making affordable shells for elite athletes, recreational rowers, and everyone in between. WinTech, fair price, unfair advantage. To defeat the unpredictable threats that our nation faces, you must be able to adapt. U.S. Marines train tirelessly, both mentally and physically, to be able to overcome any scenario, be it land, air, sea, or an evolving digital landscape. In the battles for America's future, there is one constant, Marines who will win them. Do you have the mindset to protect our nation's future? Visit the U.S. Marines tent on Vendor Row or Marines.com to learn more. And here we are with heat two of the men's youth v. Jean Jessup Hervey Cup in lane one, Newport. Lane two, Oakland Strokes. Lane three, Los Gatos. Lane four, San Diego Rowing Club. Lane five, Newport Sea Base. And lane six, Cathedral Catholic. And as you can see, it's basically falling just as I said it with Newport jumping out. to. It was almost an even stack through the middle, just about a quarter length from boat to boat to boat, first, second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth uh, across as I read them. But Newport seems to be taking just a little bit more, a little over a half length over second place Oakland Strokes. When we get more boats back into the field, we'll give you more updates on what's going on in, through the middle portion of this race. That's right. And here we are looking at... Whoops. And here we're looking at a solid lead here by Newport. Uh, excellent blade work. Really not a bobble in that boat. Beautiful yellow empocker as they row down the course. Again, one of the things that I had mentioned earlier is that if a program is able to field a youth B8 plus an under 17 plus an under 16, I mean, we're looking at however many boats of varsity athletes throughout that program, um, just really a testament to the depth and strength of those programs. So places like Newport, Oakland Strokes, 
quite often fielding over 200 athletes throughout the program. Just a busy boathouse, that's for sure. And what it also does is it makes the programs even more competitive because it is hard to get into those top boats. And Newport looking like a very mature crew as they progress to the halfway point. So Newport with a lead, bout a stern advantage right now over Oakland Strokes. Oakland looking to have a bout of stern advantage over Los Gatos and then R San Diego Rowing Club. In fifth, it's Newport Sea Base, and then back to them by a bit of open water. It is Cathedral Catholic High School, again, a local area scholastic program based here in San Diego. Really great that they are fielding competitive teams and keeping kids on the water. And through that segment of the race, Oakland Strokes taking a little bit more of a margin on the crew that's next to them in Los Gatos. Uh, still Newport out in front, extending their lead over the rest of the field. You can see it starting to stack up, and uh, Los Gatos is starting to drop a little space, create or create a little space between them and San Diego Rowing Club. So the race unfolds if you're just a hair more effective, the more strokes that you take, a little more distance that you get as you come down. So one of the things Obviously. I want to point out as the, the boats are coming down towards us, it does look like a little bit of a parade where we've got lanes one through six in that order. And you've got to ask yourself, how does that happen? How did, how do we come down the race course in exactly lane order? And that all comes down to seating. So what happens during the season is that the coaches, they sit down and they seed the boats. They seed their competitors. They seed themselves. And we figure out, you know, where do you think that you should be based on early season results, based on last season's results. Um, and oftentimes it works out really well. We're seeing that play out right here. And you can hear you can hear the the cheering there on shore as they come into the last bit of the race here and uh, cheering them on to come to, uh, in this heat two of the men's youth B Jean Jessup Hervey Cup uh, to figure out who the other top four places will be to go into the first level final for this event that will happen tomorrow. And there is almost equal spacing between first, second, third, Newport, Oakland Strokes, and Los Gatos as they come toward the finish line. Newport, even though they had a commanding lead over the field, that open water lead is considered a commanding lead. They're still revving it up a bit, practicing a bit of a sprint. They've been clean the whole way. They've been very together the whole way, rotating to get their length out to the side rather than leaning, uh, and that's just helped them kick along down the course. Oakland Strokes coming across in second. That was the second horn. Third, as our eyes can see, is Los Gatos in fourth. Fourth will be San Diego Rowing Club in their trademark red holes, followed by Newport Sea Base. And Cathedral Catholic rounding out the sixth boat in this field of sixth. In the second heat of the men's youth B. Jean Jessup Hervey Cup. American Specialty Health has been a sponsor of the Crew Classic for 24 years thanks to its co-founder, chairman, and CEO, George DeVries, an alumni of the UCSD rowing team. The company's commitment to the Crew Classic is rooted in its objective to empower individuals to live healthier lives. You can learn more about American Specialty Health and its partner brand, Active and Fit Now, at activeandfitnow.com. Masters ladies, are you rowing through menopause? This challenging time of life can be confusing. There's a lot of conflicting advice. Faster Masters Rowing has a pre-recorded webinar available right now at fastermastersrowing.com slash menopause. 
Since 1987, So Sporty has produced the highest quality, comfortable, and durable rowing apparel right up the road in Vista, California. So Sporty offers team uniforms, splash jackets, spirit wear, and much more. We are committed to ensuring quality products and orders that are delivered on time. We are on the course with the last race of the day, the first final. This is the third level final for the Women's Youth Cup. These three crews raced earlier today just around 2 p.m. in their heats, and here they are meeting each other, uh, having rounded out kind of the bottom section of their heats. In lane one is River City, lane two, Casitas Rowing, lane three, Kaika, that crew out of Hawaii. And as we see already, uh, in heat in lane one it was the fifth place finisher from heat one river city and they have taken just over just over half length working into three quarters of a length lead not just about a half length but between a half and three quarter length lead over current second place casitas rowing All right, and I have Casitas clocked at 35 strokes a minute, River City right next to them at 36 strokes and a half, and Akaika hanging in there with these big boats. Again, they are a program that doesn't even own an eight, so to have them out here and rowing in an eight-person boat is just, you know, really phenomenal. What a great experience for them. Rowing quite well, too. Um, I am guessing that some of these uh, girls might also row or paddle outrigger. There's a lot of crossover there sometimes between rowers that end up in college having rowed outrigger in the past. But super cool to see them with a rowing program. And they are actually challenging Casitas and doing such a good job here. Casitas just a little bit off the back of River City. So with this three boat race, this is the first final that we have seen of the day between the junior crews. Tomorrow we'll see some grand finals and second level finals. Uh, but with the River City, Casitas and Akaika all hanging tight to each other. So this is how close it is going to be with these three crews occupying the sea level final. They are still a lot of overlap. There's some good connection between these three crews. Casitas, a junior program that rose at the site of the 1984 Olympics on, of course, Lake Casitas, run by Eric and Wendy Gillette. They do such an amazing job getting those athletes from the Santa Barbara and Ventura area out there in on a beautiful body of water. I'm sure that they have quite a bit more water than they've had ever um, in, in quite some time. So seeing a lot of activity on Lake Casitas, it's an amazing venue and they have done a great job over the last decade building up that program. But River City right now rowing out of the port of Redwood City. That's where they train. They are doing a nice job here pulling away from both Casitas and Akaika in the final half of this race. This is again the women's youth eight, the youth eight cup, and this is the sea level final. Coming to the last 250 meters, last 20 to 30 strokes of this race is River City, who has led this race from start to finish. They have a, a decent amount of clear water over the other two crews in this field, second place currently being Casitas, and third place, the crew out of Hawaii in lane three in the red hull. 
And we hope to see more of the crew from Hawaii. Perhaps they can come out to that Southwest Regional. I'm pretty sure that they would be in the Southwest Region um, being out in, uh, the <laughs> the you know, west. obviously the, the far, far west. west, the very far west. Uh, but they're making a great showing here. I mean, it, it's it's really, really awesome. I, I am not surprised. Uh, it's just a pleasant, pleasant thing to see. So River City again coming into their final strokes. It will be them for the, for the win here in the sea level final. Casitas in the bright green boat coming through and winding it up to close out the day here. Akaika Rowing Club from Hawaii rounding out this sea level final and finishing up a spectacular day of racing here at the San Diego Crew Classic. This is the 50th anniversary and I can't think of a better way to celebrate that than watching the racing that we did today, just amazing conditions, great people. What a good time. Array, the wide array of attendance and experience, different levels of racing that we're seeing here. And All more tomorrow. Yeah, more, more to tomorrow. Come. Another full day tomorrow, racing starting just after 7 o'clock in the morning and That's running right. to almost the same time frame today, late 3, a little bit before 4 o'clock, as long as everything runs on time. And if you are here and you've just finished watching this first day come to a close with a wrap with that women's youth, uh, the third level final of the Women's Youth Cup. Check out the vendors that are here showcasing their specialty items. We have some fantastic food trucks over as well, so go and grab a bite if you haven't already. And of course, grab a beer at the Beer Garden. Enjoy yourself. This is a community event. Invite your friends to come down if they've never seen rowing. Yep. Show them what it's all about because this is a, sp a fantastic venue. It's a great cross-section of everything that rowing has to offer. That's right. This is a celebration, and we hope you enjoy the evening and we'll see you again tomorrow.